stuff. All equipment you need on a Raygun actually has one set of claymores, flashes, smokes, or grenades. Flash are really really strong. The MPs you you have to bring them to open the world. You can flash pit, you can flash top white, you can flash claustrophy. It's easy, like except if they have warden, but it's the game. <laughs> the main spawn is actually pretty fast to enter the map. Spawn uh, street, but watch out, a lot of players are spawn picking, garage, main door, and master door. If you like attack the basement, for me, two guys need to spawn on main and then go through the master bedroom. Two guys spawn from small tower, so they will work together in pair. One will drone for, for, for his teammate. Easiest spawn, I think, would be to spawn small tower. To get three people rushing into the green window with someone baiting on the kids to put pressure on the on the vert. The last one could uh, cut white or push Zulu to get the cover from server. Those are my first century chips on Oregon. Mm. <laughs> Impact grenade, I'm gonna go for Melusi. Um, Rook. Impact, impact, impact. Goyo. Uh, no, Goyo has no more impacts. <laughs> ah, no, please. Uh... Maestro. Oh, Echo. 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 Uh... Let's go. Ash. Uh, IQ? <laughs> oh, nice. Let's go! Go you? Dutch? Uh, Fender? Melusi. <laughs> oh la 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 la. Let's go. No. <laughs> uh, IQ? No, IQ is a little earlier, maybe. Uh, sledge? <laughs> oh la 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 la. <laughs> J'ai pas de robot là. <laughs> Warden. Oh la 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 la. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go, guys. I was playing a lot on Counter-Strike and I was studying in university and they came to us and said maybe you want to try to compete in our first Moscow tournament of Rainbow Six Siege with your Counter-Strike roster. I met a group of people on DayZ who switched over to Siege and were like, you should get Siege, you should get Siege. I was playing only for, for fun at the beginning and then uh, my friend uh, Blaz and he said, hey, I'm being paid to play Rainbow Six Siege. I was like, no, you're kidding. He sent me the proof and I was like, how? And uh, there is the confinement because of the COVID. So I start playing more uh, Rainbow Six as a, like the co competitive part. And then uh, I played the French League. I was inspired to play in the top level when I used to watch uh, the Brazilian League back in the days. There was players like Nesk, Gohan, Astro. These guys motivated me to like buy a PC and just like play Siege on PC. There is not one thing that made me became a, a pro player. It's like a, an everything. The atmosphere, the game as well. Like just everything made me, made me feel like I need to be a pro player. I think my big moment before becoming pro was uh, Challenger League. We beat uh, M-Curse and in Challenger League, we beat them like that was a big, big, big opponent. 
and I was so happy to beat them. Like it was really a big, big moment. I wanted so much to be pro at this moment. Uh, I think right now there's a lot of stuff for new players to like training their map knowledge. I think if you want to become a pro these days, you have to watch a lot of vods, rewatching and rewatching the same vod. You are gonna understand like how how the meta is being played. Don't be able to like give in so easily. I was in Challenger League for like five seasons, right? Like I failed a lot. Never stop the grinds. Always like uh, watching vods of pro team, watching your vod to see your mistakes. Grind the game first of all. Get good people around you. Always have a good uh, mentality in a team or work ethic. As long as you have like the determination and the passion to carry on, you should always trust your gut and back yourself in those situations. If I remember correctly, it's uh, Sky who was telling to Jack to run out because he was uh, playing in uh, the second floor of the big tower. He was just baiting them for, for Jack to run out and uh, he could get both of them, but he got only one. And actually now they are f***ed, like they, they lost a the breacher. They have to rotate, so now we have like the advantage. We still have the top and stuff, so... Like we knew that they had like lost one, lost one breacher and we knew that like they like they can't open anything just like they, they opened the main at the beginning with the, the ace. So we knew that they had all like to come on the top or to come like dining. So like that's why we were waiting there. They just pushed with the Osa, the Osa was like kind of like shit against us since we can't really kill the guy. And I think I, I just shook the, the 1v2, I, like I just picked and I should, I should not have picked. We choked the map. It's okay. There is like uh, three or uh, three maps remaining. So let's just focus on the next map, and we will talk about it uh, after the match. Mm, like we knew that, like every time on attack, they were like baiting outside with like Brava and stuff like Twitch and stuff like this. So we knew that we just had to wait them and like. We know that we are better in gunfight, so we just wait them and play together, like in cross and stuff like this. Yeah, we wanted to make them waste their time. We knew that they love to, to take CC control when they push uh, on border. So I just I was just there, wasting time. And then we fall back when we get a kill or, or one minute and stuff. Like if we see like one minute, I just drop from T1, like just to waste time. Ah, I got killed like a... The wrong timing. So now they have top, but like we still have C4s. And they have only like 50 minutes, 50 sec. But it's kind of like free for us. Yeah, we just, we just gave them space. I think we, we had uh, like we had the Valkyrie cam like on the I know we had, yeah we had the Valkyrie cam I think on like office that's why like we we asked him to flank and that's where like we win the round. Yeah, and one one of the reasons why we are uh, leaving top floor is that I can uh, I can flank with Oryx on the hatches, so it's okay if we let them have top floor control. <laughs> yeah, that was part of the like plan at the beginning. We just sounds like we know how they play, we know what to do. Just just do our basic stuff and we will win. placed it so there's a chance that one will remain for a bit more yet. Oh Shaiko. Oh my goodness! Stop what have stream. we just seen? Stop stream! Stop stream! Oh, what have we just seen? 
in hand. Near sighted is now J90 looks for a kill from that deployable shield. Ashen and uh, Fultz getting on the board. DZ suffering for it. How does Iconic pull that off? He vaults into Freezer, shuts down Pambazoo. Another there to drop as Iconic is just ready and waiting for all of these engagements and gets all of them as SSG snipes the round away from DZ. What seemed like a gift to pick initially, actually the shoe on the other foot, an M80 barrel ahead, hat able to take down one, but Sploit, great recognition on the bar. He'll be able to at least knock it down an extra peg. Luminosity with only half remaining now in a one versus three. He's been delegated to this corner. We'll at least find one over inside of Dragon. Those one has to be playing the office side, but it should be two more. It's a quad. It could be an ace for Hat now. Back and forth we go. Nitro Cell still in hand too. Oh man. I'm sweating and Hat with a shot. An ace here up against M80. Still holding on to Geisha. He's going to have utility being thrown in at him from karaoke window. Shaco oh, goes in and gets a double. Huge kills from him. Make that three. And Shaco has just ripped them apart. There's one thing that can turn a regular Monday into a very exciting one. That is an evening filled with siege. Welcome to the Blaster 6 Europe League Playday 5. My name is Anne, I'll be your host for today. And alongside me on the desk, of course, still fresh and Fabian. I'm not going to change the order up, even though you requested me to. Fresh. It's going to mesh too much with my brain. But I do hope the two of you are doing good on Monday. Not anymore, uh, since I'm second what now. Fun? Yeah, first, first loser, second place. You always were second, Fabian. We all know You're it, cool. apart from, I guess, the SIs. But, you know, yeah. we won't talk about that. Yeah. I, I'm doing great, Anne. Thank you for asking. It's good to hear. And I have never been relegated from UL. <laughs> Hi, well, uh, catching strays fresh there at the start of the day, great. Yeah. Good to start out with, got that out of the way. Let's have a look at our standings. So that's of course what we're here for today. We have our night teams competing in the Europe League. Let's have a look at where they're currently standing. At the top, we'll see BDS still unbeaten. No big surprise to us. Followed, of course, by Secret, also still on that flawless run. And if we divert our attention towards that lower part, we see Ends, of course, and Wild closing out our leaderboard. What is the main surprise or what's the main exciting thing that we've seen? The most exciting thing, obviously, is BDS. I mean, we, it's hard to look away from it. But for me, it's also Team Secret. I think that they've taken a massive step up and they've impressed me a lot with the depth of strategy for being such a new team. G2 and Virtus Pro struggling as well might be a bit of a surprise, but they not look that great. It'll be no surprise I've created a new word. We had BDS and BDSing. We've now got wild and wilding down oh, the bottom oh, of the oh, table. No. Sorry, I just had to do them. I literally just thought of that, but yeah. Now I think, you know, wild being That's a little bit wild. disappointing. 
pretty wild. They've been wilding. They've been wilding. Yep. All right. Well, I hope for them, of course, they can be uh, less wilding today, maybe in a positive way, because they have, of course, a game today. But we'll start out first with Inter the Breach taking on Virtus Pro. Both these teams are actually dangling at that edge of the sixth spot. So who's really going to be able to put themselves apart from the bottom area there? Our second game is G2 taking on Secret. For Secret, of course, the question, if they can continue their flawless run or if G2 can bounce back from their game from yesterday. Our third game is BDS versus Ems, our French Derby part two or 2.0, I guess, in that part. And then we're closing out our day with Wolves versus Wild. Now, Wild, of course, will need all the points that they can get there because at the moment, it isn't looking all too good for them. But last week, we talked about our attackers and the attackers that were banned a lot as well, attackers that we saw very often in those ban phase. This time around, we want to focus our attention towards the defenders and then mainly those really strong defenders. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So last week, like Dan said, we talked about attackers. Now it's on to the defenders and what I would call the holy trilogy of defenders, Fabian. We're going to be talking about Solace, Azami and Fenrir. We talk about pow power operators a lot and we wanted to explain to you all just why. So we're going to start with Solace. What do they do? They counter drones, they starve information for the attack, and they provide information for the defense. Yeah, they really do. And if we start the clip we prepared for you guys, you'll see just that. It's like if I on BDS, finding the first drone. And then what does he do next? Well, he finds the second drone. And all of this information that he's removing this early from wolves, it's very, very rough because they're running out of drones already in the prep phase. And it, it just continues. First of all, I have to question what Wolves are doing because they're just feeding him drones. But with this information taken away from Wolves, what are we doing with that? And this is the big problem, right? Information late in the round. They have only three drones left. One of them is still outside, by the way. Shaiko is able to sneak in to a position that you're not expecting and win the round in the late round because they didn't know he was there. Yeah, and it should never really happen because they are better players than this. So we're expecting more from Wolves, but it was great from Lucky Fact. And if we go over to Asami, what does Asami do? Well, she's so, so strong. Still, even with the nerf, I think she's really, really positive to have on the defense because what can she do? Create power positions out of thin air. Yep. She can create one-way angles that it's very, very hard to deal with. And also she can, if you're playing in a power position, she can make it even stronger. Yeah, so if we roll the clip, we're going to see one of these positions. It's going to be bang inside of the kitchen. Azami is packed full on the Azami in this clip. He's actually able to get up and close personal with the Monty. Stood on the table, as you can see, there's a keeper barrier protecting long angles. There's a keeper barrier protecting him from the kitchen. He actually even closes the door behind the Monty, as you can see here, Fabio. Yeah, he's closed off the breach or the, the door so he can't fall back. Adrian is afraid to go into melee with Monty because as soon as he unextends the shield, he'll just be shot in the head from the heightened position that Pacpo is playing in. But he's going to pick up all three kills here. And it just shows how, first of all, he's closed the breach once. He's closed the door twice. He's created his power position on his own. And he's got cover into open area if necessary. There is no limit to how much stuff that he got going for him. Crazy strong. Now the third one is everyone's favorite. It's Fenrir. What does Fenrir do? Well, if you walk into the mine, it blinds you as an attacker. But Fenrir also gets both active information. If you walk into the mine, it triggers for Fenrir. But also, if you don't walk into the mine, it's passive information because he knows nobody is in that area, Fabio. Yeah, and the clip that we have for you guys shows all of what Jack just said. So if we look at the clip, we'll see the three ones that are important for this take. It's the office hatch, the one on main breach, and the one for main stairs. And G2, they will go for a very aggressive rappling on main stairs that they will know in Virtus Pro what's happening. That kill in the Through the Smoke comes from knowing that the trap has just been triggered, nothing more. And we're seeing all these kills falling into Virtus Pro's favor simply because they have all the information they need. The trap on the main breach, that hasn't gone off. Yep. Nobody's inside. The only thing that they know is that Office Hatch, the Defender Trap there is gone because it's been killed and it's been triggered on the main stairs. Such a good operator against a yeah. team like G2 that look to find those gaps. Now, we will talk about, you know, the casters will talk about, the talent will always talk about these power defenders. And we just wanted to show you in this pre-show just why they are so strong. And this is just from one play day, Jack. So we found from one play day, you can imagine how much there is from every single one of them. So much more to come.
the Manchester Major, of course, is all we're playing for here in our group stage of Europe League. So let's get it going on with our very first game of the day. That is Into the Breach versus Virtus Pro. And when we're talking about Into the Breach to start off with, we have seen a lot of mixed things from them. One win, two losses we've seen uh, currently around the bottom six, but they definitely can bounce back here. Yeah, they definitely can bounce back. Me and Jack have actually been praising them, even though they might have struggled mm -hmm. a little bit. And the biggest reason is I think that they look better than ever, even though they might be looking a little bit weaker. I mean, they got demolished in the last game day, and that will happen against PDS. So it's just the way it is. But they, as a team, look much more whole and complete. They can actually play off each other. The roles make sense. And I just think that they're working for something greater in the future rather than short term, because they have a lot of young players, new players, and some experience sprinkled in. Yeah, it'd be quite easy to be a viewer and be like, oh, well, why do Fresh and Fabian shit on some teams, but then give other teams a pass? And I think the main reason is, we think Into the Breach have got a lot of potential as a yeah. team, and they're a very, very young team with a young coach in terms of experience that will be learning more and more and more. They've shown signs of having learned across EUL, even if the results haven't gone their way. But, of course, this is a points business. We are going to, at some point, start looking for them to start accumulating those results. It's kind of tough to process what I'm getting here from this team. Of course, having changed some players, having changed some support staff in the last few months as well. But then for their opponents, Virtus Pro, they've actually stuck with the same roster for quite a while now. But we've seen some mixings from them too. Last week, a map that really benefited them worked from them. But then prior to that, also way more mistakes than what we're see used to seeing from Virtus Pro. Yeah, we are not used to seeing any mistakes from them, yeah. really, are we? Because what have they always been known as the kings of? Consistency and repetition yeah. and hard work through just doing the same thing over and over and because they do it so well with the basics crossfires communication coordination nothing ever goes wrong for them except this stage things have not looked great yeah they obviously picked up one win last week against g2 but they they could have lost all three of their games I yeah think performance wise it hasn't been great for them my big question actually with Vertus pro is are these genuine mistakes where players are making individually bad decisions or is this an attempt to put players in more expressive roles? Give players, we've known Vertus Pro as a team that functions as a team, as one unit, and everyone's within that unit and doesn't stray outside of their lines. Is this a case that actually Vertus Pro are allowing their players a little bit more free reign to try an opportunity spot a little bit more and it's just going wrong? And that's where I'm not so sure. Yeah, I, I actually don't know because I don't think that they are doing that simply because they've been doing the same thing for so many years. Why would they change now? They made third at SI. Yeah. Why would they change now? So there's something that's going wrong. I don't think we can really put our finger to it right just yet, but it will come. And I think with a few more play days, we'll start to figure out what is going wrong for them. But then again, they can also just come back now. I mean, they beat G2, so they, 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 it could just be that, oh yeah, all right, we're back to it this week and we're going to see the old Virtus Pro we've known and loved. Maybe not necessarily extremely wrong, but something that both these teams have been struggling with for sure have been their attacks. Yeah, both of these teams, we've got a head to head in the, the tail of the tape graphic here. The one that, I, the two that I want you to focus on actually is the very top graphic, uh, the very top row, attack win rate, and the very bottom row, entry conversion. Now, both of these teams have been struggling with their attacks and it's for different reasons. I think for Into the Breach, it's where their players are and how distant they are from each other, their desyncs with when they're going for excuse. Vertus Pro don't necessarily have that problem because generally they're together, but like I say, one individual, basically a lot of their rounds lost, especially on their attack. You can highlight where one individual has just gone a little bit rogue, right? So the overarching story is both teams really need to improve their attacks, but they're trying to treat different symptoms within the team. Yeah, and those for Virtus Pro especially, it's like you say it's one guy that's going rogue. Yeah, it, it is a little bit that way, but it's like they are also misreading most rounds yeah. in attack. They're not seeming to be very adaptive to when things are, well, put up in front of in a different way than they're expecting. They need to be a little bit smarter on, on and like faster on their feet. I think into the breach with the stats even looking worse for them, I think that they still have the better understanding of what they're supposed to do, even though they might make more mistakes overall. So it's, as you said, two very different problems that they're sol solving. Now, we're almost at the halfway point of our group stage, so in regards to the positioning, this game is going to be really important. Virtus Pro, of course, want to make it back towards those main stages, into the breach, still dreaming of their very first major attendance. So I'm curious to see, for this specific best of one, what kind of map we will be going to. So if we can pull that up and see what we're heading to, we'll have a, uh, we'll have a look at that very soon. Any predictions of the map? Ooh. <laughs> it could be anything. It, it really could it be. It is border. It is border. <laughs> So one of the things that we said is we're hoping that Into the Breach have learnings, right? And they've learned. Well, where did they play BDS? Border. They lost that game 7-1. Now, what were their big issues when they played against BDS? 
it was either that they weren't reacting to positions, they were too distant from each player position and weren't reacting to pressure, or they were overreacting to the pressure and everybody was running towards where the first pressure point was. So we're looking for Into the Breach to be better on their defenses in terms of the way they last played border. Um, but I think just coming back totally, I think for VP, it's a map they never used to like, but brought into their pool, specifically for SI. At SI, they beat M80 and W7M on this map. Which is very, very good result. And I remember the W7M game. They, they looked really, really good in that. And you, you don't go up against W7M at that point, Furia now, and you're not confident because the gun skill in that team is so heavy that you need yeah. to know how to play it. What I'm a little bit confused about, obviously, is Into the Beach going back. Well, I'm not confused because I understand it because of my past as a player and coach. When you go back to a map where you got absolutely demolished, you do it for a very specific reason. It's more of like sending a message in a way that, yeah. yeah, we messed up on our last time. I mean, you can mess up as much as you want against BDS, but they have learned a lot and they must have improved it quite substantially. And they've spotted a lot of gaps in their own defenses and their attacks to now change that around and go onto it. Because the map is so frag heavy, Maybe we'll suit them today. Yeah, I was about to say, it maybe makes a little bit more sense. We criticized them last week when they were going on a frag-heavy map against yeah. BDS. They're now going on a frag-heavy map against VP. And VP are more known for their systematic kind of process-driven siege rather than the frag-heavy side. So it's very different opponents today. And I think it's all about whether Into the Breach can make them necessary improvements. Well, we have our two teams. We have the map. We almost have everything that we need. I also want to get our casters in as well so we can say hi to them because today we're joined by Hap and Fluke. Uh, good evening on this Monday. How are the two of you doing today? Evening. What time is it there? Almost 6, 6 p.m. You technically can still uh, count yeah. the afternoon, but yeah. Depends how long you've been awake. I'm excited. I'm excited to get into another day of EUL, baby. It's always excited to get back to uh, to EUL, and you know, as mentioned many times before, basically every single player spot is going to be open up until the end. So uh, it's going to be good to see which teams have an opportunity to uh, well, a little bit of a distance today. Yeah, of course. And when we're looking at both these teams as well, is there anything that you two can predict in regards to the outcome of this matchup? No. <laughs> I mean, I think it's <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you want me to say here? Uh, Virtus Pro, they've been playing tougher opponents and have got themselves a win. ITB have been a little bit downhill and they're going back to 1-7. But it was against BDS, the best team in the world. And you can quote Fabian on that. Now, I don't know. Did I think it's going to be a tough that? one for ITB. I think I agree with you there. I mean, like VP, they are third and, you know, they came third in six invitational. Yes, they lost it in the grand finals versus, uh, not the grand finals, the lower bracket finals against W7M, but they managed to beat them on the same map uh, before as well. So it's not like Virtus Pro doesn't know how to play this map. So they need to have some very, very solid learnings against that game from BDS if ITB wants a chance. Seems like ITB is slightly favored here, but please allow us to board the helicopter with Into the Breach and Virtus Pro on border. Maybe you just threw Fabian into it there. <laughs> Not saying that BDS is the best team in the world. And you can quote him on it. I mean, I don't know whether he would stand by that. I guess we'll see after this map because you're going against what is the team setting the path of the course for everything. And now you're bringing yourself into a showdown against a team that, yeah, they had an amazing time at SI, better than people expected. They're coming to a, a frag heavy map for the second time in a sort of back to back row. I'm I just have curiosity. I think it's impossible to call a game like this with the data that we have. I mean, you know, we haven't seen a lot yet, right? If, if you look at ITB, for example, they, uh, they haven't played that many maps with this roster this year yet, especially if you, if you compare them against Rotus Pro, who played the entire six Invitational pretty much up until the end. Just a smaller sample size to go off of. And, the only border plate ones was against BDS, uh, seemingly maybe top two, uh, given a challenge towards Furia 40, top spot by things that are currently looking at right now. So it, it's, it's a difficult one to call, uh, that's for sure. What I'm kind of curious about is I think the, the quote that can be focused down on here is from Fresh from Kendrew, where he said uh, they learned a lot in their game, they're sort of patching mistakes. They fix the things that they wanted to fix when they played BDS on border from the previous game, but then they learned a whole heap of new things that were otherwise problems. This is almost the best example of saying, okay, prove it. Let's see those sort of problems. Let's see the things that went wrong for you last week on, uh, on border. And let's see where they've sort of come from it. They obviously had the play day off for play day four. They've had a little bit of time and 
they're, they're bouncing back with all that extra preparation time of a day and now all that extra focus onto the same map. It is a bit of a big gamble though, Emmy, because if you look at the standings, ITB were at the start of this day and of course still are in seventh and Virtus Pro are the gatekeepers at this point for that playoff spot in sixth. So there's only a single point dividing the two of them and that means that Virtus Pro can walk away or run away with a regulation victory here. That's going to be four points on the board. And, you know, time is starting to tick down. It's not like there's only two play days left like we have in some other leagues. Uh, there is still four after this, but that that is still a pretty big gap that you'll need to uh, need, need to bridge. So, again, you might have learned a lot, but is it going to be enough? And can you like adapt and change quick enough to instantly put those learnings into practice? That That is the big question for ITB here today, one that we'll be looking out for as well. For Furthest Pro, um, of course, they, they had some tough opponents in, in G2. I mean, they aren't doing too hot for themselves. Secret, who are currently on fire. Um, uh, Wolves, which was a close game. So, like Furthest Pro, of course, they came in third. Have a little bit of a slump after that, but there, there's always that threat that they can just show up whenever and then suddenly be like the top team again. So, we had the great presentation at the beginning of the day about these power operators, the ones on defense that are really going to make your day harder. We've just seen one of those FNATs get stolen. Fenrir on border, controlling those little spaces, the narrow passages you've otherwise got to pass your way through with the removal of Solace and his army. It's almost like choosing the lesser of five evils. Every single time you go yeah. into the bands on this, you will still have Fenrir on the board, you'll probably see a bit of a run of Valkyrie throughout this game as well. You're going to have a consistent need for IQ. You're going to have a consistent need for just playing against those mines and those drives. Noah, he was the MVP last time these sort of rosters played against each other about a year ago, half a year ago, where he stood out and they're able to win it. ITB, it was the three core players. And as Creed's one of the two new additions, tries to find a fight here towards the top. The stairs, otherwise being forced and furthered back towards Azza. He's not actually going to get the rest of the push from always. And Pasha being good on is going to be a bit of a hit on the IQ, of course, as always. Gets a shot off, but it'll be the dock. Instant stim back up. It's not going to be feeling too much about that DMR that just hit him out there. And as Dan is coming slowly around the corner, Kenny totally ready for him. Shuts it down. Joystick being run out on as well as he's playing around on the East stairs. As Kreese goes quite low, all he really has to do is just stay put, telling the team where always is, actually stands up and loses his life. Now, that means there is an opportunity to hack those cams, but Furtis Pro really going to try and go for that. Is that 2v4? Definitely put you in a bit of a dangerous position, especially with Noah still trying to challenge around on CCTV. Flashbang makes him think that a peak is coming through, but not as of yet. The slight rotation coming through. Shepard getting stuck on some goo mines there. Noah's putting out the player on the balcony. So both these players now completely known. 40 seconds always. Let's see if he can get a bit of a break inside break. But with Noah on the cross, the door is going to be a point of contention as soon as he makes his presence known. Border is an aggressive step into a building as proven by all of the Virtus Pro bodies that are littered around the sides. In fact, rotates his way back towards the window, but Noah doesn't really have to move too far. He really wants to fight out on the balcony, goes for a double. And he's about to have a second Virtus Pro player offer some support, but he's got that in his own pocket. Doc sims himself back up, finds a fight outside again, finally wins it. Will they be able to get the revenge? No, he hops out on an adventure with Oscar having the cross. And a great early lockdown here from ITB. Yeah, a solid opener indeed coming through. And you, you saw the Virtus Pro players kind of being a bit confused and trying to take some ones after, the, you know, they lost the initial one. I think that, like, if you looked at the top East engagement where you had, like, the Slopey coming through and, you know, Kendrew just, just popping up with the MPX, finding that shot, uh, locking off yet another one in their favor, kind of seemed like Virtus Pro were, like, out of it after that first kill already came through, trying to fight back, but not really being able to get anything done. This, you sort of knock it as a bit of a slow start, but slow starts can be the problem with VP, as said by the desk before the game, that sometimes when they get slow to try and win things out, they have to get even slower. They have to try and formulate the play, but on border, you're not really offered that. 
as a lead-in, the fights are, as you've seen, instantaneous. As soon as you start to take a pocket or a corner of any aspect of this map, you're going to suffer pressure from pretty much the rest of the map. If you're putting it onto break, then there's going to be top square. If you're putting it onto top square and east, well, then you might get this one from office. You might get this one from break. It's just this continual back and forth of how you apply all five of your players, which is pretty often necessary to claim a single pocket of territory to start your beachhead onto the incursion. If we get ourselves background, a bit of a solid lock down here. The site has, has a cool, sweeping dramatic camera angle. That is from the helicopter you often hear about. Yeah, do not attempt to board it, even though Anne told you all that you could. I'm clearly, clearly calling it out on the system out here. But as we get going, it's also important to note that VP and their attacks on border haven't been the best match so far. Like over the times they've played it in SI, over the times that they've played it uh, since as well, 37% of the rounds went their way. So if they manage to find, let's say, two rounds on this attack, they are already doing quite well for their own standards here. So just need to try and, and loop those together as we're in bathroom and uh, the teller's area now. Drones coming through, just trying to find some information, not the early aggression from ITB that we had in that last round. I have drones being tossed out, they're trying to figure out if anybody's in CCTV break. Joyce making the fight quickly, we'll find Noah. Both aware of one another, but Joystick a bit quicker. Yeah, it was a great hold there, and that gives Joystick said a final step in the building and based on the back of the drone work there of Pasha covering out the opposite end they are now still concerned of the pressure that might come through from exactly where I was talking about break here as soon as you step foot onto top east this is the next bit of territory you have to try and make sure you've got eyes on all the pressure comes from well anywhere Kenny swings his way up the stairs pops a couple of replace bullets towards the head of anyone that might be in passport but always isn't quite in a position to lock it down a minute 10 Time has been wasted, and Asa still wants to reclaim the territory. Misses the first of the fight, but Pasha is surrounded. The calls will come out towards the rest of the team. ITB, do they try and go for the pinch, or do they just try and hope that he's going to find himself on the wrong side of a fight? Asa pre-fires, cannot quite get the connection. Suffers through the spray on the soft, but again, 20 seconds wasted of Pasha having to go up and down the stairs like he's working on his cardio. And that's not done yet because they still need to dig out that one player on top. And look at it, there is still two players working towards it. Pasha patiently waiting for a swing to come around as Dan will find an opening onto Kandru. And that is at least a little bit of pressure on the site that you can now start putting down. And you see it happening instantly. The plant is being attempted by Shepard. No one is here to contest it. So a retake is going to be the case. A down will come through, but as are instantly over east, will be shut down as well. Great execution there from Virtus Pro. They saw an opportunity opportunity and it's one of the statistics I'll talk about in a second because well we might be out of the round in that time there it is Virtus Pro with the lockdown and it throws us into the idea of the objective game here so far over the opening three maps that these two teams have played against opponents ITB have only been able to get the diffuser down once Virtus Pro they have a much more solid Got a statistic there, sitting around the average of the table of EUL with six plants across the three maps but still that idea of playing the objective seems to be something that has unfortunately escaped ITB. Might have not been fully aware that there was such an instant push coming down. And of course, uh, Kendrick playing on the side as soon as he did get shut down, that created that opening. And you know, you only make that call as a team when you know uh, where these players are located. When you have those information, pieces in pocket, uh, which they did. They knew that it was safe. They knew they could go for that plant did so perfectly. Not a quick enough response time coming in from ITB. And afterwards on a retake also being uh, basically tossed apart. But I do want to say that the initial like retake coming in the stairs was was a pretty good one. Pushing it in from the bottom of these and also pushing someone near break room. Just that, you know, a couple of those awkward engagements later, you suddenly lost that room and suddenly the side has been fallen and the plant is going down. Heading up to Ventilation Workshop though, and I mentioned it, Virtus Grove, they managed to get two attacking rounds. I think that's considered job done, and everything they can get from there and forward is going to be a nice little bonus. We're halfway there. In terms of the conversation, 
of bringing it into the idea of fraggers on this game and it's a showdown there hasn't really been a singular pop-off name generally though on the trade of roles to roles in comparison between these two rosters virtus pros usually got a head-to-head -head in their favor the only one i think is slightly behind is if you're looking at the sort of iana role the the instant press and the flex to support the entry of joystick and noah joystick's a step behind he hasn't quite been able to have a big impact but the rest of his team has generally been able to hit a slightly better curve. Thatcher, quick in, over the top, making sure they grab some of that early territory I talked about and the pressure of that entry. It seems like they're very focused on the opposite end of a take. They realized how much was being taken away from them because they weren't able to truly get a bite over onto CC. And obviously different ground floor site, but look at the pace of the smash and grab, how quickly this round Virtus Pro have forced themselves into these positions to encircle ITB's defense. They're not letting them breathe this time. Watch for the blast! And we do have two players down on the actual ground floor with MIGDAT 3, and they've just seen some openings being made by a Super Shorty, so they're aware of the fact that there is at least a vertical, a heavy vertical kind of pressure coming through. So, well, I wouldn't be surprised if this ends up being another plant attempt as soon as they clear out a single person on the horizontal, knowing that, you know, they can use these verticals against them as well. Dan being spotted out there, Kendrew instantly trying to go for a slight rotate. As a C4 and Pocket can drop that through the floorboards, but it's more efficient the other way up. By stick, again, as I said, they're still tiptoeing on the precipice Change of the door backs. here, but they haven't quite been able to find that weak link that they can pull away because of the vertical setups. They don't just want to charge and barrel their way in. It's always just going to charge and barrel his way across. Straight through. Kiba swing here onto Fountain is going to be a bit dangerous. The Boogie Drone not being caught out by the gate as it gets through solid enough pasha oh solid enough to take that as well noah got out from the swing expecting a follow through they're not handing it to him because there's only 30 seconds left at this point virtus pro the pressure of getting the kit is still on them they still don't have the vertical control for how quickly they're able to get the other half of the map it's not the one that's really mattered and the final stop has stumped them in seconds if you can on the time to get your head down and hold up and they're at least offered their first but there it is now. It's the next cube on towards the side. It's now Freeze is going to try and get the pop from above. Then he gets the C4. They do get the kit down with Joystick getting Azra on the way out the door. Almost. ITB getting the lockdown. And stopping the site being taken. Creeds is caught out a bit too wide there. Leaving just Kenny above alone. Left we'll the double as KD for the game. And as he's pinged and they know exactly where he is. Well, that is a tragic moment for anybody to be up against the Damos here. The tragic call on it. You can just feed that information to the team. He's trying to fight his way to what is an impossible kit to recollect at this point because you've got to go all the way wide to find the first fight itself. And even then, you're out of time. Pepper not swapping off the 44. Joystick finds him in the end. But I think it was a really smart execute coming down, Emmy, because what we saw is the one kill going over the top, and that basically tells them, hey, there is pressure here. You cannot afford to be looking down these verticals anymore, not as consistently as you were, because I could come in, sweep you up as a result. And then what you also had in the meantime, the technical time it's called by ITB, is the fact that they had information on the site. Hey, Fenrir is the only person like present on the site horizontally. You have a Deimos. They went for that scan. They made him feel uncomfortable. They pushed him into a position where he was vulnerable. They find that kill, can instantly go for the plant. And due to the fact that there is pressure up top and it's being continued up top, you might lose some gunfight. Sure, that plant will go down. Credit it though, that if there was only, you know, that the uh, Aruni was firing five pixels further down, it would have been a headshot onto the planter and it wouldn't have gone through. But every other factor there, was working inside of VP's favor. They, they did that perfectly, just drawing away the attention, finding the one isolated player on the side, and then deciding to just go for it in smoke. An early call on attack timeout. Really, if you're thinking about it, we're, we're barely into the taste of this. And ITB, they're just a bit concerned things might start to go the way it did against BDS on the other play day. This is that moment that we sort of bring reference back to when they said, okay, you know, we're learning things every single game. We have the best mirror image that you can sort of get against very strong top of your region teams on the same map. What have you learned? What have you brought into it? Unfortunately, so far, they don't think they've learned quite the same. But 
still early doors, still early days, still early. For them to see if they can try and start clawing these rounds in these uh, moments. Now. It might also be an early tactical timeout given their statistics so far in the season. Uh, ITB only having a 20% attacking win rate. Um, it's not great. Uh, with no. <laughs> ish defensive win rate, you know, that, that kind of means that they need to get this 4-2 in if they, if they really want to have a shot. And even then, statistically speaking, it's a long ask. Now, of course, statistics, small sample size, don't mean everything, but it's, it's a short reflection of how things have gone so far. And that low percentage, that does mean that they can and probably will struggle quite a bit. Now, obviously, the one defense was all that they were able to pull when they were here as well before. It is literally a perfect reflection, unfortunately, so far at this point. They have to try and break that mold and give themselves a little bit more to work with on the latter half. Joystick, more confident as they start to strong arm their way into these points of control. I said, if you go back to the first and the second round, it was very slow, very cautious to make sure they weren't caught out on the back end of this approach. But this time, VP, they're getting themselves inside the building, internal, to try and pull these engagements. This is an entirely different approach to how it was at the first step. They're stepping in. Creed, concerned and surrounded by drones and intel, has some safety around him and those FNATs are going to buy him some time. More drones as a defeat, more pops of the E1D. They want to take the swing. They're just going to remove that FNAT. There's no push behind it yet. You can see Shepard is aching for it, but it's the breach on the wall that forces Creed's movement. They've used the utility, got him tucked out in a very uncomfortable corner. He cannot leave in, but still requires that final push with Noah on the back line. Kenny, you can see rotating to offer some support as well. How are they going to get rid of him? Back in the meantime, trying to find out if there's anybody playing around Sandwich in the offices. And Oscar, as his window got opened up and the hatch below him as well, is just prone out there, not going to move, is actually going to let Pasha go over to, uh, you know, reload. Actually, Red Pink coming through, so now he's aware that there's a player out there. But, you know, what can you do about it when he's just stuck down there? He's like, if he stays stuck there, there's nothing really Pasha can do to help his team for. He can, he can get him when he rotates out, but that's about it. So Oscar can just stick in here, not move, <laughs> and tries best to stay alive. And as soon as he get up, you see there, Pasha takes him down. So should have stayed prone there. It's the catch on the drone. There's still the player inside the vending machine, holding on to all that they can. Joystick just takes the dive. He's been able to slip his way towards a position of engagement. They know break is clear. And now they know Creed is clear as well. There's one more to fight inside. It's Noah. If he doesn't go for the escape, the Doc is doing everything he can to hold on. Confirms one, but he's blinded. Gets himself picked back up. Joystick's looking for the second engagement. If Noah can hold this off, he can really start to drive the round. The flash will come around the corner. He's caught in a pre-fire. Dan gets Kenny. Now it's just as a left. He's washed out a fountain. And Virtus Pro. You may as well have, I mean, skipped the team talk. Team, we're coming through there again. The the information game from VP has been very strong throughout this game. It, it started off with that one take as soon as they killed Kendry and Teller's archives. Uh, it then followed up with you know the second round, which we had. Hey, there's only a single person on the site. Isolate him. Let's go for a plant. And now here as well, like you, you have Noah stuck on the sandwich. As soon as he gets up, his head gets removed. They knew about the player next to the vending machine. Well, let's just dig in deep through the 90 hallway if Noah's pushing that anyway. Let's get in that way. Well, there's a dock behind on CCTV and, you know, the pillar. We'll just toss some flashbangs in. We'll get him. He cannot shoot us all. That way, just systematically clearing out these tough positions or working together and, and, you know, having that information and, and acting accordingly which is basically the complete opposite from what we saw from VP in round one when they lost an early one due to what was probably a spawn peak. And after that, people trying to take some one-on-one -on -one engagements, which all kind of went south. Ever since that, it's just been impeccable from Virtus Pro. It worries you. It, it, it has to be cause for concern. I think at any point, there was always, as I said, going into this game, a lot of possibilities. You don't even know what Virtus Pro you're going to get. But the Virtus Pro of most recent in terms of this tournament, in terms of this competition, he's on the up and up. They're able to pull wins. Yes, okay. As Fresh and Fabian alluded to, maybe they didn't really deserve it. G2 dropped a lot more than they should have. But you look at the early rounds of that and where Virtus Pro were at their strongest were on these sort of snappy attacks, pulling themselves in to getting the kit down when they were sort of 
pushing across towards Jim and Bedroom, especially realizing the weaknesses of GT's defense and exploiting them is something that Virtus Pro did very well in that clubhouse. ITB holding in and looking down for now, but as I say, the more confidence builds on VP, ITB seem more cautious of where this early engagement is going to come from. They definitely are, and Creed's again taking loads of damage as he tries to rotate out of archives. The information game from VP just been doing quite well. Might struggle this round actually if they only have three drones left, but we'll see how that works out as a digging deep coming in from Dan. Instantly will exert himself from the building again. They have an opening onto Kenny, and this might actually be a call for an execute to come through or a complete change of the rotation as everybody's moving. Pasha, however, drops, and it seems like they're going slightly back towards their old positions. East has been regained by ITB. Dan now holding off to a player that is supposedly in archives as well. And you see them trying to find that next step in the approach here. As Noah reinforcing his own position with those mechs, making sure that flashbangs are not going to be impacting him. As they are getting tossed in, Joystick are very much aware of the vertical angle down below. He needs to watch if he wants to push these stairs. Noah's got himself underneath the vertical, and well, it's a fight that Joystick's been able to win twice in exactly the same manner here. Now, Pasha getting in, I think they expected a little bit more support, a little bit more assurance, but. The Fenrir's instantly stopped them. Reed's positioning there, forced Dan out, forced the rotate round, and the retake, and Pasha was not left to the wolves, but able to be reclaimed. 45 seconds now though, and always didn't hear the drop just behind him. Creed's almost got the gift there. Azza's here to double down. They're going for the two versus one. A fight around it, and Azza loses out against the ways. Creed's is now suddenly trying to find the end piece of it. Does the down. Should be able to get the confirm here. 30 seconds, a three versus two. Very doable here for Creed's and Oscar if they can play this smart. 20 seconds, that is gonna be the biggest worry about it. Bunch of flashbangs coming through. Oscar will get a blind kill with the SMG 11. The plant, however, is going down in the meantime. Are they aware of that? Dan is out here on the cover. We'll find the very first. The second one is up top. They have the red ping, 45 seconds counting down. And Dan also pulling back. Doesn't need to stick around. Doesn't want to play this vertically either. So he's getting himself removed as far away as he can. Actually, onto the cabinets here inside the tellers. And the screen drops. They should be aware of where he's coming coming from the pre-fire comes in actually spotted the player out there we'll find a beautiful headshot of the shepherd but as he goes Defenders and tries and retakes there is another player it. onto the window that can just go for it a flashbang pops through that's gonna blind him and that's gonna be a clean up for dan who wins yet another round for virtus pro he's almost pulled that one back the the kill and the blind as well if you think that you know engagement from Azza against Always had gone into Azza's favor. It was the right idea, but Always was just able to sniff out the problem and get one before he was removed. It's those little moments you can see ITB, they're battling, they're clawing at these rounds. And again, Creed's just going for that vertical position. Three steps, four steps short of maybe getting the kill from above, getting the lockdown there. That's or is as it sits again this plant game this objective game really coming into vp's favor right now itb they find themselves i mean far and far away on an island and whether this next round goes into their favor you know the second half is going to be such a challenge I think what we saw happening from VP there is the, the early opening kill they found on Kendrew instantly to be the call for the rotation and to hit the side. But as they lost Pasha, they were like, okay, no, let's slow it down again. They actually do have some resistance left out there. And I think that is the reason why they called it back. They brought it back into somewhat of a more safe and slow approach. Which eventually, of course, landed them that victory. It's a B, what can you bring for this last one? It is Ventilation Workshop again. This was a smoke plant last time. If, you know, again, the player up above fired five pixels down, would have been a headshot. Plant averted, maybe even the round one on the back of it. Because you wouldn't have had to panic into a retake. Well, there's an early way to try and get a bit of a bite. Creed's suffered through the soft against Shiko, and as Demo put it, end it. He's getting a little bit of revenge, lesson to learn. That's a good example. Take down one. They have 
what feels like the first time this game they've had that advantage, but the only other time they've actually had the opening kill was in that first round that they won, as they're able to get rid of Pasha as well in that same moment. So, maybe something can be threaded here. Be that test of Virtus Pro. They've already done more than enough on this attack half, but you know more than enough isn't good enough for the best teams. Well, like there might have been the expectation for cover to be out there, right? Like you open up the window from the rappel, someone's on the swing, you have two people to try and take it with, but it didn't work out. As now the entry is being made from East, but also the order is pressure being set up and actually Creed that manages to land the second in a row. Dan will drop as well, and it's just a repeat of round one where the entirety of VP just seems to be dropping apart as soon as they do not have that first kill as Creed finds a third from the break room and only Shepard's left now in a 1v4 and as the wall of creeds gets opened up he won't really care that much about it he's just getting himself closer towards the 90 hallway as soon as shepherd's presence is known now here that is going to be an aggressive swing might even be the quad kill to come through at this point when you're sort of looking at the setup here they always say if you're on the back foot the best round to win is the one just before the turn of the half it gets you some great momentum gets you some great energy and it's almost like a sort of a reset it's the taste resetter shepherd is trying to see if he can find an engagement nothing is being handed to him here itb is playing cards as close to their chest as possible as much as they want to get into the next round this is more than happy for them to make sure things don't go away no momentum built itb they get two they have doubled their success from last week but now they have to go well beyond their overall attack success. Yes. Run the numbers. What's the percent? At 20%. Uh -huh. and, and, know, and what do they six need? Six rounds. Well, more than 20. Let's put it like that. They, they need to get, <laughs> well, even I can do they that. Need to get five <laughs> rounds. They need to get five rounds, which is, I believe, 88%. It's about 88%. Yeah. So a bit of a get that. Up. Big question. Not sure. Okay, it's not quite the same violence as the Shiko one, but to be honest, that clip was just... Again, I, I think they were like counting on the cover being out there as soon as that got opened up, because it seemed like they were aware, but I think the person just went on his drone and tossed something out at the exact moment. That it's sort of like when like you reload. offer to cover, and, and then you decide to place a claim or... Yeah. He won the round, though. Don't worry, Tim. I'm, I'm I, saying. Don't worry, Tim. I've got Ten you. Seconds left before insertion. <laughs> For those who don't know, um, obviously, there's always talks about Five how we all play insertion. ranked together. Hap is a questionable flank watch. My, my brain went off at that moment. <laughs> what about the I, other I moment? I don't know what was happening. Okay, so the other moment... <laughs> Hello, okay. We down. don't have time. We're in a game of <laughs> Rainbow Six. But it's prayer. They're onto their defensive half now at this point, and they have a very good standing to ride this game out towards the end. All of the pressure is on ITB. All of that talk of what's been learned, what's been grown, where the roster can sit from where it was. Now's the time to demonstrate it. Quick entry into Passport and around Jail as well as they're just going to pop themselves onto the customer's control, maybe try and force themselves up, Metal says. Again, just that drone game coming in early. So have like eight left, you gotta make those count. Fenrir being targeted as well, so Kendra's trying to figure out where that player is, and that is confirmed into CCTV now. Joystick not really too worried about it though, as uh, the hunt ends in the end. As I tried to find some vertical shots out there, but always was providing some cover, so nothing really to worry about. But at least that does tell them, okay, he's in CCTV, there is some pressure out there, and as the rest of ITB is trying to make some space happen, as it does still have that skeleton key, he could theoretically start opening up below that bomb site, take out some of the default spots they could be playing in, make things and life just a little bit more difficult for these players on site. It starts the slow shepherding of the players inside. It's always that almost gets caught out, but Joystick gets ahead of Kenny. Pulls themselves back into the aggressive hold inside Fountain. They're sort of saying, look, any step you take towards the top of the East Stairs, which Creed's is tiptoeing around, is an angle that is watched all the way down to the back end of Fountain. 
such dangerous territory that Az is trying to have to force them out of the position from underneath, which he's done to a degree, but the confirmation has to come internally. They're droning in, making their way onto off this window as Az is trying to fish for kills underneath the play of the smoke and the miss. On the head, on the back, is going to be a bit of a blow here, but with 50 seconds and still no CC control, Kreezus has to try and get up and send it at this point, all the way towards the fountain wall, but again, another aggressive angle. Every single second step is mired and marred by someone else watching back against you. Kreese does get a great take onto Joystick, but 30 seconds. These four players have to try and find a fight inside. It also open up the entirety of break and CC now under control and as Oscar will find a kill onto Dan. It's Noah with the Gumon, but the smokes more importantly keeping them at bay. 20 seconds and they have only two single doorways to push Lock through. Toxic, How are they gonna be finding success here? That's a big question because Shepard oh, should have oh, that coming oh. off though. Creatures runs Ten through, seconds. gets that kill. The plan can now happen in the default spot always. Do you have something to go Five for it? The night oh. the shot out. Usher's unable to connect the shots and 45 seconds will be counting down. It's not even necessary as ITP will find success there. What was that? That was that was Spidey Sense in action. That was a precog. Call Tom Cruise. That man can see into the future. Unbelievable take there. The pre-aim the swing round of creeds to go the you know the shotguns playing close. We've got to take this engagement utilizing those holes as I said took control of fountain and office by aggressively getting up to that wall pushing past and finding the weak spot and what joystick was paying attention to. And then that, the take onto the smoke canisters, the packing up, and then the shot of the C4 out. I mean, whoever that is, get them on the Olympic team. I think it was all creeds coming through here. That all creeds? I think it was all creeds, because oh, you see them here, and they see the run in. And as soon as Pasha threw out that C4, it was just a pre-fire going off at the head level. And I think that the C4 just traveled through the pre-fire that was meant for the door. But I, I mean, think that was all creeds in that round. That That's that's some Doctor Strange. Waving the arms yes, around, Doctor <laughs> Dr. Creed. ITP, they pull that first Five round, but you know, it wasn't easy. And it came off of are heading out pretty superstar the playing, but the team can build behind that. They can get some energy, some momentum. As I said, what's kind of been missing from ITB's roster throughout the previous match days is someone setting everything alight. And, you know, it's not that you can always build behind that. And it's not that that's the only necessity, but look at how, say, Adrian has stepped up for Team Secret and how much that's been able to help the Secret team move around. Of the top eight players, in EUL at the start of the play day, I think four of them are BDS players. And outside of that, it's singular players from the different rosters that have been otherwise able to get their name up here. And if they can have somebody that they can try and throw their weight behind here, just is such a boon for a team. Protocols began to be made, and I think there was some... Uh, unfortunate events there in that last round i to be missing out on the opportunities to find that free or two free kills from underneath definitely the pressure was put up by azar on that buck uh, but you wanted to find those kills out there especially put that pressure down on that smoke there you go that's what we're looking for joystick taking care of a drone given out a yellow ping the skeleton key to just follow up and that's a free kill to come through there for the side of itb and that more importantly actually opens up into cctv as well Now, ITB, are they going to be given, I guess, a slightly different lead through? You said Joystick was the one who was able to get that first take previously, but here, Creed's with that removal, the player around CC, it gives them this security over security. You can see the buck is underneath, probably going to get himself shepherding, and he's otherwise not being contested yet. Virtus Pro is still sort of keeping themselves a bit close towards the site itself, and he seems a little bit cautious of this. He's expecting somebody to come down and try and kill him. But Virtus Pro is just sort of sitting, letting the fight come to them. And I mean, it was almost their round last time round, but it proved a mistake. At some point, they have to try and lean back in to what ITB is doing. It might be that they felt like they had the upper hand on the verticalities every single time they were using them uh, or were used against them. But as Creed's now finds Pasha as well as the Warden gun, another kill with the skeleton key to come through. Look at that, they're just being dismantled from below. I mean, just gets shut down from the window that this is just complete disaster for Protus Pro. The Nitro Cell will not even find Oscar a flawless round.
for ITB. Two from below, a couple horizontally as they tried to retake. And now definitely we're headed towards a new bomb site there because, you know, the previous one was like, okay, one thing went different, we would have won this. In this case, they got completely dismantled. It was just nothing to try and stop them. What they needed to do there. Very, very well put together, obviously, for ITP to read that, to get the positions, to get the idea of what is free and where to get that first engagement. They sort of realized how much map was free from the previous round, which was pretty much all of the ground floor. And then what joystick was holding on to, which was pretty much all of the top of East stairs, CC and security, and any of the watch down the long corridor. As soon as they removed that one player, only about 20% of the map was actively being held with bodies, with blood and with positioning. Yeah, they have the angles, but it was sort of free real estate for ITB to take into. And Virtus Pro, I think they need to try and step back in. Order is there's not a lot of room to be able to just give away rooms. Four to four. Yeah, four Suddenly that entire deficit gone. Let's talk about how ITB, you know, 20%, that, that translates to a round or two. They've just found them. The very first two attacking rounds they played. They need to find five for a regulation victory, two, to at least stem the bleeding and have the opportunity to uh, to fight further in overtime. Virtus Pro probably did not expect ITB to show up and, and, and basically say, hey, we've got hands on attack as well. So, ITB could push themselves here into the lead. Get themselves off to, well, something that hasn't been in their pocket until at least the first round of this game itself. Obviously, they've been able to take a game against the Bulls. It's a very early on fight. They've been able to get themselves set up with some success. And we talk about if Virtus Pro win this and they get the full three points, they jump pretty high up. If ITB get this, suddenly they're level with Fnatic. Azza levels Shepard. Always is able to find Noah back. At least the trade to come through, and that's important. Might not be the most important operator if you look at um, you know, what Nomad brings with the air jabs. And maybe, you know, if you, if you would have been able to get Kenny or if you would have been able to get uh, Oscar, I could have been more beneficial. Maybe even Creed's with the uh, three Adrenaline Surges still left. As the entirety of Customs is under control of ITB, the site is being droned out. Azer is opening up some horizontal lines of sight as they know that there's only a single player onto the site itself. And this might actually warrant an execute to come through. But as Azer goes down, that might just be a little more stick that stops them from moving in fully. And the plant is being cemented here in joysticks, none the wiser, caught in the crosshair, not really knowing which way to look. Dan's above, Pasha just sees the tail end of a player who <laughs> leaves a grenade in his wake to sort of say, don't chase me, bro. Dan's getting the fight above, they get a good pinch onto Kenny. He will get downed and, well, now confirmed, but with 20 seconds of two versus two, they're going to see if they can try and swing around and get the long range is otherwise prepped up by just the long sight lines. There's one tucked into the site itself. Creed's gets his second for the round. They get the breach right onto the wall itself. They're saying you cannot enter. It doesn't even matter at this point as well. ITB pull ahead. Creed's pulls heads. Reeds has been playing an incredible game over these last couple of rounds to come through, really enabling his team and finding these important kills when it matters to give the opportunity to go for these plants. Tactical timeout, I would assume, to be called now by Virtus Pro and otherwise the next round because things are slowly starting to slip away from them. They might have expected to have the pretty easy cleanup on the defense. Just the complete opposite, though. They're being dismantled bit by bit. And it all started with Creed's finding those first couple of kills just a round or two ago. I mean, what a turn of force. This has been round. What a swing round at this point. When you're looking at what it was, what, 4-1, and then you have that final defense round where they sort of bit back ITB. I said it's a very important one because you get some momentum back. You get that confidence back. What they've brought here on the second half is just doubling, tripling down, especially with how close 
that first engagement, that first round was on their attack. They lose their entry. They have 10 seconds left. They send it through smoke and fire. And it's just since then, strength to strength. But at the same time, Virtus Pro, they're looking lost. They're looking attackers. sort of entirely out of the game pace that ITB is laying down. Board that helicopter. Yeah, do not board the helicopter. Keep, keep asking you not to. Get out of it. Maybe Anne is in the meantime in that helicopter just watching from above. The Attackers hosts get trapped so well. Yeah. It's like that old um, US promo, US League one. I was going to say, where the US Nationals. Their talent yeah, got to go in a limo in a helicopter over Vegas. Lucky for them. I'm not jealous. I'm what did you do for the announcement again? Um, was we we uh, we bought <laughs> toys and made a little studio out of paper. And yeah, and that was how we. This kind of feels in like how OCE is, is treating us now, you know, with their. I don't know if you've seen their big interview screen. Yeah, this morning. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, they they're just copying the things we did three years ago. That's fine. It takes a while for culture to reach Australia, Manic. I mean, it's, it's a long way down, you know? A beef is only with Manic because he said he didn't like Leo Gids' cat. Get out of here, Manic. Five to four, ITB. Enough about Aussies. I, uh, the only OCE I see is ITB pulling points right now. ITB's definitely uh, sending up themselves, maybe up the rankings even at the end of this. A single more round and if and they find themselves with a point. And we know how important those can get, especially near the end of the stage when playoffs positions are up for grabs. And again, stating it, VP, the current gatekeepers in sixth, ITB find themselves in seventh. A win here would mean a direct jump. So there's only a single point keeping them apart right now. Creed's the man who's made some big waves in these last couple of rounds. Needs to try and do so again. But the rest of the team, of course, you know, you're welcome to, to have a pop-off moment. As they get themselves ready, it's, it's just a lot of thinking right now, I believe, on the side of ITB. They know about the player that's inside the lobby. They know about the player that's around the 90 hallway on break room door. Those are the two problem points they need to deal with first. And what do you do to deal with them? Azure will find always, and Greece is just sent right towards the heart of the site. I mean, look at this, sent it all the way, all the distance. There's the free fight and Shepard has dropped. They're inside the site and he finds almost the second. There it is, Creed confirms. And as I said, Virtus Pro brushed, brushed off the team talk of their opponents. Creed has the perfect response. ITB, a meteoric return into border leaves them so close to three points and jumping up to for about the minute third or fourth place in the league greets there just like i don't know if you like he was on main door walked all the way past metal past workshop into the bathroom that's kill one finds one through the hatch kill two doesn't quite have the cover on the person that was going for the plant, but you know what? He has that kill afterwards as well. So does it really matter when he drops another 3K and wins the round for you there? And it wasn't just him, of course, right? Like pressure was being put down from the window, which distracted the smoke. You had Azur finding the first initial entry kill as well. But ITB able to get the better of VP so far. No more time lapse for either of these two teams. He yeah, again. Almost an unfortunate situation on the hatch here, but survives. And then they clean up. I mean, Virtus Pro. What a way. 10 seconds of insertion. The falling away. Unfortunately, here you're just Five sitting and remaining. drifting on the unfortunate back end of what has been, as I said, a strike back the into the game that the pace has been lost on you. It, you know, you're not entirely sure if it's entirely a full read on the setup, but whatever it is in ITB's playbook, whatever it is in the lessons learned, it has been brilliant. BP's do or die. 
for two more rounds. No more mistakes. Otherwise, you'll find yourself in some trouble. That's a rotation spot for a player on site. Twice. Oh, that's two players on site. Might be new gemmers out there, but it's still going to be aware. The hatch is left soft, so it'll take some time for reinforcements to come through. How is it with the verticality play, though? And that drone is going to be gemmed out, so it's not going to get any more information until that gemmer has been removed. But can they maybe even go for just a quick plant attempt? Like, is there an opportunity for that base? on how things are currently set up. Well, Crete is inside again. It's going to get himself a punch shot to look through. Always a no all will find themselves a kill. And suddenly, ITB down two men, but still have a fighting opportunity here as Crete will find yet another one. Attackers recovered the bomb defeat. I mean, a two versus three here. It's not entirely lost. We've seen rounds go away. Noah gets the strike onto one here. He's looking to see if he can maybe follow it round. Putting the pressure in and... At this point, with all this time left, they're going to be trying to drone and rebuild the structure as a stick in the kit, trying to get it locked in. Attackers activating the Nothing, diffuser. nothing comes in the silence at this moment. Noah holding onto the stairs. The fight is actually called out from Fountain, leaving just as a alone waiting for this 30 seconds. Can he try and clutch this out for ITV to take the full three? Can he take the two more remaining? It's a quad for always! Asked about it before the sneaky rotation round on the side of CC. Is he called always for many other reason other than he's always there? A close one. Too close for comfort to come through. But they live yet another round and they have the opportunity to push this towards an overtime. Again, it doesn't matter for ITB how they win. Of course, they would prefer the full three points and, and make the distance on Virtus Pro. But if they do win this in overtime, it is an equal points, but head to head favor to ITB. So, what's going to be next? A new site, as they've just managed to lock this one off. Can you find that success there again? I think the crucial part is to find Creeds. If you find him early, because you saw it there again, like he, he finds himself early into ventilation, opens up a nice little hole into, into workshop, catches someone off on the rotation. He's just lurking around, not being contested whatsoever, and he finds these impactful kills. This, another hole, another sort of break in the moment six to five for how many rounds have gone away from Virtus pro over the past you know six Ten seconds does sort of show how close this game still has the potential to be creed has Five been phenomenal him being shut down earlier on in a round might have been the big fight as he said it was a bit of energy that the team could get behind as soon as we had that first attack round where creeds went massive and he's just refused to get any smaller. But as pro, starting to maybe try and eke and seek pressure around. There was a lot more adventure in their play on the previous defensive round. They were sort of exploring the map, exploring the possibilities of retakes and reapplying pressure. But this first engagement could be the biggest tell. Swapping next! Getting the information out. Again, they want to get the cheap opening early on. But cheap, I mean, you know, not paying for it with another life, not paying with too much of your HP or utility. Four drones already have fallen to the hands of Virtus Pro. As the phone calls are coming through, he's quickly denied by Shepard, of course, as he steps into the mute jammer, but they should have an idea where these players are. And I think in entry into tellers is, is going to be the case some verticality coming down from the hatch has a wolf find dan as he went for the pre-fire just giving away a bit too much there dan as he was opening up that that vertical and into the bathroom wall a bit too much and vp find themselves a man down now with a minute 35 left on the clock Azard right below the side as well has the opportunity to watch sandwich the player rotates out pasha back towards the site meaning that office is a little bit safer to play for now but of course that's not going to be the eventual site it is ventilation it is workshop and they can oh. start opening that up now where is the vertical it's not being watched if you look at them right now they've been able to find a little spot and i said 
looking for these points of interest and finding them very interesting is this read through Azza, he's now making sure that if they try and enter from the back end of workshop they'll get cut they're going for the retake the smokes come out greed he moves into the back of the site and gets a freebie he's looking for the follow around as kenny seems to stick the kit in the meantime oscar gets the swing round. it's a post plant leaving just always in shepherd Pulling out a two versus two last time. It's got to be a much deeper one this. And there's at least some, but Shepard all alone. In a one versus three. Creech cuts them off. ITP. And the letter C on the end for his performance. A phenomenal day at the office of Border for Creech. Brings ITP the win against BP. Reeds has just been able to play whatever he wants and however he wanted it. He's been able to just lurk himself around the map, insert himself into the side, find flank after flank whilst the rest of his team was working on finding these opportunities to play for that plant. And ITB, at the first half, we were like, have you really learned that much? And the second one popped around and approved that age old saying, there's two halves to a game of siege. It was just a much improved performance from them. It was everything that they sort of talked about. They backed up. Virtus Pro still struggling. They weren't quite gifted the same things that they might have been last play day against G2 when they found themselves getting some of these rounds back. But otherwise, we'll see what they have to say about it on the desk. Three points for ITB. Looking pretty good for them, as we uh, as you may say. Moves them up from, I think, sixth on the leaderboard to, like, third. Shared with Fnatic, even though they lost the head-to-head -to, -head to Fnatic. So, right underneath that. Of course, still plenty of teams that still need to play today in that context. And they got the three points. But at the beginning of that game, it looked a little bit difficult, right? Yeah, lots to learn, I think, for Fnatic. Uh, not for, for, you said Fnatic, and I'm just thinking about Fnatic. Lots to learn for ITB. They yeah. went back to the same map. We challenged them. If you're going to go back to the same map, have you improved? I think the answer to that, particularly on their defense, was no. You know, they weren't reacting appropriately. Whenever pressure was coming, they were just not reacting, staying in their positions and not trying to help each other as teammates. That was pretty much until Creed decided to just take the initiative on like round four or five. Can't remember the exact round. And he just stepped up and just killed everybody. And I think that gave ITB a lot of confidence. I think that was a big momentum shift. Yeah, and not only did they just play their position, they kind of got stuck in their positions like really yeah. hard. It's not like they played their position, let go of it when time went lower or when they had killed the amount of drones. Or It's not like they traded their position for anything. They played their position, they died in their position, and that's it. That's it. We saw mistakes like Oscar being on that mirror window in office. You have a spare reinforcement. Why don't you reinforce the hatch? When we saw Virtus Pro on the defense, they did it. So clearly that there is something still to be learning. Yeah, but their attacks were really, really good. And one player that stood out to me for that was Astro in the, in the entry kills department. Yeah, he really stood, stepped up and showed and led the team in his way. And obviously Creed's what a game he had. Yeah, I think actually on the balance of things, we, was expect we were hoping for both teams to improve on their attacks. Obviously, it was, you know, ITB that improved on their attacks the most. We just saw Creed's on that big, you know, defensive round that really was the turn. But yeah, I think that's where, where the improvement was came. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it for a long time, but the confidence that Creed's took in the late defense rounds and the early attack rounds yeah. to be, you know, sometimes you've just got to step up in Siege and be the guy, right? And that's what Creed's was. He was taking those engagements. You saw it in the last highlight there where, uh, where Noah wasn't. Creed just stepped in front of him, killed the guy, right? Get on with it, right? He was getting aggressive, getting in the face of VP. And VP really didn't know how to deal with him on that finger. They, they didn't. And I, I'm so happy for them that they managed to come through this because attack, we talked about it being the harder side for them. Yeah. And they actually looked really good with the coordination. And the communication, obviously, is the, what leads into that good or coordination. So something was really clicking for them. And they, they, they sent a message today that they aren't to be messed with. They are able to adapt. They are able to improve over some short amount of time. And that's some of the stuff that is really, really important to show, especially long term, because now teams know that, OK, if they've played a map already once this stage, they can yep. change that around for the next time. It's great improvement, even from the space of within a week, it is almost. And yeah. You touched upon Azure real quick. I mean, something that really must have helped him as well was having that bug on the map like Border, being able to use that verticality on the map to seek out these defenders. I think it's a pretty unique, not a unique way, but ICB seem to like to do this. In most of their attacks from Border, where you see a lot of teams, they'll start from like top east position or go and attack CCTV. What ITB do is they go in below with the book and try and get the information to get those kills for, for free on the vertical. I, as I got so many kills just looking up the vertical with the angles on the book. 
Yeah, and it's Buck is such a good operator on border in specific because there's just so many soft walls that you want to reinforce when you're yeah. defending it. So even if you're not getting maybe through the right passing that you want to, you just make your own one. So you have so much available to you for a Buck player mm -hmm. that if you're comfortable and happy with it, you make that map your own. You create the layout that you want because the shotgun just makes such big holes and on top of that. Yeah. So it's overall, the operator fits. If you're happy on the map with that operator, you're gonna do wonders, and he did. Now, while I3, of course, got away with the three points, it was a very close game. So I feel like we still need to talk about Furtis Pro because as it stands, they currently dropped towards that lower half of the, or they were already were in the lower half of the standings, but now in that bottom three, excluding themselves from playoffs as it currently stands, that's really not the furthest we're used to seeing. You can even see it in their faces. It was really getting to them. Yeah, I felt like they were in their defenses especially, kind of repeating their own mistakes over and over and not really changing up the play style or reading into their opponents. And we spoke about this in the pregame. They aren't very adaptive. This is mostly in their attacks, right? But today it was their defenses as well. Because in, I mean, in border, does defense really exist? You're kind of attacking as a defender yeah. because you don't want to let them into the map. So you're kind of an attacker on both sides in, in some way or shape or form. And it just was very little adaptation and it looked like they were very disjointed. They had a lot of gaps in between them that Into the Breach found. And I mean, Creed's again, that's where we're talking about him. He, he just found them constantly. Took, take that last round. He just pushes in, finds the kills in the back in the back row whilst they're planting. It's the stuff that you need to see and that's why they were playing much better. I think you really want to talk some more about Creed, right? I, I <laughs> yeah, you. I, I will you. always talk about Creed. I wow. think Creed's fan, fan club. Yep. Population, Fresh, and Fabian as Definitely. well. We absolutely love talking about Creed's, and I think, you know, the the player that he was and the player that he's developed into, uh, you know, I want to talk about this because Creed has had a great game today, you know, 19, 20 kills, whatever he got. However, what is important for the viewers to know at home, I think, is actually that when Creed was playing inside the tier 3, he wasn't seen as a primary entry player. He wasn't seen as a thinker player. He was actually seen more of a kind of lurk player after the primary and secondary entries, you know, linking between the team, being a little bit more flexible when needed, and then going in for those backstabs. When he's joined ITB and when he trialed with ITB, it was in this primary entry role. So he's had to learn a new role within, what, one, two months, because he was trialing with other teams before that. And he's absolutely excelling at it. Every single game that he plays, he is learning so much about this role. And look at that, 19 to six in a rookie season, against a team that finished third place at SI, that's absolutely monumental for him. And, you know, obviously I'm a, a pretty close friend of his as well. So, you know, very, very proud to see him do that as well. It's really exciting to see that from uh, from his side. But of course, after a victory, we have an interview as well with Kenny from Into the Breach. So we should be able to welcome him and have him on the line as well. Good evening. Those three points must be very welcome to you. Yes, after um, a sore week last week against BDS, we only had one game last week, so we only had one chance to pick up points and, and four cheers against BDS. So we kind of like fell behind a lot of teams. So um, we've got a tough week this week coming up against VP and G2. Um, but we know that, uh, that with the improvements we make day on day, that we can be competitive with those teams and three points are also sweet today. Bear with me here, Kenny, because there's a lot to break down in this game. First of all, because you played this game map the last time you played in UL, you guys have changed around a little bit. We saw Creed changing positions with Noah in the top floor defense, changing more into that central part of the map. Oh my god. Is this... Uh, oh, oh my god uh, Is this something that you guys have been looking at and kind of trying to send a message to other teams in the league that, hey, we're not to mess with, we know our weaknesses and we can improve on them week to week? Yeah, exactly. Uh, if, if you as a team just get absolutely or even just loot even the games you win you know you, you're looking at where you can still improve like no team's perfect every team should strive to improve day on day week on week game on game so um we we looked at how bds picked us apart and we rectified a few issues and, and we noticed that um noah's fantastic at the break pause but we didn't really have a player suited to playing, we call it Brazil, but in CCTV area. CCTV area can be an absolute nightmare to play. Um, and just having uh, Creed as like the link player in Brazil, he can make a lot more like aggressive plays that he's so good at on defense, getting the opening kill. Um, we saw it today on Catwalk Window. And Noah can, Noah can be a bit more of a standalone turret which you need in cc because a lot of rounds can sometimes live or die on cctv um, and charlie wants to play aggressive for, for opening kills but the cctv pods didn't really allow him to 
Um, so that's why we changed them around. And uh, yeah, even though we got seven wand on border last week, we're still extremely confident in our border. And that's why we weren't scared to bring it out even after an absolute demol demolishing. It's a very good message, of course, that you're sending off with that as well. And you said you have a difficult week coming up with G2. How are you preparing for that? Um, how are we preparing for G2? By not scrimming G2. Fabian will know. <laughs> I know all so well. You don't touch the teams you're about to go up against, but you always have a little game plan in mind. Anything, something you, small you want to share with us, maybe? Um, well, I don't know. Uh, I know Titan is a super analyst, so I'm not going to say anything that he can try and deep dive into. He'll decrypt any I'll keep my cards yeah. placed to my chest. <laughs> just before you say too much, of course, you don't want to spill all the beans just yet. We'll, uh, we'll cut it short here. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and we hope to speak to you again very soon. Thank you, guys. Have a nice evening. Thank you. We mentioned G2, of course. They have a game coming up after the break. It'll be against Secret. Don't go anywhere. Hey guys, it's Leon Gates from Fnatic, and today I'll be playing Unmuted. You're all very unbalanced individuals. I don't think I've ever heard that before. Like, if I was going to guess, it would probably be like Nomad, because like obviously air jabs and stuff, and you fall over, or Oryx. I'll go in Nomad for this one, I think. Bandit. Yeah, I've never heard that in my life, and I've, <laughs> I've played a lot of Bandit. <laughs> what does an artist and a sniper have in common? Oh, this is easy. I already know it's Glass. Blatant Glass of the operator video. Yep. <laughs> they forget the first rule of survival. Yeah, I immediately just think of Thatcher with that one, I think. Oh, oh yep. Yeah. yeah, that's right as well, actually. Yeah, operator video. Pass those plates around. Oh, that's an easy wreck. As soon as that armor is on the floor, pass the, pass the plates around. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> What's in the canister? That's smoke. What's in the canister? If I tell you, you'd have to die. <laughs> I'd have to kill you. <laughs> That's what he says. <laughs> smoke operator video. Yeah. Actions yep. speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. But I'm thinking, I'm getting like a Finko or Sophia. Maybe Ella. Maybe Ella. But he got, I just got an O after I said Sophia, so I'm kind of thinking Sophia now. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Not. Hey guys, so I just got finished paying. I'm muted. Hopefully you guys did better than me. Make sure you put it in the Twitch chat or in the, on Twitter as well if you want to let me know uh, how you guys did as well. If I remember correctly, it's uh, Skyzu who's telling to Jack to run out because he was uh, playing in uh, the second floor of the big tower. He was just baiting them for, for Jack to run out and uh, he could get both of them, but he got only one. And actually now they're f***ed, like they, they lost a breacher. They have to rotate, so now we have like the advantage. We still have the top and stuff, so 
Like we knew that they had like just one, just one breacher, and we knew that like they like they can't open anything. Just like they, they opened the main at the beginning with the the ace, so we knew that they had or like to come on the top or to come like tiny. So like that's why we were waiting them. They just pushed with the Osa. The Osa was like kind of like shit against us since we can't really kill the guy. And I think I I just shook the the one v two. I like I just picked and I should I should not have picked. We choked the map. It's okay. There is like uh, three or uh, three maps remaining. So let's just focus on the next map, and we will talk about it uh, after the match. Mm, like we knew that like every time on attack they were like baiting outside with like Brava and stuff like Twitch and stuff like this. So we knew that we just had to wait them and like. We know that we are better in gunfight, so we just wait them and play together, like in cross and stuff like this. Yeah, we wanted to make them waste their time. We knew that they love to to take CC control when they push uh, on border, so I just I was just there wasting time, and then we fall back when we get a kill or, or one minute and stuff. Like if we see like one minute, I just drop from T1 like just to waste time. I, I got killed like uh... <laughs> <laughs> the wrong timing. So now they have top, but like we still have C4s, and they have only like 50 minutes, 50 sec. But it's kind of like free for us. Yeah, we just we just give them space. I think we, we had the like we had the Valky cam like on the oh no, we had, yeah we had the Valky cam I think on like office that's why like we, we asked him to flank and that's where like we win the run. Yeah and one one of the reasons why we are uh, leaving top floor is that I can uh, I can flank with Oryx on the hatches. So it's okay if we let them have top floor control. <laughs> yeah that was part of the like plan at the beginning. We just sounds like we know how they play, we know what to do. Just just do our basic stuff and we will win. Our next game, Secret versus G2. Now, Secret have been flawless so far in Europe League, but the main question is, can they keep it up against the former world champions? And now that I'm saying former world champions, talking about G2, they might have not been performing the way we expect from a former world champion. No, today I'm going to start with G2 being quite questioning of how they've been playing. Because now we saw Virtus Pro in the game earlier, and they seem to struggle. G2 struggled against that team. And the only team that they've really been dominating this stage is Ants. And Ants haven't had that good of a stage either. So like we're looking at the performances and head-to-heads from previous games, it seems like G2 are actually quite low down there at the moment, and something just is not clicking for them. And I Go on. And I think the reason for that is, is I genuinely think they're a little bit lost in the song. Yep. I think that they're that obsessed with being the front runners in terms of strategy and in terms of being the best players, that they forget what a basic win condition yep. is. And it seems stupid to say, right? But I, when, when I look at this team, individually, they make so many questionable decisions. Yep. If they're under a little bit of pressure, they make lots of stressed and bad individual decisions that opens the round for the opponent. And honestly, if they're in front, they make some really risky decisions when they could just win the round out by pure numbers. And they give away so much that you don't expect. And I think that's because they are a little bit too lost in the sauce. You're giving me flashbacks. <laughs> that's for sure. Because that's exactly the same issues they have been struggling with for such a long time. They, they have a hard time wanting to play the absolute most, like, basic team play. Yeah. They don't want to set up crossfires. Well, they do, and they say that they know how to do it, but sometimes it's it's like lacking because it's just practice and we don't need to take it that seriously. This is when they need to show that maybe now they need to. Yeah, sure, they made it fourth in SI, but it's starting to look worse and worse, and it's not like from that SI win 2023, it's quite rocky, I would say. Yeah, they've performed well, but it's G2 we're talking about. It's not well by their standards. It's not G2 standards. Yeah. 
and those we know about because those are winning every single event and we're seeing them slightly even slowly but surely maybe not being the best even in the region anymore they like to make it difficult for themselves yeah. i think they've qualified two majors before but they had like a four percent probability of qualifying yeah. it they don't want to give their friends a heart attack like that but then again their opponents a team that didn't make it to a major last year but is going through a beautiful globe so far this year so it's absolutely amazing for yeah that's exactly what it is for team secret it is a huge glow up i think they've recruited seriously smartly we'll talk about uh June and Adrian, the two new players. Don't know why I was going to say Miracle there. I think they've recruited smartly. They've got the right players in the right positions, even including Adrian on the support. And it's, they're passing every single test we keep putting at yep. them. Each week, each game day, they keep passing it with flying colors. Yeah. We keep kept giving them like these challenges, you and me. We said it on the first play day. Have they had enough time to do something? And then on the second play day, we, or for them the second play day against Virtus Pro, we asked again, do they have enough depth to play the same map? They did. And then we see them one more time, and they're demolishing wild. So we've kept giving them the challenges, they've kept living up to them. Now comes an maybe even bigger, because now it's like you go up against former world champions, so now nerves might play into it a little bit more. But I really think that they have a really solid structure and solid team. Everything makes sense. I'm really excited to see them play, because whatever map they bring G2 to, G2 probably won't know exactly what's going to hit them. Say you're tuning in for the very first time with the, all the information that we're giving you, it would seem that this should be an easy game for Secret. But however, historically, it seems that it has been going in T2's way quite often. Yeah, I mean, look at that. We've taken you all the way back to 2022. These are the fixtures between the two teams. Three best of threes, three best of ones. G2 have won everything apart from one best of one where they lost it in overtime in 2022. So based on history, G2 should be favorites, but based on form, it absolutely is team secret. And it's not but it's not just the form though. Like sure, that's part of it, but looking at the new team that Secret has, I think they are looking better than ever. I don't think they've ever looked this solid because there's something they have gone on adventures. They've been finding a secret scroll in some temple or something. I don't know what it is, but everything seems to be clicking and they they seem to have good coordination, which is very hard to come by, especially when you're this fresh as a roster. I mixed you in there too. <laughs> I do think that this iteration of the Secret roster is probably one of the strongest that we have seen so far. And I feel like a really important factor of your team, of course, is that support staff, that backline of your team. We'll have a look at two of the backline players of these rosters. We have a head-to-head -head between Adrian and Uno. Yeah, so we've got the head-to-head. -head. These are the two, quote-unquote, hard support players of the roster. Both of them previously, I guess, entry players. Uno back in the yeah. day was an entry player. And I think both get aggressive, but particularly Adrian, he's come in, and he's absolutely blown away because he's putting up stats that you wouldn't expect of a sport player whilst also getting the plants. He's getting one VXs, big multi-kill rounds, big on KD, big on entry as well. And he's really impressing us so far. The stats speak for themselves, but there are other things to this. We're kind of looking at the, well, Uno's been support for a while now. So it's yep. more of the older generation of player versus the newer generation of players. So we're seeing something revolutionary because now support players, this is probably, well, it's been for a while, but it's the first time that we really see it where support players have to be extremely vocal. Usually you used to have the in-game leader in the back line. It wasn't usually the hard support. It was more of a flex player. Now the in-game leaders and the like shot callers for the end game of the round, so like your win condition, your mm -hmm. plant, whatever it is you want to achieve, usually falls on your hard support. And both of these two players are very vocal and they talk about what they want. Alamo has said countless of times, Uno is helping me so much with the end rounds and it's showing results. Now we need him to step up maybe a little bit further because it's looking a bit rough for them. These two teams played against each other in the Malta Cyber Series where G2 knocked Secret out of the competition and the maps we had were Cafe and Bank. Consulate would have been the decider for getting it today. Yeah, both teams very, very high preference on Consulate. So I suppose when it would have been the decider in a best of three, you expect to see it in a best of one. Both teams like it. The big thing for me here is that G2 absolutely love this map. They've got a great record on it and crucially they're starting defense. Why is that important? Consulate is really defender sided and G2 are a huge momentum based team. So if you're a G2 fan, you could probably take some quite happiness in that they might be able to get a good lead and then hang on to it. I think that G2 have done a really good map band face here because there's two maps that they love, Consulate and Skyscraper, and they get to choose the side on both of them. So they had done a really, really, really good mm -hmm. map band side. And I think it's really brave by Secret to allow it to come down to that and then choosing I'm assuming they really wanted Consulate. That's what I'm yeah. going to put it at. They're not going to get that out banned. But it's brave of them to give those two maps to G2 and give them defense on both sides because they know that they can pick it. Yep. 
you know what? Our game is ready. So we're going to bring back our casters and we don't even need to ask them any questions. We just get to bring them back in. Of course, we're saying hi again to Hap and to Fluke. And when they'll be with us, I can actually just throw it away immediately to you two for Secret what? and G2. Oh, I was going to say favorite and freshbian. I don't know. I've... And freshbian. I'm trying to... <laughs> it, that's what that's they are. My name. That's our death. <laughs> no, we are going in now and we're going to find ourselves on consulate as they did say. It is a defender driven map at the minute. A lot of the meta is, but it shaped itself into this situation where people are still trying to piece together how to break the early defense tries. It hasn't been tried and tested. It's come in at the same time. We've had one of the biggest meta shifts over the past, like, six months or so to a year that we've had in a long time. This is going to be a tough opening half for Secret. It is, but, you know, at the same time, it was mentioned before as well, their form seems to be doing slightly better than G2's. Let's see if they can keep that up as well. But there's yeah. something that I don't think was truly really harped on about, though, there, is who they've had to play to get to this position. Yeah, I was looking at it as well. Because G2, you know, they've gone against BDS, BP, uh, Fnatic, and Ents, right? And the one game that they've sort of won cleanly was against Ents, 7-3, and then Fnatic, they won it, but it was 8-7. BP, they almost got out of the way. Secret have had a brilliant start to the season. They've had one of the best starts this roster has ever had. To a competitive season, or this, even this org, it's been wild Ents and VP. It's not really been these sort of high, terrifying teams. This week for Secret, G2 into BDS. This is going to be the toughest week a lot of teams around the world would ever have to play in Rainbow Six. I love how Secret's been playing. This is where they can sort of cement that. It is one of those true tests kind of moment, right? Like. Of course, G2 aren't on their, like, the, the, their, like, fire that they have been, but they did still come in fourth at the Six Invitational, and they haven't really made any changes. So they should still be able to be a good benchmark to that extent. And especially when we're on a map that, you know, I mean, all G2 love that haven't really played it that much themselves yet this year, only three plays. Um, the consulate... It, it, it became, it's no longer, like, it's not a fundamental map like Oregon or Clubhouse would be. But it has changed a lot since, like, the rework to come through. Um, and there, there's quite some different kind of strategies you can use. You have, you know, the quick in, quick out up top that often gets done. But the completely opposing admin take as well. Uh, you know, verticality when we're in the middle side. So there's a lot of variety in approaches here on the attack that Team Secret will have to show they can master over the next couple of rounds. Virtue. Seeing if he can get a bit of a free gift on the back end of a repel here. He's going to wait until that audio starts to pop because, well, how do you compete against it? Is he going to get gifted? They're on the right, but they know that the angle is just as wide. One out. Miracle removes Virtue early on, and that means that wall's going to stay soft. Doki gets sat down by Adrian in the same second, and G2 sort of, well, you know, wanted to wave their hand at the windows and say, come fight us. And here, Secret have gone, sure, Benja. He's going to move up. Get a bit of revenge on the swing of the top. He's just there's another second drone comes out towards him, pre-firing the angles. Will he decide to pull back? Yes. Just in towards meeting room. It's gonna say, there's no real reason for him to stay up here as he just gets swung on. Instantly decides to fall back. Flashbangs come through. He's completely blinded now. Another one will follow up on it. Doom will not be able to find a kill onto Alamar, but I believe in the meantime, we did see another kill to come on through. Azuno will find a shotgun kill onto uh, Doom to run through. Benja did see some big frame five, but Adrian just comes around the corner and cleans him up. Alamar still holding on above the hatch. Now, the site does require some vertical pressure to still be applied at this point, but with a 4-2 to two split, they can afford to set themselves up for 2-2 two, two versus 1s and just sort of body keep Alamout off Attack the side itself. The Adrian baits the kid over. He's on a tear and he wants to see if he can try and tear Alamout across as well. How aware are they as Gruby goes down but gets back up? Uno does cement the kill as the follow through, but Adrian gets his third for the round. As I said, he left the kick because he wanted the body. A miracle gets the last. I mean, I said, this is going to be the map. This is going to be the game to prove 
secret of one of those top dog teams. And if they've made a believer out of our desk, more rounds like that, I think they'll make a believer out of everybody. That's for sure. Pretty solid round coming through there. Almost no mistakes made. Good teamwork happening as well. And like a single fight taken where they didn't have the advantage on the player out there. And thus, that first round goes in the way of Secret. G2, probably not happy with that. We'll uh, also, at the same time, they'll realize it's only round one. Things happen. Now going up to the top floor, not continuing their double down on the rotation. I mean, fair enough. This is generally the first pick site you'll see a lot of teams roll with. You can get a lot of a solid lockdown as it sort of used to be. Keep your arms off. The, the two takes, you alluded to the one where you can sort of zip in onto what's the CEO console window, zip out, bait the utility, then go for the plant. The same way if you can conceptually think about it at home, of when you're trying to plant bank in the basement and you sort of go in, bait the C4s, go out, you do that, but out of a window, which is the role that Savage is going to try and play towards the top of CEO. The other take is an admin take, a sort of classic one, push yourself across and just plant just on the inside of the door on meeting. But this operator with this selection and setup, I feel like we're about to have a minute and a half to two minutes of juggling. It's the good old mini game that we get on a map like Consulate. Um, and it's basically due to the lack of other ways to, to really challenge this. Um, and, and talking about ways to challenge this, there's no smoke on the board for G2. There's, there's two Nitro cells and a Solace down below. If they manage to find Doki and basically hinder a lot of the opportunity to, to find like vertical angles and anybody out there trying to go for a plan, this could be a very successful plan really quickly. You know, almost caught as he pulled himself back out of admin. And there's the plant. They're going to go for the top. They're going to see if they can stick it. They drew all the attention towards the other side. G2. Hello. C4 is a little too late. There's a little bit of damage towards Savage, G, but a post plant retake on this is so hard. What G2 has is a lot of players, and they've got to get themselves outside like that. Brilliant play from Alamo to get the double. Uno's going to stick. Groovy is in the other side of the world. He just can't make it, G2. Realized in the final seconds what was happening, but built on the back of the double jump. That Alamo engagement goes away from them. You assume the round might follow. Very snappy take, very snappy retake. That said that the retake was even snappier than that take itself. They they realized they knew they had to go for it. As long as you let those players stay alive on the wind that repels, there's no way that you're going to be getting away with that one. So a great player, a great retake to come through from G2. It's basically a blinking, you missed it kind of deal as soon as that defuser went down. And thus they'll continue as they find themselves at around on the board. Again, close game against Fnatic. 8-7 uh, loss. Uh, win, sorry, come through. Then they had the, uh, um, the only the clean victory on ends with the 7 3, but the complete beatdown against BDS. Like like the 7 2 on the other hand. We've, we've seen G2 literally go back and forth. Uh, and I think that the first round and the second round are a great example of their form so far. Attackers are heading out to defuse a bomb. I guess it's one of those things where you can go back and, and, you know, maybe sort of get the taste of where things went wrong. Obviously, usually those sort of set up claymores underneath all of the hop out windows just to buy yourself some safety. It can be red, but at the same time, I'm wondering if Secret saw an opportunity and took it a little bit too sharp for their own sake and could have maybe prolonged things, especially with the opening pressure they've been able to build on the other side. Still. One apiece, G2. Great bit of rotation and retake leads them into this, fighting even once again. Four C4s gives you an idea of how they're going to try and hold on to some of that vertical. How will Savage be used though? Is um, Damos going to act as a roam clear here where they spot out a player and they decide to just try and hunt him down at a 44 and realize, oh, he's on the site. We can cancel that, go on to the next. This is quite literally going to be a 1v1 me scenario. Maybe like one of the strong points of G2. Multiple ways the operator can be used. It's still very new, so you know, there's always that. I mean, 
course, it's limited by the ability. Oh, Miracle taking some shots vertically there. Nothing too major, of course, the adrenaline search still around. The Savage swings around the corner, will find a very opening, knows about someone potentially being around as well, dude, <laughs> swings, gets to confirm eventually, the Great will not catch him, he falls back as well down to Spiral. Just gets away with it there, Uno Doom, three paces further forward, and he would have been able to get the kill maybe and at least protect the swing round that was a lot of slow motion decisions being made by Uno there. It's not easy to dance on a grenade. But a minute, a four versus four, and they still are uh, trying to wrest the control of the vertical that they want. They have the ram, they have the spark, they have everything to open it swiftly. Reloading. That leads in then to actually the park the pressure on the site, and that work is some of the stickiest oh and the God. trickiest. Miracle loses an engagement that he knew was coming. Virtue. Great take. Very clean one. Mirror window to be opened up is going to put in on a bit of a... A precarious situation here. Knows about someone on yellow. Reach, however, coming through. Zoda canisters not used. That means wall has opened up. And Uno is one of the last lines of defense. To get it with Virtue out there, you see him on the right hand side of your screen, watching behind a second mirror win, and now smokes are starting to come through, and they need to oh. move through. Groovy gets one kill with the LMG. LMR tries to get a nitro cell into the right spot. Will it land? No, it will not. 45 counting down just now as LMR pushes through. Another retake will be attempted as Virtue finds one. Not the second, however. It's an effective 1v2 situation. Make that 1v3 as Adrian gets revived by the Adrenaline Surge. And as Benja chases outside, they know exactly where he is right now. Vertical is on play. June gets the final kill. Great idea, a secret there. They knew that they sort of lost that body. They had to try and make it come together. They trusted that G2 would sort of be playing on the back line, letting them try and push in. You can see a little bit of shaking their heads there. Obviously being dropped based on the back of Traces fired through smoke. It's rough. It happens, but... The lead in the engagement, if you'd have maybe silently gone for the rotate, pushed, they'd have had the split angle, the C4 getting caught in the middle of a, you know, absolute blanket of smokes down there in the garage. It was just that sort of singular moment, really. Here, Uno getting the lead in. And this, raining through, and just caught on the back of traces is all it really is. It's facing the traces, right? to brag but the amount of kills i got by you know tracing back the tracers and just firing back at them it's, it's just so unfortunate as well though it's like you, you just pre-fire that position you walk away you get pre-fired back it's like okay well five seconds to go skill issue i guess at that point it's just unlucky timing Attackers objective. No, secret. yeah find themselves the second round so they're still leading or leading again rather Again, the desk seems to heavily favor them over G2 currently. Um, it's a good test to see where both these teams are at currently. I mean, it, it's also a bit beyond that as well. It, you have this great form that a lot of teams are having. It's outside of really BDS, none of the expected teams have been delivering results. G2, BP, Wolves, they're sort of up and down. And you're getting these surprise strikes from teams like Fnatic that have had a really good resurgence. ITB being able to pull the game today, but Secret have just been locked in. I think they've taken everybody a bit by surprise here on the ride through. There's a great collection of talent that's really coming together in these takes and these holds. The drop and the quick zip in towards the site. The fight is all a go. Miracle swings round. Savage gets the knife, but it's two down for G2 here. Looking for the shotgun follow around on yellow, but they've actually left, caught out. There's a player to his left. He's inside the F dot, throws at the worst possible time, Alamau. He's able to freely move around the tracks thing as Doom is left alone. But not for very long. Doki gets the lockdown and, well, they tried to throw it at the site, throw it at the wall and hope they could take a round. Fortunately for them, it was red by G2. Yeah, quick attempt there, uh, quickly punished for it. So anyhow, you know, the two quick rounds we've had basically went to G2's way. Uh, one of them, of course, the plant and just a quick retake to come through. This one was kind of a 3 to one execute as well. Not quite working into their favor. Might, you know, make you think, okay, so if you, if you go more methodical, if you go more steadily at the approach, you find that success. If they, if they can continue that, 
Nerdy should not have any issue finding yet another round, or maybe even two. I mean, that the first kill swung around with the knife, and then suddenly everything was gone. The shotgun, if it had followed around the corner, might have been able to get the warden on the top of yellow. But again, that still leaves you in the three sort of versus two, two versus two. As you said that secret, they've gone for these quick plays on a couple of these rounds. They've gone for these. Let's put the pressure on G2. G2 enjoys thriving in the chaos at point. Five seconds to insertion. Now, I believe G2 is the only team currently um, that is inside the E well whose attacking win rate is higher than their defensive win rate. Which is quite funny, <laughs> knowing that the meta has been dubbed like the defense meta by like 60-40, something like that. And that's something you see back with a lot of these teams, like the defensive win rates are like 20% higher than their attacking win rates at that point. Um, Team Secret, actually one of them, 55 on attack, 84.6 on defense, so almost 30%. And that means that if Secret managed to get yet another round out here, Statistically, they should be doing fine as Uno going for the challenge up on the copy window. Was forced to fall back as well as... Oh, his cover is gone already. He's just alone out there. Flash springs were starting to flood in. We even have a Deimos waiting down below. Haven't gone. With a quick attempt at a body this time around. Admin control is theirs. Without the play on it, they're going to go for the cover and the plant just... At the bottom of your screens there at the top of that staircase, which is the lockdown position, the shotgun of Alamau is going to hold on to as best as they can. The first thing, securing the vending corridor, getting yourself the wiggle room, and probably rotating someone towards the top Attackers of Spiral as well, just to make sure that any players that try to rotate back around to retake can lock them out. There's Savage doing exactly that job I talked about. This is a, a important fight that he makes sure he doesn't come out on the wrong end of. And with the initial drone, it's going to take care of the entire... Actually, no, I believe it has been uh, muted out. Yeah, so there's one on the back of it. It's going to be very difficult to remove that one. Jim's going to give it a second attempt. Needs to detonate it a bit earlier. There you go. It's going to remove a bit of the uh, boarding onto that wall. Grenade will take care of the other one. And the Savage is coming up with a 44. Just gets his head removed. The second one by Benja. Completely blinded. We'll find Ruby anyway before the first one falls on G2. Three apiece and Virtue at least... Keeps it into their favor here for G2. Retakes the top, but these FNATs have been so problematic for these approaches. Just shows the raw power of that operator to control these high traffic areas. As they said, all of this open space is the requirement. Adrian's been able to get himself towards the plant spot. He's just going to get him the cover of those canisters. Make sure no one can swing around. Doom's going to come in close for the close support. They're trying to push for the retake, Attackers but G2 around. knows that they'll have some time to do it after they slip out. The c force too late, and so is the Defenders rotate. Have located the diffuser. Doki gets the catch. Only Adrian left. He's down the stairs. There's one. There's a C4 oh. to say no more. G2, sit up, take notice, and take a round. And almost making it out there on, on that post plan, just... So we're a bit quicker on that retreat, might have been able to to find themselves into that safety, or if they had another player out there, they could have maybe watched that flank. And then, you know, you kind of start coming back towards that numbers game. Jeet is so quick with that retake, knew exactly where these players were as soon as it was a 1v3. One goes for the swing, the other for the C4. There's no way you're going to be able to find both at the same time. And with that, it is that G2 round to come through, finding themselves in the lead. Savage out there with the 44. I'm not quite sure what he was looking for. I don't know if he was in hunt. But you would assume you'd rather have like the, the high, higher rate, uh, fire rate kind of gun to just, you know, top off the top of the bar, see if you can find ahead. You know, I'm just not sure why the 44 was used there. If it was like a conscious choice for like maybe penetrating some floor uh, walls or anything like that, or if it was just, well, he had it out because he just finished a hunt or something like that. And that's down for you to piece together, my friend. I'm here to talk about G2 putting themselves ahead. Three to two. And step back around here and is it truly deserved it's hard to gauge because they said on the desk before this each were a very momentum based team to get themselves locked in 
quite quickly based on how they're performing mentally and, and you know, I guess we'll get the idea of how much of that is on the secret side. It's been a very balanced game from secret pretty much throughout the entirety of this. Two rounds ago, I think only about two players from the side of G2 really had any kills. It's been a big return for the rest of the once world beating roster. Hellamau just getting himself a bit closer to the support here. They want to ensure that they take this engagement with multiple players, with multiple players. Ruby's at the top of yellow. The swing is savages though on the back end. And for Benja, how long is he going to be able to sit here? Not very long. Groovy gets one. Benja goes for the retake. Reloads close and somehow gets a second. Is that three? He's out of bullets, but he's got a knife. Two versus two. There's a drop to other all the way to the top. And I mean, as I said, they build themselves on momentum. Everybody is capable of those moments, but what a swing back from Benja. It's the second time in two rounds he gets away with that as well. Like the previous round was completely blinded out as he got a double kill whilst being flushed. And now here under all the pressure, how to just find those amazing kills to come through and really turn that round back into G2 favor. Virtue's listening for some steps. He realized, well, that's a misplaced C4, but he might still step over it. Detonation comes in. You know, in the meantime, is hunting on the horizontal. Has so much place to go. And as soon as, like, there is any form of Jew putting any pressure down vertically, and he doesn't watch his flank, that's when Uno can come in for a cleanup. And as he is currently looking, there you have it. Uno gets the shot off, but not quite the kill. Rotates back around. That must be a scare, but it was also the call for Doom to realize there's only one on side that can go if it wasn't for the final member to watch him drop. I mean, <sighs> the, the second kill was a surprise. Approaching a door, reloading, while someone on the other side knows roughly that someone's close hitting the floor, getting another kill on the follow through there. And then, I mean, it was the moment that defined the round. There's no two ways about it. Four to two though. And you worry that it might start to define the half. G2, they've got themselves pretty much going for the good. It's a, I'm gonna say a surprise to a lot of people after the first couple of rounds. Yeah, for sure. At the start, it was definitely like a, a secret kind of feel for the game. Those last two rounds, though, G2 have been able to really fall back into it. Avenger. Just the injury was the teammate, actually, I believe, that came through there. Because he sidestepped as bullets were coming in from behind. And then he finished it off with the knife. Because I think the, the person was still standing at the end of... Yeah, the TK. Because I was going to say, like, I, I, he wasn't firing anymore at the moment he went DB, you know. So, you know, just, just using your uh, your environment and your enemies against one another. Just the side top's gone through. Jumping in front of them, falling to the floor. Yeah, exactly. Sidestepping as well, right when they start shooting you, so that they shoot their teammates. Uno gets the early take onto Adrian. Shut out. G2 might start shutting out secret round after round. How much energy, how much momentum can they bring? We saw some very quick attempted attacks. No, it was early takes. We go all the way back to the beginning of this game. G2 had lost two players trying to peek outside within the opening about 30, 40 seconds. Now, the control coming around towards the top of yellow there. Gonna take this slower and steadier, not going for the throw themselves in and plant approach. And we've seen a few different styles and strategies of take, including two shields and a f one of them being a fused shield. That we saw played by, uh, I think it was P plus Kia in Korea. Take a small amount of damage under the bees. It's just an easy pre-fire, but he still gets one before he drops. Savage will fall as well. However, as Jim comes up on the back of the spiral stairs, and he's just a step behind, has the opportunity to strike down five oh! rounds, two. The defuser now dropped as well. And Virtue in a 1v2 situation where he needs to find and isolate these players. But look at all those horizontal lines of sides that he needs to be watching. 
sends out the bees to get a little bit of extra information, rotates around to see if he can isolate any of the fights this way around. And as he swings close, he will find a first, brings it back to just a one-on-one. -on -one. Miracle, the last man standing. He had an idea on where he was. It seems he has an idea with Reese now. And Virtue looks of yet another one. And G2 close to getting a map win here. Huge, huge round for them to pull back the solace. Almost excellently swarmed up the top of Spiral unheard a couple of steps with Pep. And they're able to pepper the back of two players with bullets, but what a pullback there. It was so quick to get the first body, to get the first take, and then from then following it through. I mean, the tag time out at this point, secret Seems all the wind's been taken out of their sails. This is that tough challenge. I said the week was going to be the hardest that they've played so far. This is one of those that you've got to try and step into. Important clutch to come through and Doom almost managed to save that round. He, he, he was a step behind, but basically for the right reason if, if he was any any further than that they would have known he was out there and wouldn't have just put his back towards him right so it kind of worked out for him it's just that virtue was unknown at that point and manages to find that clutch as he isolates the players uses the bees to cut down the line of sight smartly enough you have it june finding those two and as the bees were cutting off lines of sight or, or basically rotations without him knowing just deducted that in his mind like, like sherlock holmes is like okay cannot be there so it must be here in connector goes to the pre-fire and finds that kill virtue he hadn't been statistically up there to build into this game he'd sort of found himself unfortunately at the bottom but he said there's always the possibility of a player from this roster popping off and putting themselves in these do and die situations Ten seconds to insertion and there was the one of do or don't dive. 5 to 2 Five G2. To the timeout called. How much of a reward will it net here for Secret? They've got every single site open. It's almost sort of saying, look, this is a fresh swing and a fresh attempt at the start of the second half. A very cheeky spawn peak here. When you climb up a ladder, you cannot fight back. But a lot of people often choose to repel rather than use the ladders itself. Bandit trick. Yeah, it's going to be Bandit tricked out. Will they wait, though, before they put down the second set of pellets? Yeah, it's just... Oh, actually, no, I think there's eight pellets that got used there. No, 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 just for Never mind. Yeah, yeah it's just checking. Yeah, they open up the window as well. They've got time here. But the Zibarau isn't going to buy them anymore because Alamau's inside the site. He put all oh. the pressure onto it. In fact, yeah, they do get the it's canister the off. They're trying to get the Bandit over. There is Adrian. Going for the pop, they throw that second canister early. They can pay attention to this. They made sure they had guns up as soon as the bandit went for it. So they had two of them facing the fight itself. Alamau's forced right back out the door on the back, but there's the back of them. Savage swings. Uno does get one, and the breach does finally fall. Two minutes remaining. The breach open, and Loki and Alamau opened as well. It becomes still pretty tricky. The Monty might have been the lead in force, and although he went very deep, now a rebuild against Doom here. The slight mistake coming through, and indeed Doom now finding himself up on the horizontal. Oh. Misses a lot of shots. Virtue just escapes with his life. But Doom having a man advantage, the impact now taking down Virtue. I was going to say he's going to rotate up towards the top floor and waste time, but as it's a two on four situation now, he's just going to play it from the actual side. Uno finds one. Now we need cover. We need Benja to be watching up from above as this plant will be attempted, I believe, onto the yellow pillar out here. As Uno finds yet another one. Is G2 just bringing back these situations where seemingly they are down, they are lost into winnable opportunities? And as he goes for the plant now, 45 should be counting down soon. Benja drops in as well, misses the one in the kitchen, leaves it only up to Uno, gets a quad kill. No way he gets the ace as well. He's holding now onto the plant itself, tucked behind the chassis, he's off. He's looking for the engagement either side, but Groovy does not hand it to him. The swing is Groovy's to take Uno. Just could not hold on. I mean, four's pretty good. Almost getting the ace back into that round though. G2, they're still knocking step for step on the precipice of pulling this into a 
I was going to say, it's just that like the Monty got slightly misused there. I mean, I like the first use, you know, in yellow, watching, okay, the, the, you know, the bandit is not here yet. We see the bandit, they cannot actually uh, trick it actively, right? So that that's good information. It means you can continue onwards. As soon as he passed, though, that's when he started moving in. That's when Nitro started to come through, and they started losing those body, uh, bodies on the site. And he just lost your Monty, he lost someone else. There was no more cover coming in from yellow, so the Solos could rotate down and shoot Alamo into the back of it. So they might have gone a bit overzealous there, but Uno, a huge 4K, almost the eight. He just had no idea where the last one was. I think he was afraid he might have already passed on towards the yellow pillar out there as he was watching for it. And then the swing just came in from the double door. No movement had been made yet at that Five point. And if he would have known that, a plan would have gone through. Attackers must locate and defuse a bomb. Five to three. It's not as wide as it was, but you still got to go. The potential chance of an offsite in the third is a very tricky a one to get located. leveled and to get balanced here. G2's well aware of that. They're more than happy to keep sort of setting themselves up and keep continually pushing. Towards where the engagement's going to go. A very quick read in, Uno. Hope he's get anything on the back end of that window. But it's the breach that gets popped open instead. Watching from above, spotting out some pieces of utility. There's maybe something that can be done about it with either LMI on the Twitch or maybe any of the RC heroes that could be used. And as you see them hunt, well, that's a frost mat. Well, sadly, nothing you can do with the Twitch drone about that. Looking out as well in the end. And this is just like, you know, when you see this happening a secret, you just need to take your time, make sure that your utility stays up, but also be vigilant. Because someone could be coming in out of nowhere. Jube loses the fight to Udo. Second time that happens. And you know, almost taking no damage out there. Still alive, taking out some cameras from above. Has established a foothold into administration. I mean, really should have been a fight that should have gone Uno's way there. Oh, shouldn't have gone Uno's way even. Making a hole. Getting themselves that extra space on towards admin, getting themselves that wiggle room. You can see they're still not entirely comfortable handing it over. As long as Groovy is in that end of corridor vending position, he's the problem they have to force out. I talked about it before. Got to drop your way in towards the top spiral. Try and force the catch on the player, which is where Doki's gone exactly ready for the rotation. Virtue's getting the drone out, but you still have to force the player to move. Otherwise, they'll just sit behind that shield and hold on to it for as long as possible. You know he's going to be the first step round the player the grenade take onto the fight goes away from uno but look at that flood of secret kills in the top right corner everything pushed back against it to offer some support towards the vending position virtue's a little bit isolated and lost but doki inside the site gets the back end of virtue to get some cover and support a two versus two moment of pause the smoke canister pops doki to try and see if they can maybe recollect the kit and recollect the information could say diffuser still down, slightly far away. He's going to take him 10, 15 seconds to recover that, leaving very little time to go for the execute. But they have little choice, and quite a way that they've been almost clutching things up. They might just make it stick, Emmy. What they have to do now is just try and get the cover around. We saw this go away in the opposite situation. So the motion has to come through. It's to his right. The pings come against them, but the smoke is the big stop there. Nine seconds. They've got to go for an off the piece plant position. And there it is. The spray on the soft. The catch goes against the kid. It's a one versus one. He's got a sprint for a fight, but it's not a very quick operator out of time. We're out of time. Trying to swap over to the pistol as well. Of course, you have the LMG. That's an extra penalty onto the movement speed as well with the latest patch. And at a time, things slowly started to slip away now again. Seems like Secret got themselves away back in. And that's a technical timeout to be called from the side of G2. 45 seconds to discuss with their coach and themselves how to make sure these things go their way on how to make sure that they can actually lock it off because they're starting to lose the advantage here. From 5-2 to 5-4. Still in the lead. But it is dissipating. It's an important time to have this conversation. You have to stop this momentum. As I said, the tertiary site is going to be that big hold. You either generally, you're seeing teams bring the split site and bring themselves into that situation. But 
at the same sort of stretch of things, if you lose this round, it's too late to take your time out. At that point, it doesn't really matter what you say. They have the mental and they get to talk just as much as you do. You have to put all of the pressure onto the weakest aspect. We're also backing from that into a technical pause by the looks of the top left. So at this point, the teams will just have to sort of sit and stew over what was discussed. See if they can try and bring it to fruition in this secret. It's really a trial by fire, but you kind of wanted that to proof the, you know, sort of metal. Also, by the way, the players cannot talk or communicate in any form during the technical pass with one another. It's just sitting there in silence and hoping that whatever you just discussed in the technical timeout is going to be worth it and it's going to work out. As you mentioned, yes, this is uh, for G2 a way to maybe get back to form, but for Secrets to really prove that they are one of those teams that could be fighting for a top two, could be, you know, challenging for the major spot. And of course, we're still out in best of ones now, and we still have the playoffs to come afterwards. No, no one's given a spot right after, right? It's like you still, you still have to play through those best of threes, through the playoffs. But you rather have a top two seed, which gives you that buy, didn't have to go down like the long route which could be for g2 i mean maybe not yet but by the end of the stage they're only five points two away from from it to be um close qualifiers like last chance qualifiers it's definitely not the way they want to go miracles found his ven oh savage as well they got their zen state Close your eyes and practice deep breathing. I think that's very... That's sports psychology there. Yeah, I was going to actually point that out, right? It's like that that some teams have uh, sports psychologists or coaches that have like at least a little bit of experience out there. And we always talk about like you need to stay in the flow. You need to not let the nerves get the better of you. And what better exercise than to just breathe slow, slow everything back down again. And of course, when you're a player that has a lot more experience, uh, probably Fabian can attest to that, but like, you might not need that as much. Of course, nerves will still get the better of you, but like when you've been there, you've won three assigns, you've won a bunch of majors and pro league finals, you have found your way to find that calm. These players are still in the very start of their careers. I mean, it's not like they're rookies for the season, but you know, it's not like they have been playing in the highest of leagues for the last six years, seven years. That Doki finds his calm, just tries to get rid of the glasses headache. I know all about that. Move the glasses. We have the tension. Unless you're short-sighted, then you might need them. I mean, how short-sighted to not be able to touch the bridge of your nose, I guess. Again, oh, they're actually typing in chat to one another. Yeah, oh, they always are. Just bantering around. If G2 is in a lobby, the all chat's open. I wonder how many teams give their players the instruction to turn off the all chat when they're playing against G2. Holy stump players. I mean, that was just... Should have been Doom's take. Should have been Doom's kill. It's one of those engagements where if you see it on land, who knows how it could have gone. But at that point, you got to give credit there. Of course, the attacker repelling in and being able to get the tail end of it. Not an easy fight to take, even when you are in the online scenario here. This is where it'll boil down to. If you missed it just before the technical, it was a tactical. G2's to take. They have to take this round. Repel's also uh, always a bit finicky, right? When you, when you repel in. It's like you have to time it just right, and otherwise you're going to find yourself pretty far as soon as the person comes remaining. around the corner. Uh, unless you take it head on. Because then you, know, you just shoot him as a repel in. But the timing is just such a quick movement in such a short time as soon as the repel has started. It was a bit of a 50 50. Unless they absolutely don't know about you. That does. Now, quick entry from Benja down into the garage down below. It's being hot droned as well, just to make sure there's no one actually out here. Playing around on the box, so a lot of vertical uh, potential from the operator, from Benja. 
Trying he's to see if he can. He only has five kills so far. I mean, he's trying to see if he can try and find the big important kill. I said it before. What are these players have the possibility to pop off and I'm still going to say the three kills from before where here's all the way up towards the top of spiral. You can see the pings coming out on the back end. They're going to see if they can try and maybe force people into the catch. Please get your defaults, guys. That's oh, no. going to be something where you can know that Fabian and Fresh and everyone behind G2 is fuming about that moment that will be seen later on. Alamau's holding the top with the shield. Hasn't gone as deep as he did before. But he's at least throwing out the utility. It's that soft wall on the top of uh, yellow that makes it quite difficult, right? Like, he cannot fully watch towards the connector door like he's doing right now, because if someone is swinging them from that window, that could just be a line of sight that comes into him. But Uno finds the very first. There's a jump out because of the default cam, and Savage finds a return kill. I mean, probably saw that he was on camera setting himself up with the Claymore outside, and that's the cost of a default. Savage is caught a little bit. The sprays around the back of the piano. They can't quite make the music hit. Doki going to get himself dropped and rotated around with the flank watch drone here as Alamau is making a lot of friends with a lot of impact explosives. Groovy's around on the back. Adrian's here to support. They know support's coming and it drops out. Doki gets the double. The swing round goes against them. Alamau and Benger. The two versus one. They know exactly where Adrian is at this point, but he can try and isolate himself for single engagement. Benger's been sitting down at the bottom of the spiral for as long as the round's been long, but it's traded. G2 just get through to map point. You mentioned a very important round indeed, right after your own tactical timeout. You've been at the front doors of, of finding yourself at a map point for a couple of rounds now, and they've done it, got themselves on it. That's a point on the board, but they have the opportunity for a full three, and that's what they will be aiming for. Currently four points behind on Team Secret, have the opportunity to get close, but not quite jump them. If they do end up on a similar amount of points at the end of the stage, attackers have discovered the head to head will count. Now, it, is, it has to be said Team Secret has had an off day yet. Uh, G2 has not. So they will play one less match, G2. That makes this match even more important in their comparison towards Team Secret. They have themselves two solid sites to lock in and lock down. And we've seen some. I'll say interesting dive takes Ten seconds came remaining. through, but going themselves here towards the split site, they're trying to push Five seconds to insertion. momentum, the energy of this game. Attackers objective they can get that ultimate the setup. Bomb. The lockdown there on emergency execute. They're not going to oh, exit even. They're not going to play against the bandit trick they did before. You too. Pressure is on you. You need to lock this off. And you have one less game to play compared to some of your opponents down on the table. Every point will count. As long as they get into playoffs, it will be fine, right? Because then basically everything has been reset again. It's just best of threes. Oh, should be working out fine. Oh, get some freebie or so. Just go on his drone or cam as soon as Doki repelled up. That's unfortunate timing. I mean, uh, 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 there's a lot to that. And obviously being on the cams, being visible, maybe they just didn't expect it. But the rappel up towards one of the most prominent windows on the top floor hole, the steady break and cacophony of pressure comes across from admin side. Groovy's going to hope he can sit in the corner and not be caught out. Adrian does get the C4 catch onto one. Groovy's able to get the second follow through. Uno gets a bit of window based revenge before the spray through the soft as Alamouse to take. For a second, June was thinking about rotating up to provide some help, but this is back towards a three and three and 90 seconds left on the clock. He's fallen back slightly down the spiral stairs, still in an opportunity where he can surprise. Especially as Alamau is putting his drone in place. I'm not quite sure if he continues. He's definitely not droned out Doom and seemingly doesn't do so either. So the opportunity strikes. He would have had the opportunity. But Doom rotated all the way around. He's in the basement now. The diffuser has dropped, so it needs to be recovered with a minute left. And if Doom is going all the way to the top floor, it might actually complicate things even Attackers more so. Have recovered their diffuser. They said this about Doom. He's one of those blank players that... You get headaches when you play against because he just keeps finding new places and new pockets to roam and lurk in. 
He smells opportunity and strikes. Most others don't even know the oven's on. Virtue's been able to get himself around towards the top. Avenger getting the drop onto Miracle below. This flank over the top is getting more and more important as Adrian would have to try and swing his way back up there. Hit on the drone down the stairs. They're watching it. Does he know? Just covered by the pillar. Adrian gets one. The hop in the window. Looking for the planter. He's waiting for the Benja. swing, but Benja doesn't know. He's to the left. Just misses the tail end. There's the catch. And there's G2. Just get themselves over the line. And if you read lips, you know what Doki said there. But that was a longer game than they expected. I just scared me for a second there. The impact goes off, you know, the drone gets knocked. He's just not watching it. Up until the last moment out there. That that was a scary last couple of seconds in that round there. But they managed to drag it across the finish line. They managed to find those three points on the board and push themselves a bit more into safety for a playoffs position down the line. G2 need to start putting in more and more of these performances and Beating Secret, who's on a tear and on a great bit of momentum. It's a very important game for them to stamp out and say, no, 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 we are one of those top two teams. We're the ones that are going to be competing with BDS properly. Talking of, that's the unfortunate next opponent that Secret has to try and bounce back to, which I don't think anyone wants to see, but I know who we want to see, and it's our team on the desk. Thank you so much, Hap and Fluke. G2 break the flawless streak of Secret. And G2 themselves, they get some very much needed points. It, they are very important points. If we look at the game as a whole, though, G2 relies very heavily on their individual performance this game. And I think that we have some players that really took a step up on the individual when it seemed like they were struggling more theoretically and more strategically. So it's a win for them. It's three points, great. But I still think they need to shape up better and more because it's not that much depth to it more than individual performance. That was a really exciting game to watch from, from a viewer perspective. It was really, yeah. really fun to watch. There was Jeopardy, there was, you know, clutches, there was an almost ace, there was 1v2s, there was absolutely everything. What I don't think there was, was control of the game from yeah. either team. I don't think either team at any point really felt in the ascendancy or even inside of rounds that they controlled them. So when that happens, what, what what do the teams do? Well, it comes down to who's got the most composure, who's got the most nerves, and who's got the best decision-making. Ultimately, that was G2 on the day. I think whoever lost this game, and I'm going to say about Secret right now, Secret will be kicking themselves, because that could have been a clean three-point victory. Had G2 have lost it, they also would have been kicking themselves, because every single round fell in the balance, which is crazy to say, given it was consular, and we know how good consulate defenses can be, but neither team kind of really gripped the game and took control of it. They didn't. and. One thing that I want to dig in more, you were mentioning composure, and all of that comes down to the experiences of the two teams, right? Yeah. Secret has something to prove in a way. And when you go up against the former SI champions, that's the game where you want to prove yourself. Also, the next one they're playing in the next game, they, they want to prove themselves there too. But this one is kind of like that little bit extra sherry that it's like, oh yeah, we beat the world champions. So maybe they fell for their own pressure that they put on themselves rather than the pressure from the outside. I think you could see it on some players' faces as yeah. well. There really was some pressure on their shoulders for this game. Specifically, when they got into gunfights that they probably should have yeah. won, lost those gunfights. Yeah. You could literally see some players grasp for their hair. It's like, oh, how could I? That. How could yeah. I? But they are so much better than that. Then they know that yeah. they are. But you have those games. Everybody can have those games. Problem is when one or two has it at the same time. That is really unfortunate. But starting off the game as well, we know concert can be very defender favorite. G2, of course, making good use of that. But they started to run away with it after as well. Yeah, I mean, we can call it defender favorite. I guess G2 obviously got a fall-two half. Let's not. Let's bear in mind that they won two post plants. So yeah. it could have been fall-two quite Attack, easily. Yeah. Attacker sided for secret, and that's what I will say about teams thinking that you know they could have got more points out of the game. They should, they could have, and in all like even if we start on the side for for G2's defenses, they also tossed rounds in in when secret was playing defense. So it's, it was rough for both sides there. We talked about two support players prior to the game. We kept yeah. our eyes, of course, on both of them, but one we still have to highlight even after the game. Yeah, I really want to highlight Uno. If we bring up his scoreboard, you'll see that he had an absolutely massive game for what we consider a support player. First of all, he had three entry kills on that support role, and it's very, very hard to, for you to get that. Sure, G2 play more of what we call the split theory, where there's no real support and there's no real entries. Everybody's an entry and everybody's a flex player at the same time. But Uno today, when that team has a rough day around the edges, that they have a support player that can step up and take this individual performance and just put it on his shoulders and say, hey, 
it's my game. I'm going to show you guys what I've got. And that quad kill he had in the garage, yeah, sure. They lost the round, but some of the shots he was hitting was mwah, mwah. Love it. <laughs> it was really nice to spectate that from his side, of course, seeing all those skills uh, flooring in his way. But we have an interview now lined up with us as well. We have Titan joining us, I believe, from G2 to answer a few questions for us. Uh, good evening, Titan. It's good to speak to you. Three points. Good evening. You happy or it should have been more dominant? I mean, we can't be fully happy with the performance. We obviously had certain areas where we required individuals to be able to pick up and obviously, you know, take rounds by the grasp and, or, you know, carry us through. But that's obviously the talent and sort of the individual skill that we have. There's areas I think we'll look at, go back to the drawing board and improve on for tomorrow. But generally, I think what this showed is in terms of experience and composure as a team, we are the better team still than Team Secret, even if they do theoretically on paper are the second best team in Europe right now. Titan, um, if we look a little bit more, I guess, holistically across the whole stage, because we speak to Doki a lot on this interview, and he tends to gloss over, I would say, some of the issues. What would you say so far for the season? Because three wins, one in overtime, a couple of losses. How do you rate the season so far for your team? I mean, it's obviously been a bit of a mixed bag. It's been a bit inconsistent from us. We expect a bit better from ourselves. I think our defense half is where a lot of people will sort of pinpoint as that's the point to improve on. And it's areas that we've sort of recognized in the past that we're still trying to make improvements on, developments on, be it either strategically, individually, or even just simple things like teamwork and comms. So that's where I suppose you could sort of say that's the pinpoint and the crux of the issue and well, where we'll see the greatest development and then obviously hopefully that's where the team will just keep growing and go into Manchester with that. So Consulate today against Team Secret, what was the plan? What's the reason that you took them to Consulate? Um, and I guess, how did you want to play against them? I mean, we played how we wanted to play to an extent, obviously, with the exceptions of the individual clutches. We had clear game plans. We wanted to play our game. We sort of knew that they would obviously leave it open as a potential option for us, that or Skyscraper, which is the last two maps that it came down to. And just generally, we knew that if we stuck to our game plan, we stuck to how we wanted to play, we did our processes properly as a team, we kept our composure, and we'd be able to just carry it through to the end of the day. There wasn't anything too sort of drastic or extravagant that was required realistically. I don't think it would come as a surprise that we have been putting some question marks with G2 as of what was have been happening as of recently. So what can we expect from G2 going into the future? More wins, as simple as that. <laughs> All right, that's a very clear but very good statement. Anything you want to say to the fans to close up the interview? Uh, not too much. Thank you again, everybody, for coming and watching our game. I'm glad this today we were able to give you guys three points. We hope to do the same again tomorrow. And most importantly, remember to buy the G2 Fenris skin that's out in the eSports shop right now. Very important, of course. They'll be thanking you for that promotion as well. We thank you for your time, Titan. Have a great rest of your evening, and we'll speak to you again. Thank you. You too. Awesome. But unfortunately for Secret, though, they have lost their flawless streak. Yeah. Yeah, that's really sad. Cool. There is still one team that has that flawless streak. That team is BDS. And after the break, take it on ends. Don't go anywhere. one in pocket and he only has just placed it so there's a chance that one will remain for a bit more yet. Oh, oh my goodness, goodness. what have we just seen? Stop stream, stop stream, oh, what have we just seen? In hand, near sighted is now J9O looks for a kill from that deployable shield. Ashen and uh, Fultz getting on the board. DZ suffering for it. How does Iconic pull that off? He vaults in the freezer, shuts down Pambazoo. Another there to drop as Iconic is just ready and waiting for all of these engagements and gets all of them as SSG snipes the round away from DZ. What seemed like a gift to pick initially Actually, the shoe on the other foot, an M80 barrel ahead, hat able to take down one, but Sploit, great recognition on the bar. He'll be able to at least knock it down an extra peg. 
Luminosity with only half remaining now in a one versus three. He's been delegated to this corner. We'll at least find one over inside of Dragon. Yeah. Those one has to be playing the office side, but it should be two more. It's a quad. It could be an ace for Hat now. Back and forth we go. Nitro Cell still in hand two. Oh man. <laughs> I'm sweating and Hat with a shot. An ace here up against M80. Still holding on to Geisha. He's going to have utility being thrown in at him from karaoke window. Shaco oh, goes in and gets a double. Huge kills from him. Make that three. And Shaco has just ripped them apart. Next, Kevin, is new map. A lot of the map is taking control of areas where you need to make burp, like buff. Ramp and sledge, a uh, massive one on Night Haven. Out the hard breachers, so thermite, ace, keep on uh, so you can open all the walls and then you can choose from whatever place you want to entry from. Yink is really good. If she is not banned, you need to be peeking almost every every map and every point. For defense, a lot of mirror, a lot of bandit, Cade, info denial, so mute, mozzie. Solace is a massive one because there is so many corners on that map. Outbound helipad, you are very fast into the map. I think it's called Quark. Four guys will spawn there, and two guys will go to the top floor, and two guys will go outside main, and they work in pairs and clear the roam. For me, it's like the best option, so you can refrag each other or you can drone for each other. You don't have many spawn peaks towards helipad, only one window in storage, so it's very easy to go into the map and not die. But kitchen is like, if you have a good kitchen setup, it is difficult to attack. And not many people play it, so it is like one that you can whip out if needed. For me, basement is uh, really good. You can put a lot of roamers above. When attackers waste a lot of time on, on top floor, they don't have uh, a lot of drones in the end of the round. They don't have a lot of time to do vertical to clear all the angles. A lot of people like, like to extend on like fountain meeting with like reception players to try and deny the entries. They're playing top floor heavy. You can just ignore them and just go directly for the bomb site through like the reception door because if they have a lot of people top floor, that's what they want you to push. So making sure you know where they're extending and how heavy they are in certain positions can really help you base your attack from which area you're going from. Those were my first entry tips for Night Haven. Hopefully they see you well.
but you thought we had the French Derby last week? Guess what? We have another one coming up right now. A French Derby part two or Big Brother versus Small Brother, I guess you could say. But here, the Big Brother is just constantly stealing everyone's toys. It's constantly their time on the iPad and they're getting away with it. We're talking about BDS. Yeah, BDS have just been dominating so far this season and I don't know if there's anything that can really stop them. One thing I have to mention though is Jack isn't here with me. And you know how nice that feels? Finally, he's been relegated from EUL once <laughs> and he's been relegated from the desk once now as well. But back to BDS. Ouch. Yeah, I just had to. Back to BDS, yeah. They just shine with this individual skill level. On combination with that, it's just incredible of a team. What they've been able to build in such a short time, mind-blowing to me. Now, if you're wondering where Fresh is or wondering why BDS is such a good team, well, Fresh is on the title later to explain that to you. I'm not missing. I am still here. And the one thing that I will say is some things keep people up at night. Sometimes it's trading. Sometimes it's ranky. What keeps me up at night is why BDS are such a goddamn good team on the attacks. So I've prepared two reasons for you. The first one on the graphic is going to be that BDS have a high level of coordination between players. And this is what's impressive for such a new team. So if we roll the very first clip, you're going to see round one, play day one, when they played up against Wild on Cafe. Grim and Ying on the east side of the building, causing a huge distraction. Well, why are they doing that? Because simultaneously, Likifak has repelled into Piano. Use that distraction to go and take quite an advanced position inside of the bathroom within a minute 30 against Wild. Really easy, quick synergy together. And what it does is it opens up the site as Likifak will find the opening kill of the game. And in such an advanced position so early on, it's absolutely criminal how BDS are able to get away with it. They make these little plays together and they get away with it so often. But what's the second reason, you might ask? Well, the second reason is when it doesn't go well strategically, they've got individuals with exceptional mechanical skill. Fabian will talk about them as the best team. You know, everybody in the right role is the best player in that role. I'm going to roll one clip. It was the highlight of the week for one reason. Shaiko, this round for BDS wasn't won strategically. It was won because Shaiko managed to walk in, find a gap, kill three people, and then even in sight, find a fourth one. And that's what BDS have. On the one hand, they are so, so good strategically, but also on the other hand, when it's not going right strategically, they've got so many good players. It's not just Shaiko, it's Likifak, it's Yuzis, it's Bride, it's Solotov, it's all of them exceptionally mechanically skilled. We could watch that clip over and over again, but then when we're talking about these individual skill players on the side of BDS, of course we need one person on the side of ENDS to be able to stop them. Yeah, and you immediately get Skies up on this screen in front of you, and there's such a, so many reasons for it. Skies was a player that everybody scouted a year ago. Literally every single team in the league wanted something to do with him, and the reason for that is just how mechanically talented he is. I think every single player in ENDS needs to take a step up. Skies is the one that I'm expecting to do so the most, and I know that he has that in him. I just think that this team overall needs to let go of the nerves, let's, do get, let's go of the pressure that they feel that they have, because there generally is none. They are so new to this tier one scene. It's the first time that people fully respect them as an opponent. They need to relax, let themselves be kind of stepped over for a while, and just if one game comes through your way and you're like happy and everything is working well, well, it's just going to click eventually. In my mind, this team needs to adhere, adhere to four words. Keep it simple, stupid. They're trying too hard with different operator lineups, their operator compositions, their theory of how to play the game and their utility. They're not making it easy for themselves. They're making their own problems in like 90% of yeah. rounds. Keep it simple. Stick to what worked well when you were a tier two team and stick to what you know rather than necessarily what you want to be because you are good enough to beat these tier one teams. And what was working for them, if you're asking that question, is they were highly aggressive individually. Yeah. But they were also doing that at the same time. So what we're talking about is just simple mini plays that you showed with PDS. They were really good at doing the similar stuff, maybe not to the same like level, but they were very good at that. And they need to kind of find, find themselves again, I think, yeah. because they are much better than they've shown so far. Now, these two teams met each other less than a month ago, where BDS beat ENDS 8-6, so full on overtime, or almost full on overtime. This time around, we're going to CAFE. How are we feeling about this map for these two teams? CAFE as a map, I mean, BDS, are extremely good on this map. ENDS also really like it. So it's a preference map for both sides, both enjoy it. But then again, it, it's like, does the map matter? I said it the last time BDS played against Into the Breach. Does the map matter when you're BDS? Probably not. No, it doesn't matter whatsoever, <laughs> because you're just going to shoot your way out of everything if you have to. 
but most of the time they have the strategical depth to just pick that apart anyways. The big thing for me is obviously both of these teams have played Cafe. They both played it against the same opponent. BDS slapped Wild. Ents just got it done in overtime, but that's not the biggest thing for me. BDS have played four maps in EU League. They've lost one round on defense. They're starting yeah, defense well. on Cafe, which is already considered a defender-sided map. So you would expect BDS to get out ahead and then never really let the foot off the throttle. I don't know if Ents had a big enough map pool to even compete with BDS here, mm, if I'm being brutally not. honest. Yeah. I mean, what we can be expecting from this game is probably quite a one-sided game as well, right? It would not surprise me if Ents go home with a 1-7 loss today. Aye, that doesn't sound all too good for uh, four ends here for our second French Derby, as we like to say it. But we can get our casters back in because the lobby should be ready. So our game should be starting very, very soon. Now, welcome back, Hap and Fluke. How are we? How excited are we for this game? I mean, I, we're watching one of the best teams in the world play. You, you're excited, but it's almost like a watch behind fingers if you're an Ents fan, I think. Starting with BDS, you now, now just looking at them, it's like, how long can they be this dominant, right? It's like it's it's not like they're just winning their game 7-5, seven, 7-4, seven, and, you know, they're pushing on them like, wow, they actually have a good shot. It's just that they're completely decimating the entire opposition that they're having. And it's like, how long can they get away with that before someone steps up? And, and, and is it going to be like grand finals before they're starting to get like in trouble? Or is anybody in EUL going to give them a shot for the money? Well, someone's going to have to break that flawless streak of BDS. Will it be ends? We'll find out on Cafe with Hap and Fluke. Thank you very much, Anne. And yes, we will find out on Cafe. The Dostoevsky, they've both Dostoevsky been to before already this split against the same team. Wild, they suffered at the hands of both these rosters. But only one French team can prevail today. You say French team, actually. BDS, obviously with a bit of an asterisk now the majority majority french but they, they come in english now so i'm going to claim them <laughs> i mean and ends isn't like you know six french players either they have a luxembourgian player they in there. come in french though that's for me the deciding they do, probably factor. yeah yeah they probably do yeah it's you know I mean, does that mean that all the other international teams are english teams because yep. they come in english yep the only team <laughs> yep I mean, you say all the other international teams, it's only really the NA teams. And we maybe They're actually... all English teams? We maybe actually don't <laughs> want to claim those ones. Let's, let's be honest. Right. We've unfortunately bounced straight into a technical pause, but there's still a lot to talk about in this showdown. Now, as was sort of highlighted, BDS are terrifying at this moment. 7-3, 7-2, 7-1, is the previous run of four games, and those opponents include G2 and Wolves. Both usually games that, although they can sort of go back and forth, stress BDS have just seemed stress free. On the opposite end, Ents losses to G2 and Secret, uh, an overtime loss to Fnatic, and one overtime win to Wild. It has been as scraped as possible to get their points, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, luckily for them, they're not far away from getting themselves towards a potential playoff spot. Uh, currently, two points removed. However, you know, there, there's some teams in the mix that have played one game less than them. Uh, of course, some that still have like a break day coming up as well, but they do desperately need to get themselves some points out here. Ideally, they get three is that would put them, um, you know, up onto sixth place right next to uh, uh, Wolves right behind into the breach. But it is BDS we're going up against, so it's a tall ask to go for three. So I think with any point, it would be quite happy here today, Ents. I mean... <sighs> It's just this game where you sort of go, we will probably lose this one. And I know you should always have that winning mentality, right? You should always sort of set yourself up as being like, yeah, we can beat anyone. Look at how it's going for Furia in the Brazilian league. Not as well as people would have expected. And they are, you know, it's hard to argue that they came into this year as the best team in the world. You just can't. At the same time, you know, it's just how well BDS are playing how formulated everything seems, how hot the guns are, how unstoppable the players are. It's the fact that Shaiko is one of the lower rated of the team says everything. The lowest rated of the team. <laughs> At the start of the day, if the top eight, four of them were BDS players and the one that wasn't in that listing was Shaiko. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's silly, it's ludicrous, it's, some of the best seeds that we've been able to watch of anywhere over the past month. And 
enter the team to try and step up against them today. Of course, Ants had a really rough start, you know, if, if, if you just look at how they uh, they got in. Um, of course, they, they played the Malta series. They, they basically uh, didn't really get too far there. And just look at that rematch against Team Secret, which was a pretty, pretty hefty loss. Uh, you know, and, like luckily they managed to get that win against Wild, but again, all the way to overtime. You just said it before. They haven't had the warmest of welcomes into the league so far. Um, but we do always say uh, you, you're only, you know, an official EUL player once you get domed by Shaiko. So I think they're about to get themselves the officially the welcomed um, to the EUL. For their sake, I hope not. But it is just a rite of passage at this point. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, welcome to EUL. Here's your... Uh... Is this game mandatory Shiko? Is your mandatory how do we Shiko? How yeah. This yeah. mandatory pressure. The play on Cafe. It is a very good map for both these teams, but it's one of those maps that I always sort of associate with BDS. I, I think yes. the freedom that they find and how they move around this map, what it offers their play style of aggressively sort of poking and retaking. There's not a huge amount of width to a lot of it, but the levels. It is a very dangerous cape. BDS love the bait. It, it all goes back to when Cafe was just reintroduced into the map pool, right? Like BDS would be that team that wasn't able to get proper control of piano, uh, which was often like the main force of the top four attack. And then, you know, at 10 seconds, they were like, guess we'll just have to pull the trigger. And they all walk in from the cigar shop and they still managed to win the round very convincingly. And it's like, how do you keep getting away with that? Because it didn't happen once, it didn't happen twice. That happened so consistently that even, you know, a year or a year and a half later, still talking about it, that that was like a trademark of BDS at this point. Even if they had no control, they would have no tr like no problem at all winning these rounds. This first engagement is trying to be weighed up here into the favor of, oh, you would have said Ents for a second, but Solotov leans into the fight. He's expecting the second follow through, pre-fires, and just ducks around oh. the back. Skies. That's that take. Golotov taking off with a minute 30, and they've been able to get themselves in and underneath. They've got to see if they can try and turn this into a bit of control. The second engagement, Echo gets a little bit sprayed here. Another E1D will pop. Feedback isn't moving as of yet. They have the pings, and oh, oh, oh Neko. Huge take from deep. Yeah, just move right into the pre-fire out there. Great shots to come through and a good clear from the side of N. So with that, they can start building as they get themselves on piano to get themselves around, check some extra lines of sight. They're slowly getting themselves ready for an execute. There is still some uh, some flank drones that are being set up and some rotations that we're witnessing as well. I'm not quite sure if they actually got the uh, the evil eye or the black eye story that was located right behind the lamp. So they might still have information on Asics. So I'm not quite sure what they know about the rest of them though. 40 seconds. They still have to try and get this kit down and. Well, Shaco's going to do his best to just slow down the approach in the swing against him. He's still got a back line of Breed, eh? They're watching, and as Jesus gets the catch onto Skies, he went for the quick dive onto the balcony, but the Alder swinging from deep. The players in the middle of the site itself drop from the hash. Breed is caught, and Freezer gets one. Suffers a lot of damage. Great swing from Rykos. And ends open up with the first round. Yeah, great start there for uh, for Ants. Again, starting off solid with finding Solotov, basically forcing him to chase the drone. He went aggressive on the window, falls back, gets picked up from the Red Stairs area. Bit of lack of information on the side of BDS, not knowing someone was already out there. After that, of course, the yellow player being picked up as well by uh, Neko, managed to get that long shot off from trains all the way towards White Stairs. You have a two-minute advantage, like you shouldn't be you shouldn't be losing that even if you're playing against BDS. Of course it can turn on at any point, but that like that is basically the best start you can wish for uh on, on cafe this early on. So make full use of that on the side events. Now they need to continue that. But that's the most difficult part because BDS of course will adapt. They will realize, okay, this went wrong last time. Let's make sure that we're a little bit more dialed in towards those openings. Seen. A lot of sort of false starts from teams before. I think Ents being able to get those early engagements. The pressure was attempted to be sort of laid back against the approach. And almost carpet under their feet, turned out. 
time. There's extension towards the top. The hatches are open. They're going to see if they can try and waste as much time above Jamming before they pull themselves back. Force that time where, if you're still looking at the execute of the previous round, yeah, it ended up very, very clean and very well put to the pace, but they had about 20 seconds. 30 seconds to play with. If one of those engagements had gone wrong, sure, they might have been able to pull someone else into the situation, but otherwise, at that point, they're putting the trust that the work is done and the push will not fail. Yeah, found a grid was going to be able to find the Ash, of course, who just dropped down the skylight or was walking underneath the skylight. Uh, boom, suddenly you find yourself with a big problem out there, right? So, something to keep in mind. Oh. Talking about people dropping the skylight. It's Rykos finding one, knowing about a player around on round, but. Still not off. Spider tends to start tingling there and he starts rotating off. He's not going to take that fight. Probably feeling that he was being watched at that point and that they were ready to go for him. Oh, actually, good swing coming out from Bride. And you can basically, like, if you're playing down here, you know Bride is going to be in VIP. They're, 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 yep. Add one-on-one -on -one together. Yeah, he is sort of kind of known for that spot. Almost hangs a coat on the hangar player. But otherwise, still just getting this vertical done. They're at pretty good pace, actually faster than you think. Could have otherwise been put before with the extension that was played above. They were so Slug quick Max. to remove the fact that it's actually gifted them. The bonus and the boon, the buck. Breaking all the barricades above. But shepherding and pushback of the players, it's not the most uncommon for this position. Bomb located by attack. Sending off the phone quickly, Shanko is hoping to find someone with the vertical nitro cell. As Azix is putting down some pressure, he knows there's someone out there challenging wedding window as well. For now, this is just the verticality that's being played here, but as he blows it a bit early, Azix now, bit, bit more stake with his rotation. And then they now need to make the decision where they want to push from. And it seems like there's still a lot of pressure being put on Bakery towards Wedding. Users is going to be receiving tons of flashbangs. Is Shiko here to support him? Because Bakery falls, which it doesn't. That's the diffuser down cold. They have an opportunity oh. to hold it. Able to get the second there as the follow through. Not quite blinded on the back. Shiko's going for the retake above. Just misses and then finds. The follow-up engagement here in Sky. Suddenly, all that's left. The first body was taken away from them. There, they couldn't quite get a body in for the lockdown. And uh, even though the keeper barricade suffered a nerf, you can still see the strength of them and just allowing users to play Bakery as aggressive as he did in the positions that he did. The final fight of Sky's great little tap peek around the corner with five seconds, three bodies and no kit. This is just an even second. It's just an exit frag, right? Like you're trying to take this fight to that point, but you're not going to be able to win the round no matter what you try, as long as you stay outside that building. Well played there from BDS. Good stall up on the top. There was a lot of verticality being open, not really much being done or being able to be uh, done with it. He said a push coming down for like a bakery kind of take, hoping that they would be able to put up some pressure for, uh, horizontally. The lack of... Like the, the the true real push coming through is just the one by one by one and coming in there. Not having to crossfire, not having opened up the wedding wall, which basically stops the player from playing in cupcake. No enough flashbangs. There's multiple things that could have saved them around there. And again, perfectly played by users, right? Rhett was happening. Dug himself in in the best possible solution. Found the kills, found the round eventually. Okay, it's still all to play for, still very, very early. And I mean, again, if we're going to talk about how that first round came down with three seconds, 30 seconds, and a single engagement could have been the deciding factor there, if they've been able to remove users, suddenly you've got two players storming in with a protection side on the end of uh, Wedding. And then they're just putting pressure in towards what was a very open site. It is still a lot closer than some of those end of the rounds might make you believe. I think at this point, what we want to see is maybe if you're looking towards BDS, EFAC being able to get himself on the positive of an opening engagement, or Solotov for that matter as well. Neither of them have found any success so far up to this point, and it seems like Ents have a really good way on how they want to lead themselves in. Yeah, the opening engagements so far have been Ents' way, as you mentioned. 
The first one was, of course, uh, based on like a good bit of bait coming through, like the drones being out, hoping to go for a bit of a pre-fire, which was punished. But BDS, they need to find themselves on the opposite side of it, or at least stall it long enough where there is not enough time left for the players' events to really get an execute going as soon as they find that opening kill. It's the first E when they pop, it's not going to find anyone, but this is definitely going to be a top floor take. They're trying to take that top down approach, see if they can then use that verticality into their advantage. However, I believe there might have been a double run out to come through that was traded evenly. So like a fact, will find a kill onto Rykos. I believe indeed Brady might have jumped out the window. Shaiko will go down in the meantime, though. I do get the end of Shaiko, and you're right. It was the jump out from Dining Window with the swing from the bottom of White. Just to make sure that they got the kill, but it does also give the game away that there's one all the way deep. So they use that moment. They use that energy to push towards Shaiko or that position and take out the player there. Three versus four, a minute 20, and again ends. They've got themselves in this beneficial position here on the top or a site that statistically actually plays against a lot of teams' favors instead. Now is Solotov's moment to shine. He had an amazing game. It's the last time for BDS, and something where he had been a little bit quiet at first, getting himself used to the roster where users seemingly hit the ground running. Solotov, oh, he's going to hit Cigar Shop shooting, gets the drop on the skies. Three and three flash pranks to come through. Leak effect in an absolute crucial position. Has a slight gap here through the smoke, which he can use to stop any jump ins from truly happening. Solotov as well, watching it from the vertical. Those two players are crucial to stop any of these jump ins to come through. But the horizontal pressure comes in, and Solotov will drop. I oh, did the rotate. You saw him droning there as we were watching from the perspective across. And here now, the three versus two. They pull back that body balance. EFAC is unwavering. He knows exactly what he needs to hold, and he's waiting for the second to swing round. He fires against the boogie drone and just gives a little bit of this away. Uses his court in the next engagement, but wins it out. There's the follow through, and he's held firm. Azok stuck in the middle of both. He's trying to find a swing, but he is out of time. I said it before, he's not left with a lot, but he's just shy of the last drip. And that angle on that window is so important out there. He saw the quick response time. Didn't even have time to register if it was a boogie or not. Just pulled that trigger as soon as someone came through. And again, you know, good way, uh, good work actually from the side of Ents to clear out that vertical pressure that was out there from BDS. But time is a factor at that point. As soon as that boogie gets tossed in and you, you hear the shots coming out, you know that that window is being watched. You know that that jump in is probably not going to result in a kill, but actually to get you killed. There's not really enough time to go for a rotation at that point. So you find yourself in trouble. Kill from Solotov, wasting time as well as he makes himself known. Leak effect there. More importantly, finding that kill. If he would have missed that, that would have been a diffuser indeed, but a potential to plant. So locking that one off might have been the most important kill of the round. Attackers have located a bomb. So, BDS pulled themselves ahead, but definitely been a lot more stressed than the previous games we've seen them take, where it's very much set up in hand here. Ends up putting in a fight, putting in a shift every single round, and you're excited to sort of see where this gets to when we get to the second half, how this ends. It's going to stack itself up, because... So far on this attack, they have been phenomenal. They're finding that opening engagement, finding the pressure when they need to apply it. Even if it's otherwise just being pulled away from them. Extra footholds being opened up. Just to get yourself ready in case they are necessary. Again, this should be a top-down approach, but occasionally we do see like a quick push over the horizontal. See what we can make happen there. Get used to the boogie there. Lots of openings being made. It's I put a little bit of extra pressure on to Leak Effect, who's playing around in trains. Solotov, of course, saw that happen. He's now worried that someone might follow up behind it. Doesn't really have any additional cover as Piano is being drummed out. Look at that angle, though. Leak Effect can watch all the way up to the hatch so a drop he can actually cover off. Filthy. Filthy angle. It's filthy. I mean, we'll see if it actually comes together at this point. There's always new things to be learned in this game. However many thousands of hours deep. Sometimes you see in angles like I had no idea. 
<laughs> it's just like, I wish I knew that earlier. But not now, because I'm, I'm going to get that used against me in rank. Yeah, oh, I know. As soon as this broadcast's over, I'm, I'm going and playing around with that angle. <laughs> Nako suffers, I'm assuming, to that angle, because he was eyeing up the hatch. There's Solotov getting the end of the fight. Uses and Shaiko, they're able to get one apiece as well. This execute has fumbled and fallen apart. Fortunately for Ents, this is the a week as they've come in on towards their engagements onto the map itself. They haven't been able to get any territory control here. Seeing that the fight is being pressed right up against them. With the kit isolated and alone in a bar on a Monday afternoon. All they can do is see if they can try and give it a little bit of company, but it's going to be awkward to get there when EDS is selling you bars closed. Willing to double down on that as well. Piano gifted to them, but no real importance towards the actual side. The hatch is there. Capcom traps are being spotted out. You would assume those are no longer going to be triggered by any of the attackers, but you never know. And as they continue going over the top floor, and the boogies are being sent out as well to cause a little bit of noise. A vertical push needs to come down now. Oh, and oh, 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 but he gets himself removed by Shaiko. I mean, Shaiko dropping it from the swing round. I said we wanted to see a little bit more from EFAC. We do. We also get Solotov in this action. And what we do get is a flawless round. I said it before the mining dining round that statistically coming into this, that was the weakest side. I only had about a 40% defense win rate. So them going there is okay, seeing if they can work and then they make every site work. It's just BDS at this point. They have plans, they have plays for a lot of this game now at this point with the age of the roster and the talent of the players. And here, forcing the tactical timeout, and they're realizing BDS is starting to heat up. <laughs> that is problematic. When they start to heat up, is there any stopping, right? It's like, it, it is like an unstoppable train that's coming at you. How much can you do in the tactical timeout? Now, you've already managed to make them lose their second defensive round of the stage so far. That, that in and of itself uh, is an is a achievement. But it doesn't net you any points. Maybe, maybe for the viewers, but not on the actual board. But there's a lot still to do if they want to find themselves with points on the board here. And, you know, you said it before, not every game can be about winning. Sometimes you have to be realistic as well as a team. And of course you want to win. And if you can win, you will go for that victory. But this might be about stalling out this game for as long as possible, learning as much as you can, and see if you can maybe take a point home. It's always that rough thing though because i think outside of that round that that's the first round where ents have seemed locked out of it that's the first round where bds have seemed in full control even though there was that sort of round down here before where yeah they were trying to force the pressure they're trying to force control what ents have been able to do before this round fell apart was pretty great they got the opening kill they had full control over the sort of first and the second story or second and third if, if you don't say ground floor and at that point, it was the actual push on to users who sort of stuck in, dug his heels, put some keeper barricades up behind him and moved in and amongst flashes to get two kills. That's the sort of thing where that's the single instance that's gone away from you and the round's gone away from you. But Ents are closer in this fight than a lot of other teams have been up against BDS so far, regardless of the fact that it's a three to one. Yeah, no, that's for sure. And even though we just had like a follows round to come through again, you know, those happen every now and then. Um, I, mean, I believe, you know, Korea League, we had a game that had four or five flawless rounds in a single game. It was a you game. Know, that, that, that's a true blowout. It was a game. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's the, the true, uh, if the greatest team currently, Talon can be defeated. Maybe BDS oh. can be defeated as well. Single foot of an Azami who's back onto the site. So, Leak Effect, he'll be spotted out, but don't think he's going to be receiving too much pressure there. Otherwise, they're going to have to be really aggressive if they want to shut him down. And as the biggest start coming up, again, that verticality is key. Uh, we, oh, actually, good shot from Nako onto Shaiko. Just reverse what Shaiko usually does to others. And I was going to say, it's a good time to start opening up vertically. This site, you need to get a lot of vertical control often 
to stop any of the power positions from being played, or at least the, like, you know, power positions that have vertical above them. And that way you only force them back into two or three different spots where they can defend the side from, which are then easier dealt with if you only have to worry about those. Yes. Still sitting, bomb has been located. keeping everything locked down towards his name on the back end of VIP here. The most important person in this round is seemingly the next they want to try and force out. Jack is getting rid of all the barbed wires, making the sort of area around him tougher to play and tougher to be locked in on as the rest of the vertical gets done. It's tense, giving themselves options, giving themselves wiggle room if things start to fall away from them. Just misses then finds. Efac, I thought that was really the biggest missed opportunity. Nako gets solid off. There's the swing onto Free Day. And the Jackal's able to get it locked down pretty easy. Isn't a flawless response. But it's as close as you can get. And brilliant bounce back. Good bounce back indeed. Seeing that vertical work out there that we talked about before. It stopped that rotation from Likafak from really being useful. Almost missed, as you mentioned. But still able to find that kill when it mattered most. And then 3-2. Suddenly that looks a lot more friendly being 3-1 down and looking at the potential 5-1 being in your uh, your face. Now you need to continue. See if you can make this a 3-3. Get that even half in. Really make it hurt where BS have been shining the most. Which is on that defense side. Three to two. They might find themselves driving towards an even half here. And I mean, it said it feels like this is the most BDS have sort of been pressed and stressed so far. It's always that translation of when you come to a map that you know your opponents play a lot, that you know you can get all this access towards it. What we might actually see is when BDS gets the attack, they very much learn how Ents plays. It feels like Ents have done their homework. Which is, is a statement you'd like to say about a lot of teams and a lot of maps and a lot of rounds. But it's not always the case. I, mean, I would say a lot of the teams do their homework. It just doesn't pan out the way they thought it would as soon as they meet the team, right? Like, you're obviously watching their, their scenario, their scrim, uh, not the scrim, sorry, the officials. And it's like, hey, this is how it can counter. And it just doesn't work because it feels like a quick play is coming up at me. I mean, there they are, breaking and busting their way in right underneath. They're looking towards the reinforced wall, and they're looking to see if they can find a first engagement. Catch the camera out, but nobody's been caught. There it is. Shaiko, the first victim. Azox looks for the second and gets doubled down onto Yuz. It's about to be swung from the back end, and Evac does at least stop the entrance, Ash. But two players taken out with just a blink of an eye. I said early on, one of the problems Ents was suffering was the late executes left them no problems to shuffle and rotate. Here, they have pretty much the entirety of the round, and Epac has all of that time as well to suffer. There's one. His second for the round, but he's got to try and get an ace clutch as he's called again on the E1Ds. Jax just has to sort of wiggle that kit closer towards the site where is it? Oh, above. Epac's hunting underneath with Rykos having the pings on the players. He's having to watch absolutely everything. They can very easily get this kit secured. Pings are coming through. There's at least another body. And okay, you start to sit up and take notice, but then you get sat back down. And well, I think it's time we maybe have a little bit of a call in with one of our desk. Hello, Emmy, Fluke, hi. Um, hi, Hop as well. One thing that I want to say, obviously, as we turn into the half, it's a free free split. Now, I'm looking at the operators that are banned and I'm seeing a Grim ban and a Ying ban. And BDS, they've used in half of their rounds, they haven't played a Breacher so far on attack. They use a lot of Grim, they use a lot of Dokubi, they use a lot of, um, I've forgotten the name, Ying as well. Ying, Dokubi, uh, Grim. Two of them are banned, so are they gonna have to have to play a little bit more Orthodox? That's the big question that I'm wondering on their attacks because these bans significantly nerfed them from last time they played Cafe. Thank you very much, Fresh. And Bob yes, he's bringing the insight right now is maybe it's not just homework done on how they hold, but also what they can removed from the pushes app. Yeah, the thing is though, right? Like we've seen it happen before where we see certain operators banned for specific people. Now, I don't think that's the case here. It's mostly for the execute. But they just swap over to like plan B. 
which is then unknown territory. And it just works out wonders for BDS as well. So, I mean, we'll get to see in the next couple of rounds whether or not it's going to be, uh, you know, exactly as they hoped it would on ends, you know, finding out these bands. Or if this is going to be a plan B BDS that might be as strong as the other lineup that they were bringing before. So it's the big question I'm having right now. A BDS. They're going to see if they can try and match some of the pace. This game's been taken out of their hands a little. It's rare to see so many of their players hit negative. In fact, the entire roster came into this play day all with positive KDs, which this deep into the season, this much performance behind them. There's more than any other stat. The take towards the top. RN's going to be able to keep themselves a little bit out of arm's reach. The scans instantly that verticality coming through. Or at least an attempt to challenge. Nothing really hurting them as of yet, and a pretty effective roam clear to come through. I think everybody currently from ends have fallen back after the first minute has fallen. And BDS now quickly checking out with drones, just making 100% sure there's no one left around. Setting up their flanks as well. I think Leak Effect really helps, of course, with the Inox. Can just see if any feet have been uh, around just in the last couple of seconds, minute. The quicker you are on the side, the more information you're going to get from that. As Nitro Cells are being tossed up, it's a bit of a help for the vertical play that users otherwise would have to do with the Kaber. This point, I talk about how much you sort of got your pace set and the options you're opening up, but. Getting the roots through on the vertical, but without the catch on a single player, you're still looking at all the smoke canisters. And he's obviously going to build himself an arsenal in his back pocket. A lot of impacts and, well, even a, a cap can trap. If you're feeling real spicy. But it's actually Jax who gets the first bit of spice. Solotel taken off. They're sort of trying to lead into this vertical. Get themselves a early open striker now, trying to push into what seems to be VIP gets swung, is going to call that out, but there's a player right behind the long bar as well. And look at that, another one looking right through the vertical out here. So Shaco's quite literally stuck between three players here. He needs the rest of his team to help if he wants to make any moves happen. This three days, just trying to lean in and get the kit tucked behind. He doesn't get himself ready for Rykos. Floating in the middle underneath the vertical and he still gets a second onto EFAC. Shaiko's gonna have to slip his way past. What's the cover with Rykos on three? Almost four. Shaiko, 10 seconds, still having to clear out VIP on his own. He gets the kit, but he can't get any further. And keep it cool in Freezer. Again, it's just this BDS there walking right into the trap, right? Like. They had the verticality, but it wasn't actively being watched. And you lose three people to a single player. The first kill, by the way, standing in between two smokes right underneath verticality. That should have been known. That should have been seen. That should have been picked up. And then that same player can continue to go on and find two more kills, basically crippling you for the rest of the round. And that is not what we used to be seeing from BDS. That's a bit wobbly out there. I mean, at this point as well, just him being able to be in a position you fully understand and expect what BDS was doing there, which was to force them out to shepherd them off. But as he said, being able to survive in that place, it, it takes a lot of bravery, but it should be swept up so quickly. It should be forced away. So easily, even Bride was surprised Five to find an to engagement go. on that swing around the corner. And, you know, you you, you can say a lot about how that's an expectation game, how it's bitten them and how it's presented into the lead here. But at the same sort of moment of it, BDS need to be snappier. They need to be more turned on and clued on to what's going on. That is the thing, right? That's why you open up vertically. So you can, you can stop them from being in these positions. I said it before a couple rounds ago, that side is so vulnerable vertically as it only leaves one or two, maybe three positions if you're lucky, left to actually play. But if you're not watching the verticality and they get a smell of that on the defense, 
you can bet that they're gonna be playing in the middle of the site because no one will expect them being there as soon as you enter. And it's not like you have time with 20 seconds left to, you know, take your time droning out the site, see if there's anybody in those kind of positions. Nako. Uh, slightly less dangerous position here, but they seem well aware. They sort of pop the bullets over. He really wants to swing that window, you can tell, but he's really holding himself back. Three day is more than expecting. Not just the jump out, but just an engagement to come from that corner. As the flashes hit the player, he's hoping to make him panic, but Nico is held steady and firm for as long as he's going. He's playing off the audio of that Banshee to go for the swing and the pre-fire, and still nothing. Three day. Very careful for this jump out. It's going to happen either way. The injury is there, but the kill is on the side of BDS. And users will go on to confirm that kill, bring it back to a three on three, but a minute 20 left and you're disadvantaged. You're going to get a target out at least from Deimos and Likafaka opens up for the skeleton to keep it slightly too late. Rykos, he's on the roam and the spin round and oh, he misses out the engagement. The soft plays against him, but it does get traded. So at least that's something they can work with. It should have been clean as the blinds come across the top. They do not have the kit that is cold. Far away where Free Day was felled. Jack's getting users. Shake's going to drop as well. Hence, two rounds difference now. Is this going to be the loss that BDS will have to take? Is definitely starting to get way closer for comfort. The tactical timeout's even out now. And ends the team that, again, not the warmest of welcomes in the league. Stepping up big time now. Is leading what could be one of the favorite teams for this year. It's always where you least expect it. And the team who up to this sort of point, you know, it struggled to pull themselves late on. Okay, what as weird as it is to say BDS have to work with here at this moment in time is that Ents have gone to OT twice, winning one and losing one against Wild, against Fnatic. Truly, even getting to this point, BDS being tested the most by Ents, I think is probably the biggest surprise to BDS. Be right. I don't think they would have expected this game to go the current way that it does. Especially if you were looking at the standings, just those three points out of two games. I'm not saying it's any underestimation because I don't believe BDS underestimates any of their opponents. Like they've been very thorough on their preparations. But sometimes things just don't click, they don't connect. And the opponent plays into that perfectly. And I think we're into one of those games here today where Ants just is able to get the better of BDS, that they found some of the weaknesses, they're exploiting them, and BDS unable to formulate a response. Look at like look at the quick rounds that we've seen as well when Ants were attacking. BDS unable to find a, a, an adequate response in time. Of course they could fight back, of course they make it close. It isn't enough. At this point, and what did they talk about in their time? Uh, you can sort of get the estimations of BDS though, and they gotta try and get their heads screwed on. They gotta try and get a bit of a better hold of these loose rotations, these drones, as I said. Although it was a trade out that happened underneath the site, it really could have and should have been answers as a clean take. So here, getting a handle on these loose players, loose bits of attention. In fact, the preparations of the Claymores this time round. The roll of the line on the back end given to someone else. Brida instead playing that Habana back on. Ash has come out. Jax is under a lot of pressure. Efax the first to suffer from it though. Rykos actually gets a bit on the back. Device ready. In a very good game so far. Rykos 11 kills. 
Arn is still running strong. Openings are being made into Piano, however, so BDS is trying to take that top floor under control. The mirror windows are a problem, though. How are you going to be dealing with those? Of course, uh, in the normally you could use an explosive like Ash, but not really on the board right now, not chosen. So, gonna have to use some Xcaros instead as Azox. Holding a passive angle, leak effect going down first. And Azox instantly deciding that he might have an opportunity to go for a bit of a move as the Xcaros kind of relocate him. Yeah, I mean, he did not have a choice at that point. As soon as the wall there fell, he couldn't play that kind of cut position he was in. They know they have that opening and body. Although he uses his knocking on the door, from Snow, he doesn't have the kit. He can't impact and act on the back of it. They pinch out the player behind the mirror window. Golotov also suddenly gets Skies as well. So the balance has flipped in towards BDS's favor. They have the vertical control in about 40 seconds to try and make some use of it. Like a spawning one, but misses the opportunity to find a kill. It's a double take, and he doesn't get either. No team kill. Team kill, though, as well to come through. So at least he has that trade to go for him. But Azek still has the opportunity to retake the top four if he really wants to. Rykos finds still top of the plant, goes down. They're going for the stick. Users has to watch the Attack vertical. Bride gets it cemented. The fight's about to come to his left, but they're going to go a bit split. One on Lumber gets the first. A two versus one. Bride. Holding on to keep them off map point, but he can't. Two stories of destruction. And the lead story right now is Ed on map point, about to hand BDS their first loss. What a story that would be. I mean, we've seen it, I mean, in some of like the content that was shot with the players where they could choose their dream team. A lot of them actually went for the coach of Ends. Uh, I'm not quite sure the pronunciation. Akdar, I think it is, or something like that. But everybody basically pointed out that he is so good at counter strating and just preparing everything and just being there for his team. And we might just be seeing that into full effect right now as everybody on end is firing. And we're able to shut down, most importantly, the round right after the tactical timeout from BDS. And now they are on that point. They have three opportunities to lock this off. And, you know, often people would expect this to be a quick game. Probably the scores reversed, however, where BDS would be on that point right now, about to lock this off in a 7 3. I mean, if you just. A little bit lost for words, I think, it is the fair atmosphere right now. You're seeing what has been a brilliant performance for men. There's no two ways about this. BDS have been outplayed so far to this point in this game. It's not over yet. It's only three rounds. They can try and find a rotation here. It would not be the first time. They've had to pull these sort of games back from the death knell, but... And this game has been brilliant. You try to piece together where things can be changed, what can be shaken out of Ence's gameplay, and they're just so reactive, so responsive towards what each other's doing. Three Day wants to try and just strong arm their way in towards Fake. Oh! Almost a huge C4, still tons of damage onto Three Day and uses, though. It's definitely going to be handicapping them slightly for the remainder of that round, but it looks like they might be going quick into a wedding, trying to take bake, uh, cupcake bell, uh, bar right there, Emmy. I mean, that's it. Five players with the first fall. There goes user Sky somehow gets out of the Capital Bolts, wants to step back in, but he's just watching towards the Monty. Solotov gets caught out on the back end as well. Might get picked up. Shaiko, it was from the top window, and that's from the ground floor. Shaiko's watching everybody fall around him. Skies has retaken Cupcake. As Solotov gets back up. The gate is reactivated. Everything is reset. It's back to square one for BDS, but they've only got two and a half players left to do it with. And they've lost the Monty, the crux, the start, the tip of the push. Nico sits really desperate for an adventure. He's about to find Capital gets cut. There's two, there's end! A flawless end to an absolutely outstanding map from Ents. 
know how we said, Emmy, at the start of the game, not every game is about winning. Some are just to make it painful for their opponents and see if you can take points home. I think this is both. They are definitely dealt some pain towards BDS. Three points home as well. What an incredible result coming out from ENDS. I mean, just unbelievable, really. When you sort of look at the weight of it and you see how the teams get themselves set up for this engagement, you would never have predicted this result. And I feel like some of the people who might have put some channel points on ENDS are going to be sitting pretty happy after today. But talking of happy, I'm curious to see if they're happy on the desk. Ends have taken down BDS, and whilst it's April Fools, we are sure not joking about that one. It's a day where a titan seemed to fall, all the flawless streaks get broken, and Ends they pick up three points against BDS. I, I just don't have words for it. It's such like the the points are super important for them if they want to try to compete for the major, and they're grabbing points against one of the teams that nobody expects them to grab points against. Yeah. I mean, I said before the game, I'm expecting a se solid seven-one for BDS. What do we get? Honestly. A complete domination by Ants. They played really, really good, both on the strategic level, but also the individual level, they really stepped up. They've literally just like taken the script. No, doesn't matter. It was Ants' story today, and I think, you know, that's that's the thing for them is I asked them to keep it simple, right? And that's all they did. Yep. They didn't overcomplicate any steps. They just went through their process and then they allowed themselves to build themselves into the game. It did look a little bit dodgy at what, one three down? But yep. then they pulled off two great rounds back on their attacks um, and and really went from there. It was, you know, they're the first team to even take more than one round off BDS's defense. Yeah. How did they do it? Simple stuff, played with each other, played aggression. It honestly looked like Ents had had a big reset in the game from last week that they went with Fnatic and went all the way to overtime and honestly overcomplicated the hell out of that game to now. Excellent improvement. You know, Sometimes I hate working with you because you pick exact words I'm about to I hate working with you too, Fabio. Yeah, but that's because I'm an annoying person, not because I'm bad at my job. True. Well, you're not bad at your job either. Thank you. You're great. I love you. Thank you. However, what we saw from Ants here was that they actually looked like a team for the first time yeah. since I think they joined EUL. And I'm super happy for them that they did that. Because up until today, I've actually been kind of praising them and saying, like, I know they have it in them. I know that I believe in them. And today they really showed it. And it, 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 it's, you say it's simple, yeah. It's simple in combination with the teamwork that they look, because they look like a group. One thing that I really liked from them as we get onto the highlights of them on their defense, which is, I think, one thing that no team has done yet in terms of a game plan against BDS, test their executes. Ents were not trying to fight BDS. They were not trying to find picks. They were allowing BDS enough map control and then aggressing when BDS wanted to execute. If you look where the round ends, it wasn't in the early game or even the mid round for Ents or BDS. It wasn't determined then. It was always in these executes late onto site, which is one thing that I guess I'd been saying for teams when, you know, BDS, can you, what's their execute like? We've not seen anybody kind of approach that way. Yeah. Ents finally did. So strategically, I think they made a great decision there as well. And it makes sense on that map as well. Sorry, Anne, I'm interrupting you because I have so much points here. <laughs> the map suits that playstyle so well because like, executing against five is almost impossible. It is almost impossible, but it also shows that we've seen something like some really good growth on the side of Ents because I remember that very first game they played in Europe League against Secret, and you two said after that Ents were nowhere playing near what they usually do. They yep. were playing like themselves. They were a very scared team. They were playing really anxious, and here we saw them trying to retake that top four control, having those individual players pop off, and that is something I am really happy to see from Ents as well. They dare to play against BDS. They don't get scared against such a big team. Their confidence really was shining through today. Look at the entry deals that they had. Like, they took, I think they had one entry that throughout the entire game or something like that. And it shows that they have the confidence. Again, I, I just keep hammering on the same stuff because that's what they were doing. They were playing the basics really good together and they were looking like a group. And we haven't seen it. Individual no. performance on top of that. And that's the thing, on the balance of things, before this game, literally everybody, even Ents fans probably would have been like, yeah, we're going to lose to BDS. Everybody does. And I think that performance kind of proves that there is substance in that team. Yeah. If you look at the very, very last round of the Fnatic game last week, Ents couldn't open a hatch with Maverick, right? <laughs> They've gone from that, that extreme to then absolutely slapping around BDS on a BDS map that they're great on as well. And it's like that, that improvement within, what, six days? Yeah. Honestly, for me, is like night and day.
And also on the least favorable side, I guess, on Cafe on the attack, mm. that final round, the rush execute from the snow door, that's something I really like to see as well, adding some spice to the gameplay. So one of the very important aspects of Rainbow Six Siege is changing your tempo throughout your games. It's something you constantly yeah. have to think of, because what happens is if you play slow the entire time and you always execute with 20, 25 seconds left, how unpredictable are you? Not at all, right? Because you always know what the other team is going to do. You're going to execute 25 seconds. So one time you execute 25 seconds, one time you rush, one time, one minute 30, you make an extremely aggressive execute from nowhere. You change up your game plan and, and seem to actually have that down today, which speaks of their confidence. Now, with our two flawless teams being beaten today, that shakes up everything in the context of our group. BDS, of course, still at the very top, but look how much ends have climbed with these three points. They now find themselves in towards that top six spot. That could put them to playoffs in their very first year in Europe League. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the expectations for ends, I don't think from anybody, were too high before the start of the league. They've got themselves into that super spot. They will be breathing down, you know, the necks of Into the Breach. Fnatic, who didn't play today, you know, even G2 and Secret are within sight, within one win from uh, Ents at this point. It also puts a hell of a lot of pressure on Virtus Pro particularly and Wolves who play next. And then at the top of the leaderboard, you know, everyone was expecting BDS to run away with the, the league. They showed that they're capable of doing that, but it also proves that they're human as well. Maybe it was a bit of underestimating of the enemy because maybe you didn't expect the most out of them because Ents had looked quite poor. But honestly, how amazing is it that our league is so close that anybody can beat anybody. When is the last time we had Europe do that? I don't remember it. Because we always had our clear favorites. Sure, BDS were still a clear favorite here, but they actually got kind of handled today very well by Ants. They yeah. really they, used, they took control. They decided the game is our game and we're just going to approach it the way we want to. BDS got BDS, as we can <laughs> yeah. say, maybe. Um, but one player that really took big, big part of that was Rikos, for sure. Yeah, I mentioned Skies before the game and how everybody have been scouting him. Rikos is actually another player that everybody has been scouting. I personally had him as a player for G2 in the long-term future if there was to be changes, because we always scout players when you're working in staff. Today, he showed the quality that I have been seeing in him for a long, long, long time. And what better team to do that against than BDS? I mean, putting up the numbers and going 13 to 5 against what most people consider the most frag heavy team in the league, that speaks for itself. It's incredible. And he had a really, really good game. He should be super proud of himself. Well, he had a really good game. We also have him ready for an interview with us because I really want to ask him some questions about how Rikus feels after this game. Good evening. You just took down the number one team in Europe League. How are you feeling? Hello, guys. Good evening. Um, feeling super great. Good effort for the past week uh, from the team to fix our mistakes. And uh, yep, we did it today. Uh, Rikos, so, you know, you talked about fixing those mistakes. Um, what did you... I guess, what did you identify last week when you had that mixed result? Um, and what did you change going into this week? Actually, uh, for this week, we just told ourselves, we talked a lot to each other, and we told ourselves to just um, go again for all the basics, to just delete what we what we had, which uh, there were a lot of mistakes in our game plans. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think basics just won us the game today. So going up against BDS, obviously they were unbeaten, right? They hadn't lost a game. Did you guys feel any pressure or was it the fact that you were going up against BDS that just allowed you to just play with freedom? I think the past week uh, we had some pressure in our team uh, when we played and uh, this week coach told us just have fun guys and play your own game and uh, we will smash with them. Sounds very good though, a good game plan. What can we expect from you for the next game? So you've now taken down the number one team. Mm, actually, I think we need to find consistency in what we do to keep uh, good results in every game, so we will see. I think you have a very clear idea of what needs to be done and what you have been doing so far. Is there anything you want to say to the fans as well to close up the interview? Yep, uh, thank you guys for supporting us. I know the past weeks were uh, a bit terrible from, from our side. And uh, in French, uh, merci à tous, tous ceux qui nous supportent. Vraiment, uh, on essaie de travailler du mieux qu'on peut pour uh, rendre les gens uh, fiers. Et merci. Well, thank you so much for your time, Brian, because it was great to speak to you after such a dominant victory. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. 
I think we need some time to uh, to really unwind after what we just saw with ends, of course, taking yeah. down BDS. So we'll be heading to a break. But after that, a very final game of the day, Wild versus Wolves. Sao Paulo, you have waited five long years for Seas to come back to Brazil. Now, the Gimnasio do Ibirapuela is the home to the hammer as we get set to write the next chapter in R6 Esports history. This is the Six Invitational 2024. Vamos para Samba Ruyo!
game of the day is upon us that is wild taking on wolves and if we're talking about these two teams neither of them of course want to win or lose this one sorry because they're both somewhat at the lower part of this group stage as it currently stands they all want to take as many points away from this as possible but when we're talking about wolves i want to know what the general sentiment is about this team right now because the first few times we were quite hard on them. I'm quite worried about Wolves. I think that they look very uncoordinated and very, very heavily reliant on individual performance, especially from Deadshot and from Mowgli. They need an entire team to step up on the individual basis. But first of all, I need to see them starting to play the basics and start playing the team game that they are known to have done before. And that team game is what I want to see from them as well. But I want to see them find their identity. I think they're in a real crisis at the minute. Yeah. That Mowgli is an exceptionally aggressive player. Deadshot is also trying to be an exceptionally aggressive player. And the other three, Bibu, P4, and Shinka, are, are incredibly passive by nature. And what that creates is this fragmented kind of idea when they're attacking or defending, it leaves them with quite big holes because two people are being aggressive and three people are being passive. Now for their opponents, we've seen Wild have a pretty a struggling start to the stage. However, last week we saw them get a pretty decent start against Secret, but they weren't able to close it out. What's happening? Yeah, so they're, they're struggling. You know, there's no way about it. No way to talk about it apart from they are bottom of the league and are struggling. And I've got a quick stat that I want to give to you actually, Fabian, which is Wild are only trading out 4% of their death. That means one in every wow. 20 deaths is getting a refrag. That is a statistic that you want to be improving. Play together, play closer, and then you might be able to keep that man advantage and keep going with it. For, for that stat, I have another fun one, but I'm going to mention something else first. When I work with G2, our goal for practice and bootcamp for trade kills was at 20% to 25, which means we're looking at, well, five times as high trade percentage as what they're getting. That's very low. Another fun stat is that Tab looks like a great player right now. He's having high EPS, but most of those kills actually comes in, well, not most of them, but a big chunk comes in one versus X's, which of they have lost every single one except for one. He would just be a plus one in plus minus if it wasn't for exit kills. So the entire team needs to really, really step up individually, team play, and just everything. There's nothing that they cannot get better at right now. We're looking at a lot of number of move improvement from all of these players in these two rosters. The map that is selected for our best of one is Clubhouse. A pretty default map. Would that suit this best of one well then? I think in a way it kind of, it, it, it speaks to where both teams are at, right? I think we're looking for Wolves to have improvement in team play and going at the same time, same pace, same aggression. And for Wild, I think it's good to try and just get back to basics on yep. the Clubhouse map. I think it's a map that both of them would have wanted to go to because it's where they can get, I think, the easiest Im improvements in performance, even if they don't win the game. This is a scary map for Wolves because they've had very, very, very clear-cut rushes on this map that we've seen a ton of from them before. If they haven't changed up this map and Wild are getting back on track with their basics, I see Wild being able to clinch this one out just because of the map and the side start for defense for Wild, which obviously we all know Wolves have been struggling with their attacks. Now our game is ready, so we should bring our casters in because I don't even need to uh, ask them any questions. We should be able to bring back Hap and Fluke for one more time today. Unfortunately, I don't get to ask them anything. You guys don't get to ask them anything either because you should be able to send us right in to the game. Our final game of the day on Clubhouse with Hap and Fluke. Thank you very much, Anne. And yes, no questions for us <clears throat> because we don't know what we're talking about. Depends on what we're talking about, you know, if, if the questions are about any like difficult topics, yeah. then I might, I might skip out. But Siege... Siege we know a lot Siege about. Siege we can definitely talk If there were about. questions about Siege, we could have probably answered them, man. Uh, why don't you believe in us anymore? Why has Fresh, and, why has Fresh and Fabian made you so jaded towards the beauty of the world? You, Actually, you could... Yeah? I was going to say, you spent enough time with them. With who? F Fabian, Fresh and yeah, Fabian? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Fabian, Fresh and Fabian. Sorry. Two Fabians, one Fresh. I mean, three the times three the world fun. championships. He has the ego for it, right? He can I'm, be two if, Fabians. If anybody would be cloned 
I think he would be one of the most terrifying people to clone. He'd take over the world. Of the seed no talent, knows. if there was like a list of people I probably wouldn't risk cloning, he's up there. I think the world could do with two Tims. Yeah, I could see that work. Second Tim. Uh, what would second mean, Tim specialize in? Probably the same things regular Tim <laughs> specializes in. Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, we could have two ands, and then we have one full size and. Yeah, if we stack them on top of one another, yeah, right? We have... Yeah. Yeah. Two Miloshes! That'd be funny. That would be. You could put them in a room together, and you would have like a great podcast about they would whatever. Just talk about anything. Would happen for a million anywhere. hours. Um, yeah. And then <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna be a bit mean. I, I know of our friends and of the talent who's like co-streaming and stuff like that. And I know Parker and uh -huh. Lynx, I believe, are co-streaming. Uh -huh. And I was yeah, gonna, gonna make a joke how we could do that in expense of those. <laughs> That's just me saying <laughs> uh, remove Lynx. No, I'm not that mean. However, I said the volume gets four times as loud if you clone Lynx. Yeah, I mean, two lynxes, I think you would be able to <laughs> find infinite energy via noise. Hey, we're in Wolves versus Wild, and we are on Klubhus. Neither of the runs, I think, of these two teams have gone the way they expected. Both have been, let's be honest, pretty shaken from their first few games. Yeah, um, they definitely haven't been finding the groove that these two teams want to be in. Um, of course, Wolves themselves have definitely managed to find two victories, uh, which, which is at least something. Uh, you know, 8-7 against Virtus Pro and 7-3 against Fnatic, which was the more standout performance. Five seconds but Wild, on the other hand, they have not been able to find anything as of yet. And they, of course, went for like the complete redesign of their roster in the offseason. Uh, get you know, getting getting the full out applications out and complete trials. I mean, it was like X some factor, of the players. Wasn't it? What do you say? Like you, everyone yeah, was sent in. It was indeed, yeah. Get yourself. Oh, solid. Who got to press the button? Oh, Tev. They almost. Sorry to interrupt. They almost had the strike there. They hoped the drone would roll past them. If they had have touched the corner, so they might have been able to. But there's an example of why you don't always roam strip. Because if you're roaming strip and they find you, they have to watch one window to cut off any escape route. Yeah, uh, t it is difficult to leave as soon as you're, you're spotted there, and it's just a suicide position at that point, right? Like, you, you just gotta play until uh, you die, or uh, you manage to kill everybody that was trying to challenge you. That's a great opening for the side of Wolves, a nice and free one, just costed them a single drone, not that they have too many left of those, four of them. As well, still in a bit of a rotating game and trying to find some extra drones that have been placed. It is just nice and steady clearing going on from Wolves, clearing out that top floor first. They do need to hurry, because there's still quite a bit of progress that needs to be made and getting your drone stuck is not helping. At this point, how much time can be sort of stressed and pressed here? By Wild. They've obviously lost Teb, and he's generally been that player popping up in the best possible times for them. The roster itself has had some impactful moments. Kanto, though, a bit quieter before. Could have a big day now as Lolo gets caught out on the rotate. Adam is secured. Now holding on to Blue. Look at the surround of the Wolves players over the back end, over the other hatches. Kanto might try and... Hit oil. He kind of wants one more engagement before he goes, but they're not offering it to him yet. Let's get droned out now, though, and that means the pressure is going to be coming on. You see it both from the wall, from the steps, and from above. A cleanup coming out from Wolves. Quite clinical out there. Just keep him busy long enough. Make sure you cannot actually drop down into oil. And now you have 45 seconds to get an execute on. There's not that much that they have opened up, though. And there is still electrification onto the walls, which will make things even more difficult. As you can see, both stock and moto being locked off. So kitchen is the only real hatch they've been able to open up and some more verticalities coming through, but Nello in a crucial position, but also the last man alive. He now has the hold of the hordes. I mean, brilliant execute here from Wolves. They've really not put a single step wrong. Everything was weighed up, clinical, cool. They were never really stressed. Throughout any of the approach there, sure, Kanto was able to get one sort of sneaky fight back, but look how 
well and cautiously. Wolves dedicated themselves throughout the rest of the round. They never handed over a fight or an instigation without it being one they were fully intent and sort of well versed on. And usually this bottom floor side is one of the most difficult ones to take on the attack. I've already managed to uh, basically clinically pick them apart out there. And then, you know, even though the hatches were still closed, didn't really matter in the end. Good util use, information use, all of that in the end. So Wolves, very clinical first round. Now they just need to keep that up. And again, you know, neither of them had the best of runs. Maybe Wild had a worse run than uh, Wolves so far, as Wolves still find themselves into the top six position currently, which is, of course, all that matters down in the end, because that's the first shots you'll have at making it to the major. I would uh, assume that the organization of Wolves will put a bit of extra pressure down onto the Manchester major. Not because the players are from there, but more so because it's a home country for the organization itself. Wolves. Let's see where they go from the second start. We've seen, to be fair, a lot of today, although there has been surprise results, the games have generally started with a bit of back and forth, and nobody's been entirely clean, and this might be another part of that pack ball. I was signing him earlier as the other name that sort of popped up a lot. As soon as ground would be taken away from Wild, it was usually him or Teb that sort of put a foot down and stopped things getting too far apart. At this point, with Mowgli gone, the lead in, there is still the extension down to the bottom of the garage. It looks open, but they've got the opener inside lounge. The Kanto can kind of hold off and give Teb some support. Extra. Actually, the shadow playing into the game there. That's where the impacts are coming out. You see the shadows, uh, which of course come down. Angle comes through Kanto, but a huge swing gets one, would he get the second as well? That He's getting tagged down bit by dropped. bit, but the injures come through, and suddenly only P4 is left standing. I mean, <laughs> what a round of two fates, what a round of two rounds. This has been entirely different setups, a flawless response from Wild. The perfect, uh, all the compliments I paid Wolves in the opening round where they seem to know everything. Everything was well balanced, cautious. There, Kanto retaking the bottom of Garage with the big open breach and a player on the door itself. What what can you say? This is like the duality <laughs> of this game that we're gonna be seeing. First, a super clinical round from Wolves and now and just the flank from Kanto sows a whole lot of chaos to come through. He's able to win both those fights, but in the meantime, like two other people get uh, killed elsewhere and P4's rotating around. It's a near flawless into a flawless, but both on opposite sides. What did you think about the uh, patch notes that came out today? Uh, totally realistic patch notes. Yeah, yeah the 100% uh, realistic patch notes that was posted by the Rainbow Six account, um, including 1.5 is back. Weird that we're not seeing anyone use it. Um, the Iana pose, I've heard of that one. Yeah, the Iana pose, the original Iana pose, guys. It, it's back, everybody. Um, but no one's... I hope we get to see a Iana MVP. <laughs> um, Ash is four speed and our cameras. If you don't believe me, everybody, if you don't believe me, just go check the Rainbow Six uh, Twitter account. Go check the Esports Twitter account. It's already deployed, right? There's no, there was no down to, downtime needed. It was just an instant flip of the switch. They were ready for it. Enough about that. Let's see who's able to get the lead in kill, because apparently it's one way or the other at this point. Vibu's a bit concerned that they're not quite ready to get this without it being battened across, and it's a little bit of a long rotate out. Can get caught from someone if they're feeling a bit spicy, which is why they had to do the work inside. But I do like that, how it breaks a portion of the hard wall there as well. The opener. Sometimes we see a castle to stop this from uh, the Benetric from being pulled off, but now what we see is an Azami. Uh, keep the barrier. It's going to be also played by the army itself just to give some challenges. In the meantime, the opening is happening on the opposite side. 
on the CCTV area, lots of drones in places, making sure there's no flanks. And Wolves, no exothermics left. There is some Selmas in the pockets of P4, which they could use to open up the Jacuzzi wall, but again, they will be bandit tricking. Packbull is in a position to do so, thanks to those Kiba barriers. I mean, it just gives you so much life, Kiba. It, it's that strange sort of position that they're in where the nerf was great, the change was great, but it's still so impactful. The Kiba barricades, they're in a very, very strong position now and they can at least be taken out from a bit of range before you wouldn't have been able to do anything about those without getting in and hitting them You're using some explosive here this gives you this lead in they've been able to get themselves control there was no real extension over towards the cc side itself with kanto playing under the hatch hoping someone goes on a bit of an adventure into logistics but there's also this to rotate as well and they seemed aware but dead shot caught Pressure from Logi Hatch as well. Kanto's on a sliver of health. He still has two impacts. The Solids that can play a bit later. After damage done, Mowgli's getting the drop down. He's waiting for someone else to hit the hatch. He's got to be aware of the vertical. It's from underneath. There's a down on the player. He's not quite able to secure. And he's caught out as he rotated his way back up. At that point, right, they knew there was only one person left. It was Kanto down below, so you can you can go for it. And whatever is safe, you know that that like logistics area, that is going to be challenged. You don't want to go there. But the rest of the execute could come through. As soon as he gave his position away, they knew it was only one less on side they needed to deal with. We're going to a quick tech break to, uh, to get something fixed. Into a tactical timeout. From Wild. I believe. I think the tech was requested, but maybe they've also requested the tactical right after. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna say it's not that so much is going wrong that that would I would say that this tactical timer is warranted right now. I, it's, it's early. It was setting themselves up for an interesting pace moving forward, but you don't see P4 talking much, so. Yeah, I think yeah, I still assume it's a tech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Uh, like we can cut away from BB. We don't have to see him cleaning his nose. <laughs> Production. Don't be cruel. We gotta look out for our players. If you're a player or if you're on camera and production cuts to you <coughs> blowing your nose, it's cruel. There's a cruel sense of humor. That we can't that in 4K. Silence okay. across the boards right now. We find yeah, us. It's, a, it's the rule. It's still, you know, although there were some moments where they could have done some damage up from underneath, at that point, Wolves had full control of the site. The Solace is only sort of playing time and their own exit frags in that engagement. It's really been all or nothing for both teams so far. You kind of, you know, you, you want this to be a bit closer, but on the other hand, if you win, you want to be winning as convincingly as possible. Like, you know, round one and two that we've had. Round three was a bit closer with a couple of downs, but eventually the kills are come through. Again, it's, it's like it is going to be a back and forth. And, and while they didn't have their best starts, Bulls had a OK start. I think there's some teams that would be uh, willing to trade for those points. Of course, not where they want to be. They, they want to be in the top four guaranteed, right? Like, they've been able to make it to every major NSI for, what was it, like the past two years, something like that? So they want to make sure that they're back into that. And now they're slightly lacking just behind on a couple of points that they will have to uh, make up for in the coming days as they just got themselves knocked down to seven, um, seventh place, just, uh, just outside the playoffs. The crazy thing is, if you look at, you know, there's obviously still a handful of play days. Not everyone plays left, but if you're playing on every single day like Wild R, you have the possibility of 12 extra points after the play day, which yeah. just on the turn of the half. However, the difference, if Wild are to take the full three points from today's showdown, let's say, they find themselves on four points, then it's four, five, six, 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 eight, nine, twelve across the top. Yeah. And that for halfway through, for how dominant BDS were looking and 
you know, we talk about how great Secrets Run was, to how we've said Wild have been suffering, and and Ents were suffering. It's insane that this day has entirely flipped and almost reset the board of a difference of a game and a half between top and bottom. I mean, we said it after played it one or two, right? Like everybody can take it here in EU. It, it, like it's not as clear cut as people might make it out to be. And of course, BDS they were having an incredible game, but even even we've seen today they can bleed, they can lose games, and they did. And beat them. The team that, according to many, was like maybe the eighth or ninth team in the league, based on how they started off their stage and the pre-stage, more importantly. They find themselves in the middle of the fight right now because of that victory. We'll hopefully be back in soon. To see the last, the last game of the night is the is the classic one where we get to have a little bit more tension built. It truly has been a night of surprising results. I, I don't think anyone expected the games to go generically the way they've gone. Whether you expect the winner or not. Everything has been a battle. The way we want it. It's a nice... We one. want these teams to be ready, right? We don't want to just, you know, 7-0-7-0-7-0-7-1-7-1. We want them to go back and forth. We want them to battle for it because that builds good teams. That builds these teams that will be ready for the international stage. If you just win everything, then the loss is going to be coming home, like, even harder, right? So it's like... Sometimes you just gotta lose a game. Part of life. Do your best. I like that motivational poster. It's really? like in in the gym, you know. Oh, I thought I was looking they at one of the like, player games. It's like, where is it? <laughs> no, no, no. I just I just like the idea. So like, you go down here into Arsenal. You assume there's weapons in those cases. You have this cool building. You know, the graffiti, the, the motorcycles, the alcohol, the money. Do your best. Please do your best. Just try your hardest. That's try, all we can ask. It, yeah, it's like... I've the, only just seen his mute's face and all the money. <laughs> Did you see that I'm, one? I'm waiting for it to come back around now. I love the little details. If you look in, one of my favorite things is if you look at the boxes of cereal that it they comes. have. Yeah. Wait. Make sure. Make sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, is the boxes of cereals that they have on labs? Um, one of them is just called brick, and it's just pages of bricks. And I'm like, okay. And I, you know, whatever they what eat. What was that? What's on the labs on there? Uh, on Nighthaven Labs in the kitchen. Huh. Um, maybe this well, is how Cali gets so like tough, you know? Maybe just eats brick. It's just whatever they have in Montreal. <laughs> to what French Canadians eat. Bricks, apparently. All the calendars have circled the same day. April. I'm still waiting to see what happens on that day. I'm sure there's some titanium rollo conspiracy theory about it. About finding all the Easter eggs on all the maps. I think that calendar has been the same since like day one. It's like it's a call. It's a it's call out on some place, isn't it? It's calendar. No, uh, it's April, isn't it? It's circled. I remember some teams used to use yeah, that. It's April thirteenth, I think. That's yeah. Circled. And where it is, some teams will occasionally have that call out as April. I can't remember the teams. I remember talking about it at some point with people. You know how it goes. Teams have weird call outs for places. But because it was so consistent on positions and maps, they could go, oh, this is April. Hope. You have like a call named Pikachu at some point. It just didn't make sense at all. It's just, it's really, <laughs> we need to find a name for this. Apple. Apple. Like, okay, what about this? Pikachu. <laughs> it's like, it didn't make sense at all. It's like, you gotta, you, sometimes you just got to find something that's so memorable, especially if yeah. it's like a highly contested spot. Well, the thing is, we have, we have spots like on this map. For example, we have Adam. Which, if you don't know why it's called Adam, there was a position um, where a player called Adam. Um, it before the rework of the map, when you could sort of tuck in and hide underneath and get more of a surprise strike at the top of that area. 
before it was a stair set that was so easily to sort of go up and down. Kid wasn't droned, came out, won the round in great style. The position is now known as Adam. The map was reworked. That area was entirely changed and it's still Adam. That's yeah. that's like where that call comes from. I know that some people coming over from like things like uh, other titles call it like secret or they'll say things like that, but it's Adam. I try to avoid like player calls a bit too, like especially in rings, because yeah, if the people aren't like watching competitive, it just doesn't make sense to them. Yeah, but also they, you know, competitive is the truest version of Siege. They should, of course. Hey, you, you hearing me? Rainbow Six Reddit. Comp is real Siege. <laughs> <laughs> you should match what we do. We'll hopefully be back in the game spot. soon. Yeah, there is a striker spot. We'll hopefully be back in the game soon. Obviously, just getting the rehost done, getting everything sorted, fixing whatever the issue was if you have missed the first three rounds so far wolves have won two of them on their attack here the first very convincing able to take out pretty much everyone that was roaming and then just deadly massacre their way towards the site was the basement the second cc hold that was a massive round from kante ricchetti pushed his way into the bottom of the garage and a flawless win from the side of wolves uh from the side of wild and then we go over to gym bedroom where wolves pretty much the flawless i think it was about a four versus one by the end of it or a three versus one so it's been a bit back and forth I'm trying to find out what it says between the brackets on the poster afterwards i mean how good are your eyes not oh, good i'm sure Fine. you can find a screenshot of it not wearing my glasses right now life's tough the players are laughing they're smiling loves anime Look at all that. I can not I can only name a couple of those. Actually, I, th I think it's Shinka or is it P4? One of them has the, like... The um, names on the bottom. No, the posters from the um, uh, events they've been through on the back. So like Berlin. Oh, well, we've uh, seen P4 and that is from One Piece. And I don't think we've had an event in the One Piece universe yet. I don't know, I no, no, no. I don't know. I don't know which one it was, but well, it's like it's some, one of them had like all the posters in the background. Let's be chinkered in. See the one. We are back <laughs> in. Thank you for bearing with us. As I said, the rounds have been taken full strength. Haven't really had a tooth and nail fight yet. I feel like this might be potential start on that i'm wondering if they're going to be as deep with the roam it was a solace that was punished almost instantly in the pocket to tap caught out on the side of strip Bomb said it's a very batters. risky position to rotate and it's Five sort of one that you can only really make work once yes you could take out all the drones and stop all the approach here but without that soft being in that position if you are in strip you're literally cut off by a single window Whereas if you want to roam, you traditionally go above because it gives you rotation options. You have the hatch and you can try and play your way down. Across, obviously, construction and, or across um, bedroom and gym area. But you just get yourself a little more wiggle room to not die. It is still difficult, right? Because if the team is quick enough, they can also really quickly shut down top floor approaches or roams rather because especially like top floor uh, top down approaches is so prevalent on this map uh, when you're attacking the basement and as they're checking it right now again like top floor is clear first floor is being cleared out as we speak as well there's no roamers out here so it's more going to be a five on five five compared to the first round which we've had but the beat is going to start opening up tons of verticality out here in the kitchen as well that shot just seeing a lot of work happen as well with the short uh, shotgun and that's just all preparative work, right? It's just to stop that rotation from the defenders, just to make them feel a little bit less safe. A good impact coming through there. There's four taken out. Yeah, that's Next four. By two. That's two, Six. but yeah, at that point, you've got to pull it back and you still have to play against the impact. Deadshot, he's finally in a position to open that up here and try and stop anyone going for another impact. They're not going to do it, but they've already wasted a decent bit of utility because well with all what's left you're looking at the limitation on towards the hatches itself it's been popped on two with the thatcher on the board there's gonna be no real problems getting your way in towards moto if that is the next point of call but Reloading. apart Cover from me. that you're pretty much out of pockets now i believe there was a serial laser gate onto the kitchen hatch as well just to keep that in mind 
Actually, might not be. Oh, they saw like a, a nice look. Oh, yeah, no, there is. It's just been wasted already. But that's something to keep in mind as well, because that in like 25 seconds from now will reactivate as again another piece of utility we'll have to throw through if you want to make the swing or drop stick. And while they're pulling a really big turtle strat right now, they're just trying to waste as much time as possible, use as much utility as possible just to keep wolves at bay. And as the bees come through, that's a little bit of information, but is it enough to really work on? Trying to force the players to get themselves out of a bit of position. As I said, the pockets were utilized to get Moto Hatch open, but you're looking at Church Wolf fully locked and electrocuted, so they just got to drop and send it. B for sent. Lolo gets caught. Deadshot gets Teb as well. Bibu's sitting in the middle of sight. They're looking up towards the hatch wild, but too little, too late to post plant. Two flawlesses. Throughout this game, this one is Wolves to take. And again, like a completely different approach, what we see from Wild. They were all turtling down into the site because they lost the roam game so quickly in the last time they were here. But it didn't really matter. And now we're getting the tactical timeout from Wild. So we've just had the tech timeout. That's when they cannot speak. Just to try and get the issue resolved. Now, tactically, they need to have a conversation because that was not how they wanted this to happen. I mean, at this point, it's still a very weirdly paced game. And I know, obviously, we're looking at a bit of a round difference now. You've got three to one. You've got themselves building a very good half, but it's still, I'm not going to say impossible to peg down where things are going right and where things are going wrong because the pace is all over the place. There's great moments entirely then counteracted 20 seconds later by something unrelated. Suddenly looking up, looking down, looking up and Bibu's gone from blue hatch to in the middle of the site of around the sort of second and third box. This kill, yeah, great, he was blinded. But Bibu getting to where he is with a player on A-Case and one on Dirt, and them having no idea, you sort of wonder. I like how Bibu had bees on the persons on AK, swaps over to the person in Dirt, and is like, the last one is inside a, like, um, in, in church, and he just runs towards church. Whilst he's still getting accurate pings out on the player on A-Case. <laughs> A little bit of a distraction to the rest of the team. Still falls around now. Back into CCTV cache. Now, we often talk about basics, especially on this map. And at some point, this site pops up. And I'm like, everybody knows how to attack CC. This is the, the bare basics of Siege. It went wrong last time we were here, though, for the side of Wolves. It did. And so a flank coming in from Kanto, so that, that's something they need to be aware of. Oh, I think this was the, the thing I sort of mentioned about the hold, was that usually when you sort of get this set up, you'll classically see all of Garage locked, and they kept one half open. Had Kanto just playing aggressive down on the sort of stage area, it was the side of stock, just swung his way in, hit the breach that they'd pre-opened, and I mean, here, it's something a little bit more formula, a little bit more formulaic. Nello's got himself the extension. Kanto's playing his connection inside the construction, so he will keep that territory in their control if Nello needs to and likely will try and escape at some point. Oh! An ADS at the wrong timing there, but still managing to find a kill into Lolo that could have almost been used for a while. As he came back up, that's the opening for Wolves, and that's something they're desperately looking for. Nello on the opposite side, he has a great opportunity to go for a flank at some point, especially if they come up the main stairs. And if they don't, he can still drop the gym hatch, but as the phones start ringing, they should be aware of his position. Kanto coming in to support as well. That's two players towards the bedroom area, whereas the rest of the Wolves actually putting pressure down onto the garage. From this point on, Wolves for that early pick against Lolo. Stay early, a minute 30, but compared to how some of these rounds have cooked, at least the last time they were here, can they try and now force Teb position off secured. this Darafka's position? Reload. Support structure from underneath, you assume, is going to pay a little bit more attention towards it. They do have the player down on the bottom area, but otherwise they haven't really been able to take a huge amount else. CC wall itself, still solid. The bottom of the breach is open. Deadshot does open up Kanto from the bottom of red, just holding onto that Adam swing. There's some pressure coming from underneath oh, the oh, Deadshot. Oh, oh. Shoots back, ball dead. 
Now is the drop and the flash just tempt us. Stop Shinka, stops a flawless, but at this point, self-blinded and self-sending himself all the way to the top, the ponytail. Grabbed by and given the game away in P4, swing in the last corner, pre fires the angle of the player, but Nello, he's got to hold on against an onslaught here. Caught one, catches, no! Mowgli gets it and falls distance ever deeper. Again, another very solid round coming in from Wolves there. The roam clear coming through and, and the verticality as well. The second kill on that was a bit more, well, not lucky, but like you, sh you should have probably not gotten away with that one because they were trying to open up vertically to try and challenge him. And he just leans right back in, takes a shot, that's a kill. And on they go towards the side of that point. So well done by Wolves. Spending their lead quite steadily. And of course, you know, they are considered one of the top teams in Europe. They have always been at these major and international events. They're kind of expected to be like in a top six position, at least to make it to playoffs. It's some of the best we've seen Wolves generally playing here. Obviously, they had a very good game against Fnatic on Consulate. EDS, they were dispatched by. ITB was probably the biggest stress of the team. You've seen players that aren't always the pop off for the team. I mean, Deadshot, you have to give all, a lot of credit for. They, having Wolves be as sort of in contention for the fights and the points as they have been. Wild since the rehost. Two rounds, two kills. Not great. There's a lot of improvement to be made. <laughs> I know. <laughs> How, right? It's like, what are they doing wrong? Because if you look at them, they just get caught up and they try and make rotations happen. And I mean, one of those two kills was Nello with a hip fire through the wall, finding a headshot somehow. Mowgli goes down, it's a huge one, the fire burst though, as they push into sight. I mean, what's this? A bit of a smash and grab here, Mowgli. He's taking a bit of a slow and it's left. P4 alone with 5 HP in the dream of holding on. The pressure's coming around him. There's the break, P4. He's got a second engagement and he wins it. Lolo turns his back to the wounded player, buys Wolves more time, but B4's tapping his watch, screaming for some support. Fibu's there to deliver it from the side of Dirt. The big duel is now taking place over the back end of Blue and Oil. Shinker and Mowgli trying to find a way. The slip into the side itself, the bees get them a second of support. With everything locked, it's a bit awkward now for Kanto. Playing the long roll, the route that he's got to run his way in. Caught by the bees, Nello gets the break on their own. Goyos, they're slowed by their own approach, Kanto. A huge take, but a post plant. Now with things being locked, if Wild can get a foot in, Wolves can't really stop the reproach. Dancing left and right, holding either side of the top of blue. He knows he's got to trust that they can get the watch under this one and two, Shinka! Buries them from the back of Adam Nello Court. I mean, I was confused about the pace before, but wolves are howling. That was such a risky play, Emmy. They open up the door, the Goyo pops, P4 runs in, gets the entry kill, runs in deep out of the fire. He's, he's on like no more than 5 HP, as you mentioned. But what I like most is that he didn't instantly go for the plant. He was giving his team time to actually get towards the site. And because none of the hatches have been opened up, there was no real ways back in towards that site itself. And, you know, playing it carefully, finding yourself in a spot where you could actually catch off that rotation as they did come down the main stairs. That was, that was a huge play coming out as well. Again, all of that with four to five HP and eventually getting that plan down. Even when I thought, okay, it's safe to go for the plan now, they were still waiting for the rest of the team to be in a great position, an even better position to support a potential post plan. They didn't rush it whatsoever. Another tech, another pause, another problem, but I mean, it almost balances out how quick Wolves have been to take these rounds. And Wild are just missing. At the minute, both sort of in the shots and in the server itself, it's unfortunately missing some of those like huge surprise moments we used to get from this roster, these players. 
they've been unable to find a structure that can hold on to a map that is dominantly Wolves' at this moment in time. Here it was. They went for the drop on blue. In through the fire. With Capkins as well. It's great they didn't use a Gon 6, but actually the S charge. I think that destroyed the Capkins. Because otherwise that would have just fallen apart right there. Like there's two Capkins. There's a Goyo and a door. And a, and a person watching it. Like you couldn't have protected that more than you did. Now, I'm part of a siege um eul based fantasy that is run by jesse j chick uh-huh there's five of us in it me jesse ace fresh and tom j sherlock are you winning okay but no jesse's winning so i think it's rigged okay. but that's a different story um what i will say is uh tim has dead shot in his team uh -huh. and he's literally just written what i think is a poem that I want to read. Dead shots, headshots galore. <laughs> Racking the point. Is that the title? Dead shot, headshots galore. I mean, it's it's not a long it's it's not a long poem. Or is it the start of the poem? It's like, the he's, start he's just that he's writing it as we go. He's workshopping it. Moral of the story: He's very happy with how things are going in this game. And to be fair, I think Dead shot as a player. <sighs> When he joined the roster, there was a lot of questions because we'd seen the Wolves roster grow for such a long time. And let's be honest, he didn't quite have the impact we expected because the French region of Siege, very deep, very talented, some of the best players in the world. And, you know, you had at the time about two or three tier two French rosters. And you were like, oh, you know, who are they going to pull a player from? Are they going to do it from here? Yada, yada. And Deadshot came in a little bit off, you know, generally Attack people's radars, the location of a bomb. wasn't massive when he sort of insertion. got into the game as a, as a gunner, but has really Five grown over the past about insertion. six months. Yep. I mean, at that point, the rumors were like, either he goes to BDS or he goes to Wolves, right? Like both teams apparently were, <clears throat> what are rumors? Um, trying to get him to sign a contract with them. But then he received like a lot of heat early on as he wasn't instantly up into the level that he is right now. But exactly. as you mentioned, he, he grew a lot. And, you know, playing games like this, that always helps out. Uh, the argument for why it was the right choice to pick him up. Exactly. And, and mainly because he was stepping into the role that was Rises, where it was very much a, a lead vocal role. It was a lot of the strats playing and, and they pick up Deadshot. He's just gunning Mowgli. Sprays through, oh. executes Kanto more than Finds ready himself. no cover there no support for kanto i mean he's, you know he's trying to make something happen i'm not sure if that shot spotted him and mowgli dust decided to throw in the impact tools that shot was kind of baiting you know it's like oh i've shown myself now you're hyper focused on this door impact comes in instant swing for mowgli um something like that probably what happened and the entry kills now there for the side of wolves and they're on the fence um you know what they're also the basement so it's going to be even harder now for the side of Wild to clear this, especially considering you've lost Jackal. So it's supposed to be the one that helps you clear that roam. You've lost a person due to a roam. That is definitely, you know, going to be like, oh, we need to make sure that we're extra careful on our drones now, make sure there's no one left up. As they start opening up vertically, start opening up these hatches, doing preparative work to aim for an execute in, well, let's say 40 seconds from now. I mean, ready for the anticipation here, but you have to realize, regardless of how this round goes, the fact that the deficit is so big, if Wild lose their Attack opening the attack, the and they know they'll have to cycle back to this site, they know they'll have to cycle back to probably every site. It kind of gives me the hope Wolves might actually pick into a stage site, just to see what it's like. Temp does find dead shot though. Great return to come through. 45 seconds left on the clock now, getting that drone in. At least a small opening onto triple wall makes it a bit more unplayable. But look at that Mowgli go, quite aggressive. Will not find a kill though, as Nello will lock it off. But it's B4 to follow up, Emmy. There it is, pushing his way up to keep a barricade to get himself a safe route through. And he escapes. Slip and slinked his way underneath the cover of his own protection. Great use of the gadget. 
I mean, at this point, 15 seconds. They're going for the drop and the pressure. Good out on Moto. The kit is cold and out of pocket. Bibu's going to hold on to the back of blue as he swings round. Misses the first engagement. It's either side of him. Gets the second down. There's the cover down the corridor. P4 hasn't died since the rehost. Love that little play there from Bibu, Emmy, because he, he checked 180. He realized, ah, oh, the wall has opened up. And there's someone on main stairs. That means I'm going to get pushed from either side. So swaps over towards the bailiff. Just takes the fight with the person running out of blue. And of course, you know, he gets down, but he still gets the kill off, meaning it's an effective one on one at that point. Like, it was, it was like not really a panic play, but it's like, okay, I'm going to die anyway. Let's just take someone with me at this point. Now you're at the uh, all famous 6 1. Wild will have to fend off five defenses and just get five successful attacks in a row. He just mentioned it. They will have to rotate back towards the site they just lost. And probably through a couple others as well. So there's no more room for error. And they're going to find themselves in a very precarious situation. All the way at the bottom of the scoreboard. Three points removed from the nearest competitor. Attackers must locate and defuse a bomb. P4 has pulled off the James Bond. And uh, let's be honest, I guess we can say that if every game has defied expectation in some way, P4 hasn't had a great season so far. He's, well, compared to the level that we know he can play at, right? There was a period of time where he was the biggest pop-off player on this roster, frequently finding huge numbers. And then he, you know, changed roles, got a bit quieter this today has just been outstanding return to form for Wolves. Sonic will be tricked. Oh, actually, no, the stun's coming through. So there it goes. Opening will be there. I'm not quite sure what it came from. Must have been from like, oh, the drone hole to come through from Kanto. Always good to see the uh, concussions to be used in such a manner to Cancel the banner trigger as P4 will go down first. Maybe I shouldn't have talked about him. He finds his first dead. Okay, 7 or 1. That's still fine. Attackers He's still half, is it, KD uh, deficit if this <laughs> ends up in their favor. Pretty good day at the office. Mowgli. It's the next bit of damage. He's trying to. Okay. Sure. Why not? Casual. Just casual. <laughs> Why not? I was going to say try and retake main stairs. No, he wanted to shoot Nello's face off with a P90 at range. Kanto does find the end of Mowgli. But I mean, hitting the rappel player. Just cruel. Now, there is obviously the player lying behind the soft. Bibu's at a point. If he goes on droned, he can define this. Oh, no! Oh, no! oh the Claymore! It keeps him in place. He cannot really push through. There's a second player, people. Oh. No pay too much attention to it as it gets taken down. So called out. Kanto gone. A minute here. The pack will try and drive the team in for the plant. They're behind the cover of the gym equipment. Deadshot's got the cross, but there's a player on his left and one watching on the right as well. There's the angle from Shinka. Stops the kit being secured. How he was able to piece that together from the rotate, threaded the needle, but now it's down to the two Italians to pull any hope of Wild getting this back in. Deathshot is the answer of that hope. Unfortunately, it's loud and in French, and it says not today. Wolves, a phenomenal showing from a roster that finally starting to bear the fangs we know it has. Big Will Mowgli having fun with the camera out there. I was going to say, he's like, he just saw Deadshot as soon as they want it. It's like, almost no emotion there. Like, it was another day at the office. Like, they've just finished their scrim. But no, they've just got a 7 to 1 victory over Wild. And they put themselves back into that top six on a shared three, uh, third place. From the list of surprising results, Wolves, I think, have thrown us up to the mix. But. For one last time tonight, let's throw it to the desk for them to talk about it. Thanks so much, Hub and Floyd, for all your casting today. Always really nice to listen to you, of course. And yes, our final game of the day has concluded. Wolves have made a quick work of Wild, as we can say. Three points in the bag, looking solid. They did really quick work with them. And why did they do it? P4 
because they're finally back to playing the way that they did last stage. We were praising them so much, Jack, you and me on this desk. We were. In a different city, however, but they finally looked like that team again. And I'm so happy for them because, yeah, I predicted that the map was going to fit into Wilds, that they need to play the basics more, and they, it's a good map for them because mm -hmm. they should be theoretically heavy. Wolves really showed that they have it again to a certain extent. I think the one the one big thing that I was looking for, certainly, was that the performance was more important than the result. I think yeah. for probably whoever won, but also whoever lost, and we can come on to Wild. For Wolves, the fact that that was so dominant, and especially with them being on, you know, the attack so early on, um, winning five attacks is not something we've been able to say for Wolves for, <laughs> you know, a while, especially inside of EU League. So I think, yes, we've got to consider the quality of their opponent, but this was night and day a different Wolves to what we have seen. Previous Wolves that we've seen have been when they've been executing with low drones. You know, we, we in the Solis Club, how bad their drone work was. Their aggression where they've got two people who are aggressive and three people who are passive that creates gaps. Look at this aggression of two free players. There was one round where P4 sent it in and was into sight yeah. through a Goyo canister getting the kills. That's the Wolves that we know and yeah. love. That's the Wolves that we want to see, and that's the Wolves that we get really excited about, right? Yeah, and it's, it's the Wolves that... You, you remember when we started seeing Wolves in a, like really starting to play this aggressive style? Exactly, it was exactly. specifically on Chalet, so mm -hmm. it's a completely different map. But they just exploded from everywhere at the same time, and they try yeah. these unorthodox things. Because I think, take that Ash round, as you said, where, or whether he just jumps through the barricade. That is not something we would have seen two weeks ago from yes, Wolves. Agreed. Because they would have been like, oh, it's too strange, it's too weird. But that's how they have seen their success as a team. And they're finally seeming to take a step back to that. It, it's crazy, actually, when you see these guys as one unit, yeah. and how good they can be. And then when you see them so fragmented, they can be so bad. It's like you just see totally different sides of them. And I know that's kind of true for every team, but the extent of like the, the how how good they can be when yeah, they're together and how bad they, they can be when they're not playing together is massive. They can't just like like just work their way through a round without uh, through a game without getting out of second gear. They've really got to be up there, everybody together. And I'm really happy to hear this because prior to this game, we even mentioned it, we've been really harsh on this team. I mean, yeah. even, even with the performance we've seen from them, you weren't convinced. It wasn't really showing yet, but they seem way more in sync. We've had two interviews where they've won games and we've yeah. been like, what the hell is going on? Because this is not good enough. So I think it's nice to come out and say, yes, they put in a very dominating performance. Very, very dominating. I want to touch shortly on Wild, though, because I think that they had a rough time. Uh, it's probably kindly worded. It, it just... This is the playstyle they kind of need to predict. Even if Wolves have had a rough time, they kind of need to predict sort of playstyle against them, right? And it seemed that they did not have a clue about what was going to go on or how to play the game. And it, it just looked really, really rough for them. I will keep questioning them now because I've not been convinced that there's anything really redeeming right now. They need to really step up on both individual, but also the theory. It needs a rework. You guys need to get up with the meta. I think there's one player you really, you really want to talk about, and that might be because he's in your fantasy team. No, it's nothing to do with the fact that he's in my <laughs> fantasy team. Jesse, Hall, that's all I'm going to say. The the actual reason that I wanted to highlight P4, um, and I've highlighted it in gold there on, on the actual overview, is P4 on the entry kills. Two entry kills, big KD, big cost. It's not something we're used to seeing out of P4. I think he's one of the players that I challenged that was maybe a little bit passive in nature and has been a little bit passive in nature, but... We've seen that he's got the talent. So I'm hoping that this game, particularly for P4, can be a big flip for him, that he can join Deadshot and Mowgli in being in that aggressive front line, getting aggressive with them, because he's got the talent when he is. And I think he showed just a little glimpse of that today. For our final interview of the day, we have Helby joining us from Wolves support staff as well. We get to ask him a few questions about this game. So we should be able to say hello to Helby. Good evening, good to speak to you. Three points, they must be very welcome. Very welcome, yes. Three points and also a plus, uh, minus and plus. That's very uh, good in putting us on the third spot, I think, right now. Yep. I have questions for you, Albi. First of all, what is it that you guys gave the team for breakfast today? Because today you guys played the old wild, or wild, the old wolves that I'm used to seeing, the one that I praised you guys over and over on broadcast for. We saw aggression, we saw confidence, and we saw very good team play. What did you give them for breakfast? Um, well, I think the, um, we, we made a, a very um, intentional uh, improvement on attack. And I think uh, our mistake was not that we were not aggressive, it's that the aggression was not working. So 
we worked on the timing, the tempo, and just doing things together. And I think against Wild today it worked well, but it also gave us a lot of space to, uh, you know, do it. Okay, so hearing this is that you've really worked on some specific things. What can we expect for the future? Is there still something you want to work on? Well, we have a long week of scrim uh, since we don't play tomorrow, so uh, we can expect more of that. Uh, there's some big games coming up, so I think we play G2, Secret, and Ants. Not in that order, but so top of the leaderboard. It's uh, an Ants that seems to be in uh, good shape right now, beating VDS. So uh, you know, we're just gonna keep go uh, trying to improve on that and. Our eyes are set on the playoffs, so you know we we, we want to use this stage as a a time to get adjusted because uh, our attacks were not working out uh, early in this phase. So you know, get ready for playoffs, and anything can happen in playoffs. So you know, as long as we get there. So you know, with old my team with old G two, we always used to hide strats. So what you're saying is a little bit you guys have been hiding strats. Is that so? No, <laughs> no. I think it's just uh, some time to adjust. Uh, if we want to be fair, uh, between the six invitational, the end of it, and the start of the new uh, well this season, uh, there was barely like 15 days or so. Yep. So uh, I think the adjustment has been a bit rough and a bit rush, and we're starting to see the fruits of. Uh, of, of what we've been working on in the last couple of weeks. It just sounds better when you say that you hit it, so that's what I take out of this. <laughs> I mean, I can say I hit it, yeah. Yeah, there we, we go. We hit it all. I got what I wanted. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> awesome. It seems like you have very clear goals in mind, of course, not being able to underestimate anyone that's still ahead of you. We wish you best of luck with the preparation, of course. Enjoy the day off tomorrow, and we'll speak to you again very soon. Thank you. Hopefully we'll speak again soon. Also, always good to hear from the support staff as well what specifically has been going on uh, behind the scenes from these teams, really. But as we have had our final game of the day, we also have our standings to see how our teams are doing so far. So, Fresh, if you could please take us through them. Yep. Yeah, well, obviously, BDS will stay at the top of the pile. Four wins out of five, still an exceptional result, despite the fact that they lost today, similar to Secret. However, it's bunched up nicely in that midfield. In that fight between kind of, well, second place and all the way down to seventh, you're looking at three point differential. And then it comes down to VP. Who would have thought it? Third place at SI. They're struggling behind. They're on four points down in eighth place. Looking like they might have to drop out and play through open qualifier playoffs. However, they have already had an off day. So they've got an advantage on a lot of other teams that they will play all the way through. Wilder at the bottom, wilding. I think is the, yep. the term that we coined. They're, they're looking terrible. Yeah, I, I don't wow. have an adjective. Yeah, sure. No, they, they are lacking on everything. Honking. So they, they need, yeah, they're honking. They need to pick up on basically everything. I think that they need to reinvent their meta and start actually having some individual performance. I want to see Pac Bull. I want to see Pac Bull have creative freedom. Go back oh, okay. to what you guys yeah. did before because it worked really it well. It worked so well last year. And I think that if you guys do that, you stand a much better chance. At least in best of ones, yeah. it works well. Yeah, because you can be so creative with it. But it's just so wonderful. Again, I would keep repeating it every time we look at this scoreboard or the, 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 the ladder, it's open to anybody. Anybody can win. Yeah. That is the most exciting thing. We're not sugarcoating anything here, but it is really open up for grabs for everyone. Let's have a look at the games that we'll have for tomorrow. Within less than 24 hours, we'll start with a very exciting game. We'll start the day with BDS versus Secret. They're still the top two teams from the league, but both of them are at the moment licking their wounds. Of course, from the losses today, who of these two can bounce back? We'll have Ends versus Pro, versus, versus Pro as well. That's a tongue breaker there. If you ask me, don't say that three times in a row very fast or you're also some kind of person in a mirror. Um, the off both teams, of course, need all those points from that game. Our third game of the day will be G2 taking on Into the Breach and we'll end the day with Fnatic, who, of course, had an off day today, taking on Wild, and we'll hope that Wild will not once again be wilding. If we look at all of these matchups, they're very important in their own way and they all have yep. their specific story where some teams are fighting for points that they really need to grab off the opponent yeah. just so that they can take that step up above them and have a better spot in the playoffs or even be in the playoffs at all. So the day is going to be very fun. I can't wait. I, I, I mean, I just love a UL. <laughs> it, uh, honestly, oh. it's, I think, don't think it's ever been better. I, I was just literally thinking like every single game there. Yeah. Every single game. I, get, I suppose maybe other than the last one, Fnatic Wild, where you would expect on the balance of things at this point in time, Fnatic to win. All the other games feel like there is definitely, you know, hanging in the balance. The BDS secret one. That's good both being top of the league, both yeah. being unbeaten, then we'll both lose today, yeah, especially BDS in that kind of shock. Oh, I don't know. You know, you've got ITB, G2, both teams won, but actually had some pretty poor rounds and not 
I suppose the best performance, but got the three points. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't know. There's uh, some nice stories setting themselves up for tomorrow already. Something I want to pick you guys' brain about is that in the pre-show, we had the segment about Solus, Azami, Fenrir. I mean, I heard you two talk that somewhere throughout the day, you've noticed some of these plays that really were made possible due to these influential operators. What have we seen today from these three operators that really stood out to you? I mean, it's, it's kind of repetitive in the way of that all of the plays we're seeing are basically similar. It's just the way that we showed it in the pre-show is that it's kind of used like that every single round that you see them being played. And it's like, take the rafters position on catwalk with the Sami. Just yeah. so you can close off those little gaps and that you have like the entire half wall, half of it is completely bulletproof. Some of it you have standing angles, some of you have crouch angles. It's just like the power positions you can create with the Sami just blows my mind. And just drone information denial from Solis. It's just... You can enable so many aggressive plays in defense with that. There was, um, there's actually one on Consulate, which would have been the secret game. Yeah. Where it was a piano defense. They married into the top floor to take control of the top floor. Defender runs down yellow stairs and uses the Fenrir from the other side because the um, Amaru hits the Fenrir trap at top yellow and then has to try and flash and he's just completely blind and dies. It's like, these operators are so strong. I like how Fenrir just makes you use more than two brain cells to try and actually play this operator and use him to his fullest potential. But I'm sure we'll see more of those three defenders tomorrow because they are very, well, apparent in our current meta. I hope to also see you, of course, tomorrow at 6 p.m. for our very first game because you do not want to miss BDS versus Secret. Thank you two so much for your detailed analysis today. It's been a pleasure, of course, having you always here with the Bender, the analysis. And that, of course, closes us out for today. So make sure you're here again tomorrow for for now, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so much for watching.